Prologue The Day of the School Festival The plaza in front of the school building was lined with numerous food stalls. In one of them, I, Leon Faux Bartfault, also work as a clerk. The donut dough was shaped and thrown into the hot oil with a tool, and then turned over while keeping an eye on it. When puffed and colored, remove it from the oil and place it on a tray lined with a sheet. The donuts are left as they are for a few minutes, topped with chocolate and other toppings, and decorated as a product by my friends, Daniel, and Raymond. The three of us had a donut stall at the school festival. No. Four. Three, two, one master, please take the donuts out of the oil. Oh, the donuts, made according to the manual prepared by Luxion, had a beautiful color. The prepared dough, oil temperature, and frying timing were all under Luxion's control, so the dish turned out well for a novice cook like us. Some roughness is noticeable, but there are many customers as it is mid-afternoon. Most of the lined-up topped donuts had been purchased. The number of customers is also very good. Sales are going well. Daniel and Raymond, who opened a stall together, were all smiles at the good sales. This is what it calls selling like hot cakes. I wasn't expecting much, but this is going to be profitable. Next to the two happy people, I start preparing the next donuts. Lux Ion speaks to me, sounding concerned about my condition. At this pace, sales are expected to increase by 10% of the planned amount. We are also reducing waste loss, which is a wonderful achievement. I see. That's good to hear. Master doesn't look happy about it. I'm making a lot of money, so of course I'm happy about it. There has been no change in your expression since a while ago, though? I've been silently frying donuts since morning. I just wanted to concentrate on the task at hand, but even Daniel is concerned. Are you sure you're all right? When it's over, you better get some rest, Leon. Raymond seems to agree with Daniel. You seem to be acting weird these days. I feel like your mind is not here. I can't help but smile wryly, because Raymond's words are so familiar to me. There's a lot going on. After all, thanks to Roland, I'm a Grand Duke now. The weight of responsibility makes my stomach hurt. Not long ago, I was officially given the rank of Grand Duke. In the Horfolk Kingdom, it is a rank above a Duke. In the past, Duke Fanos was a Grand Duke, but then betrayed the Kingdom of Horfolk and took on the name of Principality. Because of the various powers bestowed on the Grand Duke, since then the Kingdom of Horfolk has not given the title of Grand Duke to anyone, in fear of betrayal an exception among exceptions. If I had to say, my accession to the throne as the Grand Duke is a remarkable achievement even in the history of the kingdom. Well, this is also one of Roland's harassments. Roland understands my personality of not wanting to be promoted, so he uses whatever he can to get me promoted. It may be a luxurious concern to those around me, but to me it's a nuisance. Daniel and Raymond look at each other and whisper to each other in front of me. He's calling his majesty by his name. There's a limit to having no fear. If it were Leon, he would be forgiven. After all, he'd beat that Rachel. The holy kingdom of Rachel a troublesome country that has been hostile to the kingdom of Horfolt. It is currently under the administration of the kingdom of Horfolt, which is ruled jointly with the United Kingdom of Reparto. While frying the donuts, I said to them with a smile. You can call him whatever you want. If he gets mad at me for that, I'll just give him back the title of Grand Duke. Even if I return it, I don't think he'll allow me to do so. Or rather, many things seem unimportant now. As I was taking the donuts out of the oil, Raymond turned his attention to the other stalls. He seems to be counting, but his expression is a little sad. I knew it was smaller than when we were first-year students. The number of food stalls is less than half. Daniel takes the donuts off the heat, decorates them, and arranges them on a tray. It can't be helped. We've had a lot of big wars in the last few years. I think it's a good thing we were able to hold the school festival. That's true, but it does make me feel kind of lonely. I don't think I'd want to go back to the first year, but still, there was a liveliness in those days. Due to the series of major wars, the national strength of the Horfolk Kingdom is declining. 
Actually, the school festival was supposed to be cancelled, but the new headmaster felt sorry for the students and decided to hold the festival for one day. Sure Show is a wonderful adult who thinks about his students. But the scale is still small. There are only a few food stalls, and even the number of exhibits is small. As we were feeling sad thinking about two years ago, we saw petite girls with blonde and black hair approaching. They look like sisters, Marie Fola Fan, and Erica Rafa Horfelt. It looks like Marie is pulling Erica by the arm and taking her around the school festival. The figure of Creer can be seen by their side. It's an object with a single lens die in a floating metal sphere, the same as Lux Ion. The difference with Lux Ion is the color and the use. Compared to Lux Ion, who is often sarcastic and ironic, Creer has a cheerful and easygoing personality. But it's only on the surface that she is easy to get along with. Inside is a dangerous AI with the dangerous idea that new humans should be destroyed, and she is a dangerous one who is not afraid to conduct questionable experiments on new humans. Despite that, Creer is very kind to Marie and Erica, who have the characteristics of the old humans. When the three of them come to our stall, Marie orders. Give me as many donuts as you can. Ma, Marie-san? I'm not sure that's the way to buy Erica is puzzled and reminds Marie, who tries to buy up all the donuts without restraint. Marie says in front of us. It is fine. They're probably in trouble because they're unsold anyway. It's human nature to buy them. Daniel and Raymond smiled wryly at Marie who was nodding with her arms crossed. I let out a sigh, then leave the stall and poke Marie's head. What are you doing? I'll give you service, just don't buy all of it. I'm the one who's giving you the pocket money in the first place. You promised you wouldn't say that. When I mention the pocket money, Marie is visibly agitated. This is what this girl is all about, I am sure she wanted to act like a parent in front of Erica. It seems she didn't want to be told the pathetic story of getting pocket money from me. As for Erica, she puts her fist over her mouth and giggles elegantly. I thought maybe so. Marie is teary-eyed when she learns that Erica has been aware of her from the beginning. You you you, because of Leon, it was exposed. It's probably because of your daily activities. I grab a few items from the lineup, put them in a brown paper bag, and push them to Marie. Here, I'll give you a service. Take it. Are you sure? Erica, let's eat donuts together. Marie pulls Erica's hand away from the stall. Eh, but we just ate, it's okay. At that time, Erica looked back at me with only her face turned to look at me and bowed her head with a slightly apologetic smile. Seeing Marie's happy back, my chest tightens from anxiety. Perhaps the expression appears on my face, Lux Ion calls out to me. Master, A.A., right. I changed my mind and looked back at my two friends. I offered a donut for sale without permission, so I apologize for that. Sorry. I'll pay for it. Raymond laughs. I don't mind then the unfamiliar girls came to the stall this time. I tell the girls since it's sold out. I'm sorry. We sold out a while ago, so please give us some time to I'm here to see Daniel Senpai and others. Eh? Daniel steps out of the stall and waves to the girls. I'm going to take a break soon, so just wait a little bit. Leon, you go ahead and take your break. If you don't, we won't get a break either. The purpose of the girls was to meet Daniel and Raymond. I thought I would never hear anything romantic from these two, but it seems they have also been building a good relationship with their juniors. There were two people enjoying the school festival. An eerie black ball floats next to a sharp-eyed, beautiful young man with white hair and brown skin. The one-eyed flesh eyeball moved around, looking at the school festival with great interest. Another one a little girl, eating while holding a crepe in her hand. Mia, who is eating and walking around, is warned by a beautiful young man, Finn Ruta Herring, with a troubled look on his face and a smile. Wouldn't it be better to sit down and eat? Mia, who had cream on her cheeks, looked up at Finn happily. When I was a little girl, this was pretty normal. International students from the Holy Magic Empire Voldanoa enjoyed a school festival in a foreign country. Finn removes the cream from Mia's cheek with his finger and brings it straight to his mouth to lick it off. 
Mia blushes and turns her head down at that action. Kane Knight Sama. I beg your pardon, my princess. However, it's not good to have cream on your cheeks forever. If you know, please tell me, Mu Fin's reverent words and actions provoked an unnecessary sense of embarrassment, and Mia turned her face away. My bad. Don't be so angry. Finn, who was looking at Mia with a smile, was approached by his partner, Brave. The area around his mouth was smeared with cream from sweets he bought. Buddy, me too, me too, seeing Brave waiting with a nervous heart, Finn takes out a handkerchief and wipes his mouth with it in amazement. Kurosuk, I understand your desire to eat a variety of foods, but why don't you calm down a bit? Brave, who had his mouth wiped violently, said that this was not what he wanted and became displeased. Be nice to me like you were to Mia, buddy. And as I always say, I am brave, not Kurosuk. Therefore, I have wiped you gently. Also, the name isn't that different. It's completely different. Brave, who was making a lot of noise, attracted a lot of attention from the surroundings, but the students did not make a special fuss, as they were already accustomed to Luxion. Mia comforts the grieving Brave. Don't cry, Bukuin. I'll give you this crepe. Mia, is it really okay for me to eat it? Yeah. I'll buy donuts from the Grand Duke Sama's stall and eat them Mia answered with a big smile, and Brave had an indescribable expression on his face. Didn't you just force it on me because you got tired of it? Well, I'll eat it. Finn put his hand on Brave, who honestly couldn't be pleased. Don't complain. Our princess is enjoying eating while walking. It's our job to accompany her, right? My partner is really sweet on Mia. Be nice to me too, even if it's only half of what you did to Mia. Maybe some other time Brave, who was lightly brushed off, followed them as they walked on, looking disgruntled. So on their way to Leon's donut shop, Finn and the others spotted a group of familiar faces. Finn's feelings about them are complicated. Mia, who doesn't know anything, looks at them and mutters. There are the princes. Finn nodded slightly. I guess so well, it looks like they're having a lot of fun. The trio had attracted the eyes of those around them. The prince, Jake Rafa Horfelt, a small, quirky, short blonde with a stern look, is standing next to a tall girl. And he is glaring at the boy, Ethan Foe Robson, who stands across from him. The prince, Jake Rafa Horfelt, a small, quirky, short blonde with a stern look, glares at a boy, Ethan Foe Robson, who stands next to him with a tall girl. In between them. Ethan, don't disturb me and Ara. I'm sorry to hear that you're disturbed. It is His Highness who is interrupting me and Miss Ara's making memories of the school festival. The scene appears to be a dispute between two first-year boys fighting over a second-year girl. Ara, looking troubled while the two of them are fighting, intercedes in the fight. You too, it's a school festival, let's have fun. That's right. I heard that Bartfault Senpai is having a stall up ahead. Rumor has it that he's selling delicious donuts, so why don't we three go? Both Jake and Ethan seem to give in when Ara suggested it with her hands together. They turn away from each other and take Ara's suggestion. If it's Ara's request, I can't refuse. I don't mind. Even so, the Horfolk Kingdom is the only country where the Grand Duke sells donuts directly at the stall. The three of them start walking in the same direction as Finn and the other. Finn looks at the three of them and thinks. I feel complicated when I think that these three were originally Mia's potential lovers. Plus, one of them has had a sex change and is now a woman. All three of them were male capture targets in that Otome game. However, for whatever reason, they all strayed from the path of capture targets before they met Mia. At the same time that he is relieved that they did not become Mia's lovers, he is also terribly bothered. At the same time as I am relieved that they will not become Mia's lover, I am terribly confused. The reason is that he doesn't like the fact that the capture targets are flirting with each other while ignoring a wonderful girl named Mia. Mia doesn't even look at the three of them, and she doesn't seem to care. On the contrary, she seems happy now. Those three seem to be having fun every day, don't they? Ah, of course, Mia is happy every day too. 
My body is better now, and besides K Knight Sama is by my side. Mia said shyly, and Finn blushed a little. My princess, are you going to kill your knight with praise? Eh? And no, I mean it. As they were getting excited, Brave was pointing ahead as he finished the crepe Mia had given him. Oi, apparently they're taking a break. What? Finn looks in the direction Brave pointed and sees a stall selling donuts, with a messy sign hanging over the stall. It was written that it was under preparation and would not reopen until after 1400 hours. There is one woman who is rampaging in such a storefront. The others are one boy and one girl. What does it mean that they are preparing? And I just came here, and now he's not here. It was Leon's big sister, Jenna, who was raising her voice. She has graduated from the school, but today she is dressed up and enjoying the school festival. Looking around, one can see a glimpse of alumni who have come to the school as well as Jenna. Leon's younger sister, Finley, is amazed at Jenna's loud voice. This one is calmer or rather, has cooled down. I heard they were selling pretty well, so maybe he went out to do some shopping? I mean, I never knew my brother had a talent for baking. Finley, you are so naive. When I was at the school, if there had been a stall like this, there would have been a flood of complaints when it was Wani Chan's time, right? How long ago do you think that was? Jenna clenched her fists in frustration as Finley calmly retorted. It's been less than two years since I graduated. It was Jake's foster brother, Oscar F.I.A. Hogan, who was troubled by the two sisters fighting in the storefront. You two shouldn't fight. If you want donuts, I'll get them myself outside the school. Jenna's eyes lit up with excitement at Oscar's response. As expected of Oscar Sama. Unlike some foolish brother, you are a wonderful man. I am so lucky to have such a wonderful man as my lover. The women around Jenna, who exclaimed that she had a younger, beautiful young boyfriend, looked at her with considerable jealousy. The person in question seems to be aware of it, but doesn't seem the least bit offended. Surely she is bragging about it to everyone around her. Finley, who saw through Jenna's ulterior motive from the beginning, is the cause of her cool down. Ha, huh, why am I being forced to play along with my big sister's bragging? Finley, who looked tired and exhaled a sigh, had the air of a struggling worker. Mia, who was watching the three of them, looks disappointed. I see the Grand Duke Sama is out. Too bad, I wanted to eat a donut. Finn looked at Mia, who looked sad, and put his hand on her shoulder. Mia Knight Sama? Leave it to me I'll find Leon and have him make you donuts right away. Eh? You don't have to go that far, Knight Sama. While hearing Mia's voice trying to stop him, Finn declares. I will make your wishes come true didn't I say you don't have to go that far, right? Brave, watching the two of them, was dumbfounded, but muttered a little happily. Even though Mia is feeling better, my buddy's still overprotective. Yarr yarr days. When I came to the back of the school building, Creer had arrived first. As soon as she sees that me and Luxion have arrived, she approaches us. The usual cheerfulness was gone, and instead it was an electronic voice that conveyed a sense of impatience. Master! How is Erica? When I asked her straightforwardly just what I wanted to know, Creer started projecting images around me. The image projected in the air was a video replay of Erica's suffering. She had the second seizure just a few minutes ago. Is it because Marie took her around? I put my hand over my mouth, but Creer did not answer. That would indicate affirmation. Marie's behavior was causing Erica pain. Instead of Creer, who does not answer, Luxion defends Marie. Marie does not know anything about Erica's condition. And taking Erica around with her at the school festival is, I know. She is trying to atone because of her previous life. She didn't do anything like a parent, and now she's desperate to make it up. Marie's good intentions are making Erica's condition worse. Originally, I should have stopped her, but it was Erica herself who refused to do so. Erica Chan is saying that she wants to continue making memories with Marie Chan. No matter what, they'll be separated for the foreseeable future, she said. For Erica, it's not about making memories. Perhaps, 
but she is making memories for Marie. Erica has a previous life, just like us. I was told that in a previous life, she was born as Marie's daughter and lived until she became an old lady. She has more life experience than us. What Erica wanted to do, even at the cost of her own life, was to repay her mother's kindness from a previous life. Marie is trying to entertain Erica and make memories together. And Erica is trying to create a lasting memory of their time together for Marie. So the dream of a parent and child that did not come true in a previous life is being realized. It's hard to have an overly perfect niece. It makes it harder to support her. As if to fool myself that I couldn't do anything, I complained, which was not my real intention. Pathetic I felt pathetic about myself. Creer reports to me about the current situation. As for Erica's medical condition, I've been able to determine that the magic element is affecting her. But it's a mystery, isn't it? Why are the descendants of new humans, who are supposed to have conquered magic elements, having a hard time with magic elements? If it is because of the reincarnation, there must be some kind of change in Master and others as well, we are the descendants of new humans who can use magic. And yet, Erica's body was unable to handle the magic elements that generate magic. When we fall silent, Luxion says. The old human characteristics are very strong, you know. It must be an effect of that. Anyway, if things continue as they are, Erica's life will be in danger. Master, we must put our planned plan into action. I know. I know that. But if I do that there's a chance that Marie may never see Erica again, right? Lux Ion, you also, it is to help Erica. Besides, we may find a cure sooner than expected. And if that happens, she will be reunited with Master and others. As I look down with my mouth closed, Creer explains the plan. Well then, I'll put Erica Chan in cold sleep and send her out of the atmosphere in the main body of Lux Ion. Once she's out in space, she'll be safe from the effects of the magic element. It seems that magic elements are covering this planet. But out in space, the magic element seems to be non-existent. The only way to escape the influence of the magic element is to flee into space. In that case, the immigrant ship, Luxion, was the right choice. I confirm again to Luxion. Is it really okay? I don't mind. There is no one better suited for the job than me. More than that, if my main body goes out into space, I will not be able to support Master. Master, please don't cry because you are lonely. You stupid bastard. It would be refreshing to have you gone, you annoying, sarcastic and ironic guy. You too, don't cry when you get lonely. AI doesn't cry, I wonder. You guys are strangely emotional, aren't you? I'm pretty confident I wouldn't be surprised if you were crying. You don't need that kind of confidence. To begin with, the idea that I would be insecure if I were not with Master is wrong. How much time do you think I spent alone before I met Master? Her attitude was that she couldn't bear to listen to our conversation. Since the policy has been decided, I will go to Erica Chan's side. Also, if you want to carry out your plan, the sooner the better. The medicine I prepared for Erica Chan is becoming less and less effective. When Creer said that and left, me and Luxion were left behind. I sat down with my back against the school building and hid my face with my right hand. Good grief how am I going to explain this to Marie? She's gonna start crying and screaming and making trouble for sure. If you are going to tell her, please do so as soon as possible. We don't have much time. Erica has achieved what she wanted, which was to make happy memories. I don't recommend that you delay it any longer. I understand. I'll explain it to Marie when the festival is over and things have settled down. Chapter 1 The Last School Festival It's finally over in a classroom where an exhibit was being held at the school festival, Noel Jill Espinas, was sitting in a chair, looking up at the ceiling and letting out a deep sigh. On display in the classroom are items and materials related to the Republic of Arzal. Since Noel is from the Republic of Arzal, it was decided that this would be a good opportunity to learn about a foreign culture, and an exhibit was held as a part of the school festival. When asked by Ange to join the executive committee, Noel reluctantly accepted. 
And so today, the day of the exhibition, Noel was in charge of explaining the exhibit. I didn't think anyone would be interested in a stiff exhibition. I didn't expect visitors from this morning until now. There were a good number of visitors who came to learn about the culture of the Republic of Arzal. Except for breaks, Noel was busy all the time. Olivia, Livia, who is helping, is putting the items on the desk into boxes. Thank you for your hard work. It's been a busy day. Livia, who was helping out, looks tired, though not as tired as Noel. The reason Livia is cleaning up alone is because Noel is exhausted from the continuous barrage of questions. Noel finally gets up from her seat to help clean up. While working with her hands, she spills her dissatisfaction about the school festival. It was a school festival, you know. I went to check out Leon's donut shop during the break, and to my surprise, they were in the middle of preparations. I was looking forward to it because I heard it had a good reputation. During a break, she visited Leon, but was unable to meet him. It seems she was disappointed that she missed out in eating the donuts. The same goes for Livia. In the end, our lunch was a skewer roasted by His Highness Julius. It was good, but I've eaten it so many times that it just didn't feel all that new. The guests outside the school seemed to like it. It was the only time at the school festival that they could eat kushiyaki skewers grilled by Prince himself. The taste was also well received. At the school festival, Julius had a stall selling grilled skewers. The same goes for the other four. Noelle counts on her fingers as she talks about the five idiots stall. Isn't Chris San's sweet and salty noodle dish also popular? Greg San's pancake like food was also delicious. It was too eccentric for some customers, but there were a good number of people there. But he wasn't convinced, was he? He had a complicated look. Actually, he wanted to sell roasted chicken. However, Leon San forced him to change his mind because he was told that it would overlap with His Highness Julius. The reason why the five idiots hold stalls at the school festival is because they wish to do so. And it's also Leon's order. Noelle looks complicated when she talks about the two remaining people. Brad San's program was somewhat unbearable to watch. There weren't many customers. With a wry smile, as Livia said, the freak show that Brad put on was a failure. He was performing magic tricks, but he was clumsy and kept failing. And when it comes to the last one Jilk, the two of them lose their expressions. Jilk's cafe was the worst. I shouldn't have stopped by for remaining break time since I was done eating. After finishing their lunch by eating, they stopped at Jilk's cafe to spend the remaining break time. They tried to rest for a while in a cafe that used an empty classroom. That was all a mistake. In addition to the unique smell and taste of the tea and sweets, the interior of the store was so bizarre that I couldn't rest. Some of the customers who came and gave up and left because of the smell the two, who knew him, ordered tea and pastries, without being able to turn back. The results are disastrous. Even though they had to work hard in the afternoon to explain the exhibit, it was very difficult because the cafe greatly reduced their motivation. Noelle shouts out her frustration about Leon not being here. Why did you let Jill Xan run the cafe? Wouldn't it have been better if Leon had done it himself? If Leon had done it, it would have been a safe, if not critically acclaimed, cafe. If Luxion had helped, surely it would have been a great success. But for some reason, Leon himself said he was going to open a donut shop. Livia also seems to think it's unnatural. When he was first here, though, he spent a lot of money to open a cafe. I was sure he would do it again this year, so Ange and I were surprised. He always says that tea is his hobby. Isn't there something wrong with Leon these days? When Noel said there was something strange about Leon's behavior, Livia seemed to sense it too. He's kind of distressed, isn't he? I wish he could talk to us about it, but Leon San has a lot of things to hide from us. Noel raises her eyebrows at Livia, who looks sad. Because she was angry at Leon for not being here. Leon is really secretive. Just what is he hiding this time? A dark atmosphere begins to envelop the room. As they resumed cleaning up, Angelica Rafa Redgrave came into the classroom. You're still cleaning up? 
Seeing the two of them cleaning up, Ange had a slightly troubled look on her face. Tomorrow is a holiday weekend. Why don't you clean up tomorrow and get out of here? The executive committee has finished their patrols and left. Hearing Ange's words, Noel replies with a glance around the classroom. It won't take that long, and we'll be finished quickly. I see. Then I'll help you. Livia was apologetic as Ange began to help clean up. Ange, a member of the committee, must have been busier than us, right? I'm sure you didn't have time to take a break. The concerned Ange smiles wryly. I'd be bored if I went back alone. With that said, Angel carried a heavy load, but since she had been busy moving around all morning and had not eaten properly, her stomach grumbled with a coo sound. Ange who looks awkward, says with a slight blush on her face. Oh, let's finish this quickly so we can have dinner. Livia smiled at Ange's situation. That's right. Ah. Noelle is also hungry and agrees to clean up quickly. With three of us, it won't take long. As the cleanup resumed, they heard footsteps approaching the classroom. The three of them turned their heads quickly to the entrance of the classroom, not only because of the sound of footsteps, but also because of the smell that was wafting through the air. Bringing a delicious smell with him into the classroom is Leon. Good job, and how about a donut? In a brown paper bag, it appears to be donuts that the three had missed out on. Noelle tries to complain to Leon, who smiles, but her stomach growls before the delicious smell. Leon smiled when he saw Noelle holding her stomach. I guess it was just in time. Well, why don't we eat together then? I've prepared some drinks. Seeing Leon lift up the water bottles and show them, Anne shrugged her shoulders. You are very well prepared. Now, is it the wisdom of Luxion? The three gazes turned to Luxion, who was floating near Leon's right shoulder. Luxion was unfazed by Ange's reaction. Angelica's guess is correct. This must have been due to Master's daily bad behavior, and she must have seen that it was me who gave him the idea to be so attentive. Leon, when told, acts as if he is sulking. I'm an inattentive guy anyway. Noelle approaches Leon and hugs the hand holding the paper bag. Don't be mad. Let's just eat donuts instead. I went to peek at them at lunch and I couldn't eat them because they were being prepared. I'm sorry. Judging by his apologetic attitude, Leon must have been concerned about it. Ha, huh, this donut is really delicious. After taking a bite of a simple donut, Livia is relaxed and in good mood. Sweet foods soothe hunger and fatigue. Noelle was a bit surprised as she ate her donut. It's a little warm. Did you go out of your way to prepare it for us? It seems she figured out that it hadn't been that long since it was made. Leon told her about the situation while sipping his tea, but he didn't touch the donuts. Apparently, he ended up with leftover donuts for his lunch. Maybe he made too much and doesn't want to eat, or maybe he just wants to drink tea. I had extra ingredients, so I made this the last. And Luxion, too, said the three of you were hungry. Noel and Ange were giving Luxion a sharp look. Were you peeking? You're never let your guard down. He didn't have to inform their fiancé things like they were hungry Luxion didn't sense their anger. Hungry was the fact and it was not wrong for Master to prepare food. Thanks to this, Master reduces food loss and the three of you can fill your bellies. What is the problem? Ange's voice gets slightly louder as Luxion does not understand women's hearts. We're maidens, too, you know. We have a sense of shame. Even if you are no longer a maiden, Master will take care of the three of you, so no problem. Leon, who had been taking nothing to do with me attitude, coughed. Don't bring me into the conversation. It was a bit of a noisy break. However, only Livia takes a step back and watches Luxion somewhat warily. Am I being too worried? But sometimes Luke Cohen gives off a kind of scary vibe, it reminds her of a nightmare she once had. It is a dream of Luxion turning the royal capital into a sea of fire. Although Livia understands that it was just a dream, it was too vivid and felt too real. It's as if it's telling her something. Livia is not certain either, and hopes it is just an overthought. 
but she can't help but be wary of Luxion. Luxion, who had turned the royal capital into a sea of fire in a dream, made her realize that he was truly a fearsome being. He is joking around with Leon, but perhaps he can destroy the world if he gets serious. Livia was so conscious of the fact that they were so close to a terrifying existence even if she didn't want to. As Livia ponders, Ange takes the last donut and bites into it, smiling like a child. The sight of her eating the donut with obvious satisfaction gives Livia a warm feeling. Suddenly, Livia wonders. Did Ange like donuts that much? You didn't look like that before. When they ate out on the town, she didn't smile so much. When Livia said it, Ange must have noticed it too. Looking embarrassed, she held a donut in both hands and hid her mouth. I wasn't really aware of it, but it seems to be my favorite. It's kind of soothing or calming to eat. She does not seem to know the cause herself. After hearing Ange's words, Leon suggested. If you like, I can have Luxion prepare it for you. I'm sure he'll make it better than me. When the topic is brought up, Luxion moves her one red eye to nod. I'll have it mass-produced and delivered right away. If mass-produced by machine, the taste and quality would be better than the donuts prepared by the amateur Leon. But Anne shakes her head. It's a matter of feeling. Leon prepared it for us, didn't he? Maybe I'm glad for his feeling or so I think. Anne said shyly, and Noel gave a mean smile. That's surprising, Angelica. I thought you only accept dishes prepared by top chefs. Is that what you've been looking at me like? I think we need to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk for once, Noel. Ange was smiling, but her eyes weren't smiling. Noel senses that it is bad and forcibly diverts the conversation. More importantly, what are you going to do for the holidays starting tomorrow? Why don't we all go out together? Realizing that Noel has diverted the topic, Livia gets on the subject of the holiday. Right. Sometimes we before she could finish saying that they might as well all go out together, a large number of people crowded into the classroom. As they came in noisily, Leon, Livia and the rest looked annoyed. However, they are unapologetic and don't seem to notice. Leon, I'm begging you, let clear this up. Brad said so as soon as he came in, and Leon, who thought he had brought in some trouble, looked sincerely displeased. What are you talking about? Jilk, who enters the room next, explains the situation with a slight air of impatience. Actually, we were talking about ranking our exhibits. Unfortunately, Brad Cohen and I did not have good sales. But no matter how much I told them that I was better than Brad Cohen, they wouldn't listen to me. Apparently, Brad and Jilk are fighting for the bottom spot. Leon seemed wholeheartedly unconcerned. You guys were the ones who ignored me when I told you what a stall should be, weren't you? Well, never mind. Lux Ion, how did their sales turn out? In terms of sales, Jilk is ahead by a narrow margin, but when claims and other factors are taken into account, Brad is probably the winner. What a sad battle for last place. Livia was astonished in her mind, but felt a strange connection. Did they come to seek the judgment of Leon San and Luke Quinn for just this one thing? Come to think of it, I remember competing with them in the school festival when we were first-year students although back then, I never imagined that we would have this kind of relationship with His Highness and the others. Back in the first year, Leon was competing against five idiots at a school festival. Not knowing how to decide who won and who lost, the result was a mess. Two years have passed since then, and now, for some reason, Leon is taking care of the five idiots. Life is a mystery, isn't it? When Brad heard the results, he raised his hands in joy, while Jilk was stunned. Look at that! I'm not at the bottom after all. I, it's impossible. I can't believe I lost to a shitty magic trick as shitty. Did you think like that? The people around them, looking at the two of them, happy and sad over the battle for the bottom spot, had indescribable looks on their faces. Behind the despairing Jilk are Chris, Greg, and Julius. Chris is smiling, as if to say, I worked up a nice sweat. Aside from the two, the rest of us were doing well. I also set up a stall wearing my favorite happy coat, and it fit in better than I thought it would. I didn't know what they were making, 
but it wasn't bad. Greg, on the other hand, is downcast, his shoulders slumped. I'm not so sure. I mean, how could I build muscle with that thing? After all, I wanted to sell meat. Behind a frustrated Greg, Julius, the most prosperous of the five, stands confidently. You guys weren't bad, but I guess you couldn't beat me. If you want to compete with me, you'll have to improve your skills. I'm ready to accept your challenge. He was happy to be first among the five, but then Luxion discouraged him. Julius suddenly looks frustrated and points a finger at Leon. Leon! Next year I'm going to get my revenge, so be prepared. Leon, who was challenged, looks stunned. It can't be helped. After all. Our school festival ends this year, idiot, and if you want to repeat the year, do it alone. For Leon and his friends, this is their last school festival. When Leon says that this is their last school festival this year, everyone looks sad. Only one person Julius was whispering, as if the momentum from earlier was a lie. You're not seriously asking me to repeat the year, right? Right? The cold shoulder from Leon made him uneasy. Chapter 2 Two Dudes and Their Partners Holy Magic Empire Voldanoa The capital, the Imperial City, is a fortified city, protected by two high walls. In the center of the Imperial City, which appeared to be a double circle, was a towering castle. In the audience chamber of the castle, the Crown Prince, Acting Emperor, Moritz Luxerzberger, sits on a throne on high and looks down on his vassals. The young man, in his late twenties, had a firmer, connected beard. He also had a large, muscular body with brown skin and a look that gave the impression of bloodlust. He is a man who is usually rough around the edges and was described as lacking in composure when he was crown prince. However, Moritz does not have the same vigor today as he did when he was the crown prince. He looked slightly pale. General, Gunther Ruizabart, a fierce warrior who has fought many battles in his career, asks Moritz. Are you really sure, your majesty? There is no other way. Moritz squeezed out a voice and answered, but his face was distressed. Behind Moritz, who is struggling with his decision, floats a two-meter-large sphere. Arcadia, a strange being with one large, black flesh eye, squinted happily with an arched look in his eyes as he praised Moritz's decision. Yes, your majesty the emperor. You made the right decision. So don't be so down. Gunther raises an eyebrow at Arcadia, who is waiting behind Moritz. In the eyes of his vassals, Moritz was already a puppet of Arcadia but no vassals admonished him for it. Gunther, another general loyal to the Empire, believed that Arcadia could not be eliminated at this time. Don't be conceited, you, a magic creature that made Moritz-sama into a somebody and caused the death of the previous Emperor Karl, part of him wants to eliminate Arcadia immediately and help Moritz, but unfortunately, Gunther can't beat it. There were many who were dissatisfied with Arcadia, which had suddenly appeared and was behaving as it pleased in the Empire. The imperial families who opposed Moritz's accession to the throne once moved the military under their influence. Not a number that can be ignored, and everyone expected a war to break out that would split the empire in two. However, the main body of Arcadia went out and wiped out the opposing forces. In the face of such overwhelming military might, even Gunther could not easily cause trouble. And then there were those who made him hesitant to risk his life to challenge Arcadia. The Kingdom of Horfolt. Arcadia spreads its hands, which are small compared to the main body, and gives Moritz an order in the form of a proposal. Your Imperial Majesty, we need to get the princess back from the kingdom sooner rather than later. Moritz's expression turned bitter when he heard a princess who was in the kingdom. My dad did some troublesome things. The existence of Mirialis Lux Erzberger, the illegitimate son of the previous emperor, Karl, did not matter to Moritz. He doesn't seem to feel the need to bring her back. However, he must have felt so guilty for killing his father that he thought he could at least protect his illegitimate child. Send an emissary to the kingdom at Moritz's command, Arcadia laughed, her large mouth forming a crescent moon. Fufu, I shall prepare to welcome the princess. I'll have to give her a grand welcome. The scene was so eerie that Gunther broke out in a cold sweat. What are you planning to do? 
bring back the illegitimate child of previous emperor from the kingdom. Seeing Arcadia's odd behavior, the vassals in the audience chamber wondered, will it do something bad to the princess? What will it do when it brings her back? Moritz has his back to Arcadia, so the expression on its face cannot be seen. In addition, he is struggling with the decisions he has made and does not seem to have time to pay attention to the condition of his vassals. I never thought I would have to rely on such a monster, Gunther clenched his hands in shame at himself for being unable to do anything but watch the situation unfold. After the school festival, what awaits the students is a series of holidays. On the first day of the holiday weekend, I saw many students cleaning up the school festival, but on the second day, only a few were left. That very few included me and Finn. Me and Finn came to the tea room with our partners. Normally I would prepare the tea, but today Finn is preparing the coffee. The coffee was prepared from beans, and the aroma of coffee spread throughout the room. Sorry to drag you into Mia's shopping. As a guy, I just can't follow through on some things, so thank you for your help. I accepted the coffee prepared in return for a thank you, and while I said I didn't mind, I also spilled my true feelings. I didn't do anything, so if you want to thank me, thank Ange and the others. Rather than that, I was in the mood for a cup of tea, though? Finn is amazed at my true feelings. Can't you just shut up and drink? I thought you must be tired of drinking the same thing every day, so I prepared this for you. I never get tired of it. The tea leaves are changed according to the mood of the day. Even the pouring method varies. Some flavors remind me of my previous life, and some teas are unique to this world. Don't lump them all into one category. I took a sip of my coffee and it wasn't as bitter as I thought it would be. This is good. I was so impressed that I let my true feeling slip. Finn looks at me as if to say, right? He stood and sipped his coffee as if savoring it, then exhaled a sigh of relief and looked a little apologetic. I'm glad Mia is feeling better, but I can't be too happy about it. I heard the princess collapsed again. Finn is worried about Erica, but I didn't tell him about the situation. I am sure he would be concerned if he heard that Erica's condition has worsened in exchange for Mia Chan's getting better. Don't worry, we're looking for a cure. Besides, we've already found a way to prevent things from getting worse. I look at Luxion as I say it. Luxion looked at Brave, who couldn't drink the coffee because it was too hot. Brave is trying to cool the coffee by blowing on it. Finn is relieved and strokes his chest. I'm relieved to hear that. Let me know if there's anything I can do to help. You're Mia's benefactor. If so, I will not hesitate to ask for your help. That being said, have you heard anything back from Carlsan? When I bring up the subject of Carlsan, Finn makes a sour face. He was angry with Carlsan, not me. I've sent him many letters from here, but no reply has come. He seems to be very busy, but I've never heard of that old man not responding to Mia's letters. Finn mumbles in a whisper, he made Mia sad. After hearing Finn's story, Luxion becomes suspicious and starts talking to me. Isn't there something going on in the Empire? Rumors are spreading in royal capital that the Empire has been acting strangely lately. Did trouble happen? Finn shrugs his shoulders as he worries while sipping his coffee. Don't worry, if there is a disturbance in the Empire, that old man will take care of it himself. If there is any trouble, it will be taken care of by a magic knight other than myself. The holy magic empire Voldanoa is probably the most powerful nation in the world at this time. The vastness of the country means that the number of lost items owned is also large. From the way Finn talks, it seems they have multiple cores of magic equipment. In other words, it is a troublesome country with several magic knights like Finn. It's a superpower country that even the kingdom of Horfolt is no match for. Luxion bites into Finn's story. That's really interesting. Magic knights how many magic cores exist? Luxion attempted to find out about their strength, but Brave interrupted the conversation. He steps forward to protect Finn and extends his small hands. Buddy, don't let your guard down. He's calculating our strength based on what you said. We can't let our guard down in front of this guy. To the wary brave, Luxion makes a deliberately mocking electronic sound. 
It was like he didn't understand what Brave was doing. Oya? Oh, yeah. We have no intention to antagonize you, but if you are so blatantly cautious, we might suspect that you are up to something. If you have nothing to hide, I would be happy to hear from you in general, if not in detail. Brave replies, trembling with anger. Because you can't be trusted. I am a being who obeys my master's commands. I cannot be hostile to you unless master is hostile to you. If you still say that you cannot tell me, then you are still willing to antagonize me. How is it that the master is friendly, but the servant is hostile? Finn was smiling wryly at Brave who looked frustrated saying Gunununu. On behalf of Brave, Finn answers Luxion. I'm sorry, but I can't talk about it because it's classified military secret. Is that okay, Luxion? Yes, understood. Luxion backs down, but I'm sure he didn't expect Finn to talk about military secrets. I guess he tried to stir up Brave to get information out of him. AI that makes you unable to stop let your guard down. I turn my face to Brave and apologize. I'm sorry, Kurosuk. Please forgive him. Instead of Luxion, I, his master, apologized to him. But Brave looked displeased. I'm Brave. Don't call me Kurosuk so familiarly. His usual cuteness disappeared and he told me with a straight face. Oh. It seems I was being a little too familiarly to him. Seeing that I was in trouble, Finn chided Brave. Don't look so displeased, Kurosuk. Here, I'll give you some sweets. Finn tossed a piece of sweets to him, and Brave was excited to receive it. It's a cookie! Hee <laughs> hee, let's eat it with the coffee my buddy gave me. He didn't seem too bothered when Finn called him Kurosuk. Well, considering the nature of the relationship, I guess it's inevitable. I look at Lux Ion and make a suggestion. A nickname is good, isn't it? I'm going to call you Luke Kuin from now on, with a friendly tone. When I asked if I could call him Luke Kuin, Lux Ion distanced himself from me. He quickly takes a distance of about one meter, and he answers in a cold electronic voice. I refuse. Don't be so blatantly averse to it. Perhaps finding our conversation amusing, Finn chuckled. Then, when he sits down in his chair, he changes the subject. The girls are going to be home late, so what are we going to do until then? He asks, and I tell him my plans for the day. I don't have anything in particular to do. What about you? Actually, I don't have any either. To begin with, I'm having trouble figuring out how to spend the holidays without Mia. What do you think I should do? Finn, who prioritizes Mia-chan and acts together even if it's a holiday, seems to have a hard time figuring out what to do when he's alone. A workaholic? Or should I say, his love is too heavy? Don't ask me. Don't you have something you want to do? Finn put his hand to his chin and thought about it, but nothing seemed to come to mind. Nothing. What were you doing before you met Mia-chan? I'm stunned, but I'm getting seriously worried. For Finn, it would be no exaggeration to say that Mia-chan is now his whole life. Before I met Mia? I think I did a lot of reckless things back then. Seeing Finn's distant look, Brave happily enters the topic. Before we met Mia, my partner picked me up. Back then, he was more thorny and unfriendly than he is now. But he was nice to me, so I guess you could call him Sundara. Finn, who was called Sundara, closed his eyes and blushed, perhaps embarrassed. Is that what you thought of yourself at the time? I wanted to tease Finn. Even though you are so dear dear to Mia-chan now, you have a past like that? Don't grin. I was just a little rough back then. Then I met Mia and I found the meaning of life. The meaning of life? Finn's words struck me as odd, and I think I probably had a straight face when I asked. Why did we reincarnate? Even I have my questions. I think it's just a coincidence and doesn't mean anything, but there are coincidences happening that can't be explained by that alone. It's the existence of Marie and Erica. How is it that we reincarnated in the same generation, with some margin of error, even though we died at different times? 
Finn notices a change in my mood, and after sipping his coffee, we have a serious talk. I look after Mia, who resembles my little sister. I think that's why I reincarnated and got a strong power. Well, that's my selfish wish. Finn was embarrassed and bashful, so I lowered my gaze. No, that's fine. I don't think I'll ever find meaning in it. Finn seemed to want to switch to another topic, perhaps thinking the mood was getting worse. You must at least have some meaning, right? After all, you've been reincarnated, you have three beautiful fiancés, and now you're a grand duke. You've got everything. You must be living a life of satisfaction, right? It sounded like that. I look up and let out a deep sigh. I wanted a modest happiness. I didn't wish for position, honor, or even three beautiful fiancés. I've been meaning to ask you this for a while. What? Finn asks me a question with a straight face, and it is an outrageous one. Who do you like best among those three? Ha. Huh. Don't say that you love them all equally. If you're a man, too, be clear. With a serious look on his face, he asked me, who do I like the most among Ange, Livia, and Noel? What a question for a normally serious person. There are more meaningful questions to ask. I'm asking seriously, though? I mean, what's it like to have three fiancés? I can't even imagine. Finn is seriously concerned, but it's not like in a mood I envy you having more than one fiancé. He seems to be asking out of a really simple interest. The Siscon, who is devoted to Mia, does not seem to want to date more than one girl. In my case, it just sort of happened. Before I knew it, the obstacles in my way had been removed. So you don't have any special feelings for those three? I'm going to hit you seriously. I really wanted to slam my fist into Finn's face when he tilted his head and said, So you don't love those three? Of course I love them. But being engaged to three people at the same time is, according to the values of my previous life, extremely unfaithful. Do I really love the three of them? I began to doubt myself. In that sense, I envied devoted Finn. But the five idiots are different, even if they are also devoted to the same person. I don't envy those five all-loving one Marie, or whatever it is. I'm sure they are devoted, but I'd like to ask them, are you guys okay with that? When I don't answer, Brave gives his guess. I think Olivia is his favorite. What about you, buddy? Asked by Brave, Finn seriously considers the question before giving his answer. Noel San, I guess? I don't know what they are using as a basis for mentioning their names, but they are really troubling. As they make their guesses, Luxion steps forward and raises his voice slightly. That's enough, please. Good. Tell these guys, Luxion. Tell them this is not a good topic to talk about, Master has a strong interest in breasts. Of the three, Angelica has the biggest breasts. Therefore, the answer is Angelica. What is this guy? Not only did he take the initiative to get involved in a topic that his master didn't want to touch, but he also clearly insisted that his guess was the answer. All of you, let me hit you one by one. While making noise in the tea room, the door to the room opens a little. When I looked in that direction. Looks like you're having fun. It is Julius and the others, the five idiots. Looking through the doorway into the tea room, I turned my lifeless eyes on the five idiots as I raised both eyebrows. What are you doing? You guys said you were going to help Marie with her stuff today. Why are the five idiots who were supposed to accompany Marie and Erica shopping in this room? Peeking into the room, Greg replies. When we tried to go with them, they turned us away, saying it was just the girls today. Brad looks sad. Thanks to that, I had to spend my holiday with just the guys. Is that a sarcasm against me having coffee with a guy? Zilk, sensing that I am in a bad mood, peeks at us through the doorway and tells us the rest of the story. Marie-san turned us away, so the five of us decided to make the most of our vacation. In that case, I thought of inviting you, too, Leon Kuen. These guys are trying to invite me out? As I looked at them suspiciously, Chris, who was peeking through the gap, told me his true feelings. 
We don't have enough money to go out on the town and have some fun. What happened to the pocket money I gave you? I glare at the five people trying to take me out as a substitute for their wallets, and a flustered Julius makes his excuses. As he opens the door and walks in, he speaks with gestures. You're wrong, Leon. We put all our money into the school festival to make it more exciting don't even spend your pocket money. Because you told us to make it more exciting. Indeed, I told them to make the school festival more exciting, but are they stupid enough to throw in the allowance I'm giving them? Well, come to think of it, they were idiots. They are five idiots because they are idiots. I didn't tell you to go that far. So you want to use me as your wallet and have fun? I ask as Julius turns his gaze away from me. I didn't say that. I'm just saying that it would be helpful if you would let us borrow in advance a prince who asks for an advance of allowance even like this, he was one of the capture targets in that Otone game. Despite their excellent academic performance, these guys are so dumb in their behavior. As I hold my head in my hands, Finn sympathizes with me. I respect you for taking care of these five people. Brave offered me a piece of cookie. You can have my cookie. Their sympathy seeps into my heart and I almost cry. Lux Ion, who was watching us, muttered in amazement. It's going to be another noisy day, in the evening, the royal capital was crowded. However, some of them still have traces of having been destroyed during the rebellion. Ropes were placed around the collapsed building to prevent people from approaching. Every time one sees the place, memories of the battle come back to them. Many of the residents of the royal capital had returned to their daily lives. For a while, there was a war with the Holy Kingdom of Rachel, and the royal capital was in danger. Rumors spread that the city was in danger, and the air was heavy with anxiety among the residents. Thanks to the short end of the war, smiles returned to the residents. Walking through the streets of such a royal capital, Mia was carrying a paper bag in her hand. Ehe, I bought a little too much. Mia is in a good mood after shopping. Not only did she get what she had planned, but she also got an item she liked, although it was unplanned. Seeing Mia looking so happy, Noelle with a shopping bag in each hand calls out to her. Good for you for buying a souvenir for Herring San. Yes. Will Night Sama be pleased? She replies happily, but soon afterward she looks troubled, as if she had become anxious. Livia, who was watching Mia like that, said to her. I'm sure he'll be pleased. Right, Ange? When asked to speak, Ange smiles and affirms. Right. Besides, it's that guy. If he hears it's a gift from Mia, that alone will make him happy. Dissatisfied with Ange's answer, Livia puffs her cheeks. Anja's way of speaking is starting to sound a lot like Leon Sands these days. When told, Anj gasps and puts her hand over her mouth. I wouldn't have noticed that myself. Livia let out a small sigh, then gave Anj a mischievous look. Recently, Anj has become less reserved with Leon San. The two of you have been sarcastic and criticizing each other more and more, so it's natural for you to become more alike. Livia is so mean today. Well, I don't dislike that part of you, but if you're getting more sarcastic and ironic, you'd better watch out. I'm sorry, Mia. Mia shakes her head as Ange lets out a small sigh and looks remorseful. I, it's okay. The four of them are on their way home after a long day of shopping and eating when Ange suddenly stops and looks up at the sky, and Noelle asks her a question. What's wrong? Ange replies in wonder. An Imperial airship is coming. I thought there was no appointment, but is it something urgent? The magnificent airship, proudly bearing the imperial flag, was escorted by six flying battleships. The sudden visit of the Empire seems to have made Ange feel a sense of crisis. Her expression turned stern and she looked slightly worried, another trouble? Chapter 3 Messenger from the Empire The next morning a representative of the delegation visiting from the Holy Magical Empire of Voldanoa appeared in the audience chamber of the royal palace. He has an audience with the king, Roland Rafa Horfelt, and the queen, Mylene Rafa Horfelt. Mylene was checking sideways, worried that Roland might be getting upset by the early morning urgency of his business. He's being very vigilant today. 
Roland's usual nonchalant attitude had disappeared, and he was more than serious, he was wary. Although his expression was masked, the slight changes made Mylene aware of it. The head of the delegation, a messenger from the Empire, kneels and bows his head. We are very grateful to your country for welcoming us despite this impromptu visit. Hearing the messenger's words, Roland opens his mouth with a gentle smile. We cannot treat your country with disrespect, which has taken care of us during the war with Rachel. I would like to know the reason for your sudden visit. We have only one matter of business. We are here to welcome Her Imperial Highness Princess Mirialis Lux Erzberger. The dignitaries and nobles in the audience hall buzzed upon hearing the messenger's words. Her Imperial Highness? Who is he talking about? When did we welcome Her Imperial Highness? Like all the unaware nobles and important figures, Mylene was also inwardly surprised. She just acts like she doesn't want to show it on her face, but she is puzzled by the talk about Her Imperial Highness. Mirialis? I don't remember there being such a princess in the Empire. Is she a baby or a child with special circumstances? But why would she be in the kingdom? No, don't tell me. Mylene arrived at the answer while thinking, but it was Roland who opened his mouth first. I have not heard that we received the princess of the empire in our country, is there a reason for this? The messenger replies to Roland, who honestly says he does not know. Due to certain circumstances, she had to hide her identity and was raised as a commoner. Currently, she is studying as a foreign student at the Academy of the Kingdom of Horfolt. A foreign student from the Empire, was it Her Imperial Highness? Roland muttered, deliberately surprised. The messenger again wishes to Roland. Even though she grew up a commoner, Her Imperial Highness has a rightful place. We would like to bring her to the Empire and treat her appropriately. The messenger shows slight impatience. Roland asks. Still, it's a bit sudden. Since she is studying abroad, why not wait until she has finished her studies? Why not wait six months for Her Imperial Highness to return to your country? When asked why he is in such a hurry to bring her back, the messenger gives a vague answer. I was only ordered to bring back Her Imperial Highness Princess Miliaris, but I don't know the details, so I can't give you an answer. Roland backs down at the messenger who bows deeply to him. Are you taking her home right away? Yes. As the conversation progressed, Mylene was thinking about Mirialis Mia. Thinking back, I wonder the reason Emperor Carl was in Fraser territory at that time was to see Mia Chan? Granddaughter or daughter if he can't disclose it, there must be a good reason for it. But why would he suddenly bring her back to the Empire as a princess? It is hard to believe that he would bring Mia back now and let her participate in the struggle for succession. Mylene predicts that something has happened in the Empire. We have too little information. Until the day they bring Her Imperial Highness back, let us entertain the envoys and explore the inner workings of the Empire. At least, if we had connected with Emperor Carl a little earlier, we could have sent a diplomat over there. From the perspective of the Kingdom of Horfolt, the Voldanoa Holy Magic Empire is a distant country. The reason for this lies in the Holy Kingdom of Rashal. Because of the Voldanoa Holy Magic Empire's close ties to the Holy Kingdom of Rashal, the Kingdom of Horfolt was not actively involved. It is the same on the Empire's side. They did not actively try to get involved with the Kingdom of Horfolt, but were wary of each other. Ten years ago, Empire approached them and had many discussions. It was only this year that they began accepting international students. From here on, the two countries were to promote diplomatic relations through foreign exchange students. Mylene looked down at the imperial messenger from her high seat. The messenger's expression relaxes for a moment from relief when he is able to bring Mia back. What's that face just now? Mylene has a bad feeling about the messenger's face with a dark smile. Mylene was wary of the messenger, but her gaze naturally moved to a young too young knight in the delegation. He was about fifteen years old. In the kingdom, he would have been a young man before entering the academy, but he looked imposing in his imperial black knight's outfit. He has the confidence and demeanor of a strong man combined with the cheekiness of youth. There is a certain arrogance in the way he looks at Roland and her. I wonder who he is. 
Perhaps noticing Mylene's gaze, the young man steps forward and kneels. May I ask for permission to speak, King Roland? The messenger looks puzzled, as if the young man is acting on his own. I permit you. Raise your head. When Roland gave his permission, the young man looked up and smiled. It is a face that has the youthfulness and cheekiness of a young man. It is my pleasure to meet you for the first time. My name is Leinhart Rua Kirchner. Actually, one of my seniors is studying in this country, so I thought I would like a chance to talk with him as a way of saying hello. The small, red-haired, impertinent young man spoke without hesitation in front of the king of another country. Come to think of it, there were two foreign students. I think that since my senior is the personal knight of Her Imperial Highness Princess Mirialis, we will be returning to the country together. Before that, I was curious to know what kind of place he studied at. Roland nodded after a moment's thought. I don't mind. Thank you, King Roland. On that day, someone claiming to be a messenger from the Empire visited the school. There were a few people who appeared to be in civilian positions, but there were thirty knights and soldiers who appeared to be guards. There was a slight sense of caution that a group of people had arrived. But that vigilance is soon lifted. Lean heart? Long time no see, senpai. In the plaza in front of the entrance of the school building, Finn and a young man with red hair were meeting each other and looking friendly. I watched the scene from a distance with Luxion and breathed a sigh of relief. So he is an acquaintance of Finn, huh? I was worried for nothing. I cannot confirm the response of the magic equipment. Apparently, he does not have a core. Luxion did not let his guard down as usual. I listened to Finn and the other's conversation. Finn, who is reunited with his junior, still seems confused. It would be unavoidable if a messenger suddenly came from the Empire. More importantly, what brings you to the kingdom? You came all of a sudden, did something happen in the empire? Leanheart, responding to Finn's question, brushes off the details. I'll explain the details later. But more importantly, where is Duke Bartfault, who gave Senpai a hard time? Leanheart's eyes meet mine as he searches his surroundings. Finn's junior, who looked cheeky, looked at me and smiled somewhat belligerent. I wave my hand and mutter in a whisper that can't be heard. He's a cheeky little brat. That's the impression the nobles of the kingdom have of master. As usual, I ignore Luxion's sarcasm and listen to Finn and the other's conversation. Finn corrects Leanheart about my title. He's the Grand Duke now. The kingdom seems to be short of talent. Ah, and more importantly, there is a sword saint in the kingdom, right? I was kind of looking forward to it, since I heard there was a son of a sword saint at the academy. Leanheart lightly tapped the two sabers at his waist with his left hand. Leanheart, who is lowering his Dacia-like saber swords, is apparently asking for Chris. TLN, matched pair of long and short swords, however, Finn appears to be slightly wary. This is not an empire. If you try anything, consider me an enemy. You are as serious as ever. Senpai. Well, that's all right where is Her Imperial Highness Princess Mirialis? Finn was astonished when Leanheart's mood changed dramatically. Finn grabs Leanheart's chest with his right hand. How do you know Mia's real name? Seeing Finn enraged, Leanheart made a troublesome face. It is the Empire's messenger who answers. Herring Dano, we are here by order of His Majesty to receive Her Highness Princess Miliaris. His Majesties? Why would Emperor Karl call me a... In the presence of other people, it seems that he does not call Karl San old man. As Finn released Leanheart, the messenger took one look at me with a smile on his face. In doing so, I think he saw Luxion at my side. The messenger says. I would like to go over the details with you alone, with no one else present. I will explain the situation, including the matter of Her Highness Princess Mirialis. As it was, Finn and the others were left the school and taken to the harbor to an imperial airship. The airships used by the delegation were those used by nobles in the empire. The exterior and interior have been carefully designed, making you feel like a luxury hotel. Messenger and Leanheart and Finn and Brave. 
When the four gathered in her room, the messenger was the first to open his mouth. Emperor Carl passed away. What do you mean? For a moment, Finn's mind refused to comprehend what was being said. He could not imagine that Carl, who had been in good health not long ago, had died. To Finn, who cannot accept the reality, Leanheart explains in a troublesome manner, sitting in a chair and folding his hands behind his head. The previous emperor died and Moritzama ascended to the throne. We came to pick up Miliaris at the order of Moritzama. Finn squeezes his hand and gives Leanheart a stern look. What happened? Is it an accident? If Carl, who was healthy for nothing, were to die, he would immediately imagine that it was an accidental death. But Leanheart says bluntly. His Majesty Moritz led a private army to kill the previous emperor. I haven't heard the details, he seems to have committed some kind of betrayal. That old man betrayed the empire. Did the crown prince did it? Don't tell me, Mia also will be. Finn turns his gaze to Brave. That is to wear the magic armor in this place. Isn't Moritz trying to bring Mia back so he can assassinate her? Such imagination is the result of Finn's caution. I will not forgive anyone who touches Mia, even if it's you. When Brave even showed the motivation, Leanheart scratched his head. Annoyingly as it is, he tells them of a reality that they don't anticipate. His Majesty Moritz is not interested in Milialis Sama. What he is interested in is a magic creature just like Brave. Finn and Brave stop moving. Leanheart says, deciding that they are willing to listen. Arcadia, a very large magic creature has been revived. The core of my magic equipment is also obediently following. It was Brave who was flustered to hear the name. Why is Arcadia still alive? It should have been sunk by the old humans. It sank with three ships that were the trump cards of the old humans along with it. Arcadia, a fortress floating in the sky, the trump card of new humans that sank long ago. It sank with the old humans' trump card, and even Brave thought that its survival was unlikely. Even if you to tell me that. It was actually revived and is now Moritzama's advisor. Finn asks Leanheart. Did it do that to his majesty? Why are you following it? Didn't General Gunther say anything? Leanheart shakes his head at Finn's outrage. We have more problems than that. Well, I'll talk about it in detail when we get back to the Empire. It's going to be quite a hassle. When Finn, unconvinced, tried to open his mouth, the messenger, who had been silent until now, moved. He went in front of Finn and handed him a letter from Moritz. Herring Dono, His Majesty Moritz has a confidential request for you. Request? Concerned that it is not in order, Finn opens the letter seal and checks its contents. Surprised by its contents, he opened his eyes and clutched the letter. What do you mean, you want me to assassinate Leon? The messenger explains the situation with fright to Finn, who radiates a killing intent. The Empire is already preparing to declare war on the kingdom. Why? Why? If this is about Rachel, no, not about that. We, the Empire, are incompatible with the kingdom. This is not a war to bring them to submission. The Empire will fight to destroy the kingdom once and for all. It is. This is not a war to bring you to its knees. The Empire will fight to destroy the kingdom once and for all. Finn puts his right hand to his face in disbelief. Don't be kidding. What's the point of starting a war now? Finn was unconvinced, and Leanheart let out a sigh of amazement. Senpai has become much more mellow. It's a real shame, because you used to be more like a sharp blade. When Finn turned the murderous intent on Leanheart, he was pleased. I wish I had brought my magic equipment so I could have lived up to Senpai's expectations. Leanheart was a magic knight, but he was not accompanied by a magic core. Apparently, he left it in the Empire. The messenger clears his throat at the two, who are in a threatening mood. That's enough, both of you. I would rather have Herring Dono defeat the trump card of the kingdom, the Grand Duke Bartfault. This is also for the sake of Miliaris Sama. What do you mean? Actually when Finn heard the truth from the messenger, he loosened his clenched hand and looked up at the ceiling. 
Chapter 4 Assassination in the school cafeteria, a farewell party for Mia was being held, albeit a fine one. The participants are the usual members of the group, and it was Ange who planned the event. Sorry for the detail. If I had more time to prepare, I could have made it a little more grand. Mia is nervous in front of the dishes on the table. T that's not true. It's so gorgeous and Mia is happy with it. I was just sad about leaving. Mia spills her true feelings in front of everyone. I wanted to be with you all for just a little while longer. Besides, it's kind of strange to be treated like a princess all of a sudden. Mia suddenly had to return to her homeland, but was puzzled when she was informed of her origin as a member of the royal family. And she is not satisfied with the sudden discontinuation of her study abroad program. Erica speaks to Mia, who is looking down in her chair, in a gentle tone of voice. It can't be helped if you don't feel it actually happening. You just have to get used to it slowly. Erika Sama Erika smiles at Mia, who is in tears. You can call me without honorifics. B but Mia Mia can't call Erika without realizing her position as a princess Erika shakes her head at Mia. I want to be your friend. The princess Mia San Mia, you can call me without honorifics and no one will blame you. Please. Will you be my friend? Erika Sama why yes. Mia will also call you Erika. Seeing Mia looking tearful and happy, Ange strokes her chest in relief. It looks like this will not end in a painful goodbye, she thought. But at the same time, it makes her think. Why is the Empire so impatient? The timing of the announcement regarding Her Imperial Highness is also unnatural. It could have been done after the study abroad program was over. Is there some kind of incident within the Empire? Ange, worried about the many suspicious points, turned her gaze to Finn, who was attending the farewell party. He is by Mia's side and has a troubled look on his face, but he watches over her with warm eyes as usual. However, Brave is strange. He shows no interest in any of the food on the table and does not act as cheerful as he usually does and he did not want to leave Finn's side. Is there something going on? While she was thinking like that, Finn approached Leon and called out to him. Leon can I talk to you for a second? Is it okay if you don't stay by Mia's side? I need to talk to you. Can you make time for me later? I want to talk to you personally. I don't mind. Looking at Finn, who had a contemplative expression on his face for a moment, Ange thought. Herring also mentioned he was going back to the Empire. Is he going to say goodbye to Leon or something? But still, he's acting strangely. As she is concerned about their situation, Livia speaks to her. Ange, what's wrong with Leon San and the others? I was just a little worried. Hey, Livia isn't something wrong with Herring? He certainly looks lonely. Livia looks at the two of them. It seems that Finn, who has grown close to Leon, appears to be reluctant to say goodbye. Ange agrees, but she feels there is something more to it than that. She felt a tingling sensation that stimulated her skin. I'm curious. As she is wary of Finn, Noelle approaches her this time. No idea what she had gotten herself mixed up in, but she was laughing at Ange. Angelica is a little overconcerned, don't you think? Maybe you thought Herring San was going to take Leon away from you? I don't think so Noel jokes about it, and Ange tells her in amazement. I know it sounds funny, but it's not the least bit funny. Eh, you're lying, right? At Noel's surprise, Ange lets out a sigh. I don't think it's possible when it comes to Leon. But if we're not careful, other women could snatch him up. Even now, Clarice and Deirdre are still aiming at him. Livia apparently got a headache at the mention of their names. She lowered her eyebrows and let out a small sigh. Putting aside Clarice Senpai, Deirdre Senpai's older sister married into the Bardafault family, right? I think the connection between the families has been established. Why does she keep going after Leon? Ange tells Livia, who doesn't understand, with a wry smile. In her case, it's just a combination of personal greed and her family's policy. Noelle, because of that, be careful, 
because if you're careless, they'll take Leon away. Noelle, advised by Ange, was struggling to understand with her head in her hands. Why do they only go after Leon? There are other men out there. Livia says, raising her gaze slightly. That is, well Leon Sands' fault, isn't it? Livia's expression, recalling what had happened so far, was dumbfounded, but she smiled wryly at the fact that it was inevitable. Ange had also given up on the matter. It was inevitable that the two of them would go after Leon, she thought. Leon, who usually has a dull attitude but takes an active part when the occasion calls for it, is at fault. That gap is a foul. But that doesn't mean I can't tolerate more. She accepts that this is the result of Leon's actions and that it is inevitable. There was a little bit of affection mixed in while blaming, but neither Livia nor Noel were particularly bothered by it because they both remembered it. However, Ange has no intention of allowing the number of women to increase any further. Livia makes a troubled face. Ange is very strict. The other day, when she found out that a first-year student had taken a liking to Leon San, she gave her a warning. Noelle is surprised by the word warning, which brings up a scary image. Eh, did you do that? Ange is a little baffled by Noelle's reaction. Why am I being blamed? Let me tell you, this is still a very moderate measure. There is a first-year girl whom Leon saved from an arrogant male student. She seems to have developed a faint crush on Leon. To such a girl, Ange give a warning indirectly. However, she felt that Livia misunderstood her, so Ange explained it properly. The goal is to warn her before she gets serious, so that both sides don't get hurt. In fact, that girl understood and withdrew, too. I only stopped her before she made a mistake and approached Leon, because it wouldn't have been good for her. Let me tell you, I could have been rougher with her, but I didn't. Ange says that she can't stand being blamed even though she gently admonished him. Livia was satisfied with the explanation and seemed a little apologetic. I see that was the case. I'm still not familiar with the common sense or unspoken understanding of the school Ange, I'm sorry I misunderstood you. When Livia apologizes, Ange shrugs. Well, considering your circumstances, it can't be helped. As the two seem convinced, Noelle grabs the ends of her side ponytail with her fingers and plays with them. I guess there are various things at school only for nobles. After Ange finishes her explanation, she takes a breath and looks at Leon. As usual, Luxion was by Leon's side. If Luxion is there, even if trouble arises, it will be manageable. I hope nothing happens, though. After the farewell party, Finn took me to an unpopular place. Although it's on the school grounds, I don't like the atmosphere of the school at night. This is because, like in my previous life, there are ghost stories of the school in this world. It seems that another world likes scary stories as well. When I came to the well-kept courtyard, the trees blocked the view from the surroundings. So what are we talking about all the way out here? It could be okay to talk in the boys' dormitory. I shrug my shoulders and look at Finn, who has his back to me. But Brave was staring at me with one wary eye. Luxion is floating around my right shoulder, increasing his vigilance. Maybe he is concentrating on Brave's moves, so he doesn't speak much. I speak to Finn's back. It's about time you told me why you called me up. I tried to keep my voice as relaxed as possible, but I couldn't help but feel nervous. Finn's unusual atmosphere stirs my bad hunch. Finn put his hands in his pants pockets and looked up at the sky. I looked at the sky, too, and saw that the stars were unusually beautiful today. Finally, Finn opens his mouth. I was instructed to assassinate you from my home country. How many seconds did it take for me to understand what he had just said? I understood the meaning of the words, and my wide-open eyes returned to normal. What is it about me that has provoked the Empire? In the first place, why would Carl Sand permit me to be assassinated? I didn't think that person would order an assassination, and I thought that he would crush the order, even if someone else sent the order. But I am concerned that the order was reached to Finn. Did Carl San approve of this assassination? And what would have caused him to do so? As my normally unused head begins to spin, Finn, who has only his upper body looking back at me, tells me a terrible truth. 
he was assassinated by his son, His Highness Moritz. Now His Highness Moritz has ascended the throne. It's the first time I've heard it. I think as I listen to my own slightly trembling voice. Assassination? That man? Why was he killed? What happened? I never heard of any change in the empire. I look at Lux Ion and he answers my question. The information has not reached the kingdom. Although diplomatic relations with the holy magical empire of Voldanoa are not strong, is it still possible to keep the change of emperor a secret? Before I can answer the questions that come to mind one after another, Finn turns his body to me and gives me the details. The succession itself is a secret. When Mia returns to the empire, the coronation of Moritz will be officially announced. The empire will then declare war on the kingdom of Horfolt. I furrowed my eyebrows at the words squeezed out of Finn's anguished expression. Does this Moritz guy really hate this country that much? I'll stop the war. Finn, you'll help me, won't you? Why does everyone always want to start a war right away? I suggest to Finn that we forcefully stop it if this happens, but he refuses my offer. I can't help you. Finn? Why? For Mia's sake I have no choice but to fight you. Finn's expression, which was distressed but smiling, looked sad even though he was laughing. Brave jumps in front of Finn and spreads his tiny hands. Buddy, don't fret. If we don't defeat Leon here, we'll be in trouble. Wear me and fight now. Hearing Brave's words, Luxion emitted a crackling electrical discharge from his sphere. He deploys a defensive field between me and Finn and starts stalling for time. The garbage of pollutants created by the new humans has revealed its true nature. Master, my main body is already in the sky waiting for you. Permission to attack! As Luxion and Brave were about to start fighting, I watched Finn. Finn doesn't take Brave's suggestion and doesn't try to wear magic equipment. Seeing that figure, I guess that Finn was hesitant and raised my voice. Finn, answer me. How come Mia Chan's name came up? Master? Why don't you give permission to attack? These guys are enemies, you know? Brave rushes Finn when he sees that Luxion is unable to attack. Buddy, if we don't do it here, we will definitely regret it. You decided to fight for Mia, buddy. Then we have to do it here, right? There is still a chance. At this distance, Luxion can't fire its main gun because it'll engulf Leon. It's our last chance. Finn was troubled by Brave's statement about being wary of Luxion's main gun and was unable to give an answer. I keep calling out to Finn without giving up. Say something. You don't really want to fight, right? So do I. I don't want to fight you. If that's the case, why don't we just find a way to avoid it? In response to my voice, Finn, who had been looking down, raised his head. He just looks frustrated and shed tears. There's nothing I can do about it. If you knew the circumstances, even you I know that, so I, buddy. Brave approaches Finn and wants him to put on his magic equipment. However, Finn grabs Brave with his right hand and orders him to stay. Kurosuk I'm done. I don't want to kill Leon this way. Be buddy? Seeing Brave with his hands slumped, Luxion's electronic voice goes wild. You have been assuming from earlier that you can win, but you are underestimating me and my master. Immediately afterward, Aragans descended behind me. In order not to damage us, he slowed down the moment he landed. In his hands he holds a Gatling gun, the muzzle of which is pointed at Finn and the others. Realize the power of weapons that have been improved with anti-magic equipment in mind, Luxion, wait. Master, if you give me permission to attack, we can eliminate these guys immediately. I said stop. I forcibly stopped Luxion and approached Finn, ignoring the defensive field. Luxion released the defensive field and I approached Finn and grabbed his arm. Tell me. What happened? Finn says while drooping his head weakly. The boss of the cores has revived. At Finn's words, Luxion was muttering behind me, Arcadia. The electronic voice had a tremble to it, as if he was upset, but I focused on Finn's story. 
The boss apparently Arcadia has a grudge against the kingdom. Especially you, Leon. You, who have Luxion, are their top priority to get rid of. When it comes to the boss of the new human side, Luxion, a weapon of the old human side, is probably an existence that cannot be left alone. Just as Luxion hates the magic equipment, the magic equipment hates Luxion and other artificial intelligences. Then, you and me defeating the boss of the magic equipment would be the end of it, but it was Brave who rejected such a suggestion. It's impossible. You won't know unless you try. As soon as that bastard revived, the artificial intelligences woke up, too, as if they sensed the danger. They charged in to destroy Arcadia, and they were all shot down. The bastard Arcadia had just been revived, and it was not perfect. Its performance is 70% at best. At worst, about 50%. If I tell you that much, even Luxion can understand that, right? When I looked at Luxion, his attitude was different from usual. Luxion, who is supposed to be bold, comes up with an unexpected suggestion. Master, my main body is an immigrant ship. I know. So what? Unlike other artificial intelligences, my main purpose is for the survival of the human's migration. That is why I exist. Therefore, the conclusion I have drawn is to escape into space. Ha! Huh. Are you insane? It's like you're going to lose before you try, oi. Don't tell me, at this point, the probability of me winning is probably not zero. However, the odds of winning are at most a few percent. I cannot involve Master into such a battle. That Luxion assured me that we could not win. Luxion, which has so far overwhelmed his opponents with his specs, suggests to me that I should run away because I can't win. Finn talks about the meaning of my assassination. He says that the kingdom you are in is a threat to our empire. I'm a threat? I have no intention of fighting. A.A., I know. I know you're not a mindless fighter either. But it's already been decided. I was speechless. I didn't want to understand what Finn was saying. Assassinate me because I'm a threat? And they want Finn to do that? When I was speechless, Finn continued. I can't die to protect Mia either. As a result of his anguish, Finn seems to have decided to return to the Empire to protect Mia. They say that if he resists, they will destroy the whole kingdom. I'm at a loss for words. Finn says to me. Arcadia hates you guys. They will do whatever it takes to destroy you. My partner is right. No one can stop that bastard in this day and age. Even we can't do anything about it. That's why buddy to you, we cannot win if we go against it. Finn would not want to involve Mia in such a battle. Finn shows me his tears. TLN, wouldn't this kind of development be liked by Fujoshi? I was requested to assassinate you, and I will report that I failed. Leon, you need to run. To space, or anywhere. Just run away. After saying that, Finn takes Brave and leaves. I cover my face with my hands and look down. What the hell, really? How could this happen? You want me to abandon my second homeland and flee into space? What's that? I was able to avoid killing each other with my friend, but I was too shocked to move. Then Luxion approaches me. Master, you must make a decision. Luxion? Let's get those who should be evacuated on my main body and get out into space as soon as possible. It will take some time to select the people, so we should act immediately. Only this time, it seems that even Luxion can't do anything about it. Chapter 5 Erica and Mia why would Arcadia declare war on the kingdom of Horfolt? Is it because I have the old human weapon, Luxion, with me? But then there is no need to involve the people of the kingdom as well. Just defeat me, as they ordered Finn to do. If they think the kingdom is going to unite to protect me they're wrong. So what's the reason for them to start declaring war? Is Arcadia really such a great weapon? I couldn't sleep at all last night. My head is still trying to comprehend the shocking details that Finn has just told me. 
After returning to my room, I talk with Luxion about various things, but unable to come up with any solutions. High mobility battleship it is the trump card of the old humans who specialized in combat. It had more combat capability than I did. Three of these high mobility battleships were deployed, and yet they were matched against the Arcadia. From the current conditions, it seems that they could not make the Arcadia stop functioning simply by sinking it. From a performance standpoint, Luxion does not stand a chance. Depends on the state of Arcadia, right? There's a chance even you could take it down. I don't deny it. But I have concluded that that brave is no match for me. I don't trust him, but if our odds were better, Finn would be on our side. Luxion thought that was the only reason he chose to antagonize me even to avenge Carlsan's death. The reason Finn returned to the Empire, even by making an enemy of me was because he decided that even in the current state of Arcadia, Luxion could not win. As I hung my head, Luxion approached me and spoke to me in a somewhat gentler tone of voice than usual. Finn chose Master over the Emperor's request. What made him do so was, I know. I'm grateful to him. I remember Finn's face, which was extremely troubled. Finn's failure to assassinate me will damage his reputation in the Empire. There is a possibility that he will be punished in some way, and if things go badly, he will have to leave Mia Chan's side. Finn, who puts Mia Chan first, took that many risks to overlook me. I don't want to sum it up in one simple word, friendship, but Finn saved me this time. I double check with Lux Ion. Even you and me can't win, huh? Yes. I strongly suggest that we escape into space. Luxion's words and actions, without sarcasm or irony, showed that he was serious. It's pathetic, isn't it? When someone stronger than you appears on the scene, you have no choice but to run away. I've been rampaging around all this time doing whatever I want I'm really hilarious. I am terribly ashamed of myself for thinking that with Luxion, I would have no problems. Running away from Arcadia is not hilarious. In the first place, the old humans could not defeat it even if they tried with all their might. There is no need for Master to be ashamed. You're being awfully honest today. You can be more sarcastic and ironic. Master, I am not joking. Please make a decision. I forced myself to smile at Luxion, who pressed me to make a decision. I don't fight a battle that I can't win. Yes. I don't think there's any shame in running away. Yes. I think it's stupid to risk your life to fight. That's the right decision, master. In the first place, if the kingdom is attacked because of my presence, I don't mind running away. I would rather just run away into space than fight a monster like Arcadia. That way, even the empire won't attack the kingdom. Get ready to escape. Yes, master. If only I were gone, the Empire will lay down their arms. There is no need to worry about anything. If I'm gone, the problem will be solved. Now, let's run away into space at night once the decision is made to escape into space, all that remains is to prepare. Fortunately, Luxion is a high-performance immigrant ship and is apparently capable of breaking through the atmosphere alone. Luxion itself will provide the necessary items, so I will probably only bring a few memorable items with me. The problem is who else am I going to take with me? As I walk down the hallway with a bouquet of flowers, I look up a bit, a dark shadow under my eyes, and think. Will the three of them follow me? When I voice my concerns, Luxion gives me affirmation. It's very likely. If so, there would be five people to take along, including Master and Erica? It would be lonely living in space with just the five of us. In the first place, Erica would be in cold sleep, right? Imagining five people living on an immigrant ship makes me feel a little lonely. The symptoms will improve once the patient is removed from the magic environment, so there is no need to go to the trouble of cryohibernation. Erica will be able to live a normal life on the ship. If Master and Erica have a child together, there is a good chance that it will have the characteristics of the old humans. We will give you our full support. He tells me to have a child with Erica at this point. These guys are really bad at giving up. I told you I didn't want to do that. 
I mean, there was someone who would have said that if Erica was going into space, then she would go, too. It's Marie. And if Marie says she is going, of course those five idiots will follow her. What will happen to Kyle and Kara? As I counted, Luxion was stunned. Are you going to take Marie and the others with you? I'm sure they'd love to go with me, right? But I guess I'll never be bored with them, but what will actually happen? Let's talk to Ange and the others first. I had come to Erica's hospital room to visit her before that. On board the second Einhorn-class ship Lickhorn. I visited with a bouquet of flowers to visit Erica, who was resting in the infirmary. In addition, I was going to tell Erica that I was going to follow her into space too. We were almost at Erica's room, but there was someone waiting for us in the hallway. It's clear, she is different than usual. Master, I have something important to tell you. Clear? Is Erica's condition worsening? As I worried about Erica's condition, Creer shook her single eye from side to side in a head-shaking gesture. Erica Chan is sleeping. Her condition is not getting better, but it's not getting worse either. I see. I'm glad to hear that. So, what's the important talk? As I breathe a sigh of relief, Creer tells me calmly as if her usual cheerful attitude is a lie. Master, Erica Chan and the others are most likely descendants of the old humans. Ha. Huh. I gave Creer a quizzical look. What is she talking about? The major difference between old humans and new humans is whether or not they can use magic by utilizing magic elements. There is a clear way to identify new humans if they can use magic. Yet Creer called us descendants of the old humans. Is that it? Are you saying that we are the reincarnated people have the characteristics of an old humans? I'm not talking about that. Anyway, let me explain it to you once thoroughly. We are taken by Creer to another room. The place we moved to was Creer's room, which had been prepared on board Lickhorn. A former artificial intelligence that managed the research institute, Creer's room is furnished with a variety of equipment. Or should I say laboratory? In a small room with lots of stuff, I was standing in front of a screen projected in the air. In a dimly lit room the data I was shown presented unbelievable facts. In place of me, who is not responding, Luxion is asking Creer. I was aware that Erica and Mia had opposite reactions to the magic element. But this is unbelievable. After analyzing both Erica and Nia Chan for treatment purposes, Creer had reached an extraordinary conclusion in the course of examining the data. Like I said, I did preface this by saying it's a possibility, right? But it's my prediction, and I judge it to be highly probable. Luxion pointed a red lens at the screen and moved the ring in the lens constantly. Erica is the descendant of the old humans and Nia is the descendant of the new humans? To Luxion, who was not convinced, Creer explained while giving him various data. We initially assumed that all humans in this world were new humans because they could use magic. The ability to use magic is a major characteristic of the new humans. To begin with, magic elements were poison to the old humans. Yes, that's it. For Erica Chan, high concentrations of magic elements were poison. I had expected it to be a result of the old humans' traits as reincarnated people? I've come to that conclusion as well. I'd concluded that the reincarnated people master and others with previous lives were special, and that everyone else was descended from a new humans. It felt as if everything we believed in was crumbling noisily. Initially, I had left all this talk of old humans, new humans, etc., as a fluffy setting for that Otome game. I accepted it without doing much research. The result of not taking it seriously is now. Creer displays the information she has obtained in the kingdom of Horfolt. I am sure the information was stolen from somewhere. But I didn't have the time or the mental capacity to ask questions right now. About Erica Chan's illness, there have been a few reports, though they are few and far between. It seems that there are children who are suffering from the magic element, just like Erica. Looking at the documents containing the detailed reports, it is written that they had recovered for a period of time, like Erica. But soon after that, it became worse than before. Creer gives a brief result. My guess is that the people of the kingdom are the descendants of the old humans. 
I questioned Creer. You are the ones who said that the old humans can't use magic. I can use magic if I want to. That's a mistake. I wanted to deny this talk. I wanted it to be a mistake. But Creer tells me a fact that I don't want to know. While we were sleeping, the old humans must have studied magic. Even if they couldn't use it themselves, they predicted that they might have acquired the technology to use and apply the magic elements, then the old humans chose to adapt to this planet full of magic elements. Didn't the old humans escape into space? I turned my gaze to Luxion and asked him about the circumstances at the time. There was no luxury at the time to afford to send all humans up into space. I was built to carry selected human beings out into space. So there were old humans left behind those who were left behind must have somehow found a way to survive. As a result, the technology they arrived at was magic. Creer speculates what those left behind might have done in those days. I wonder because the old humans couldn't use magic elements, so maybe they used it through machines? I think it gave the next generation the ability to use magic. To me, this raises the question. Isn't that already the same as new humans? Here's the important part. The old humans had their genes modified by magic. Their genes modified? Is it possible for magic to do that? I decided to keep my mouth shut, saying that it would be fine to interject after hearing the continuation. Creer states her prediction without hesitation. I think they anticipated that in the future the magic element would fade away. They thought that if that happened, the new humans, who could not survive without magic elements, would perish. So they had it worked out so that in the future, when the magic element fades, they can revert back to the old humans. Is that possible? No matter how much, magic is an unknown field for us. We can't rule out the possibility, and we've actually discovered the modified parts. So they expected the new humans to eventually perish, and they had an elaborate mechanism in place. Well, it seems they didn't expect it to change so rapidly in this time period. Can't new humans survive without magic elements? I'm more surprised at the mechanism that would allow them to revert back to their ancestors once the magic element has been faded away. Creer talks about future problems. The triggers that perform the reverting are also tricky. There seems to be no way to fine-tune it, and once triggered, there is no going back. Since the concentration of magic elements has temporarily dropped dramatically, there will be more children with symptoms similar to Erica's in the future. Has the concentration of magic elements decreased? Master, don't you remember? The sacred tree that Ideal was guarding used to absorb magic elements. Luxion reminded me of that. About what happened in the Republic of Arzal. That plant, which is too ominous to be called a sacred tree, was sucking up the magic elements around it. It seems that the concentration of magic elements has decreased worldwide for a while since that time. Creer nodded. So ideal is the hope. Indeed, for the old humans, it was a hope to reduce the concentration of magic elements by absorbing them. I don't think it was ever completely removed, though. Transport ship ideal the same artificial intelligence as Luxion and the others, but he was the one who antagonized us in the incident involving the sacred tree. Luxion and I took down an out-of-control sacred tree, but there was a problem in the process. Luxion explains the situation at that time. I predict that during that battle, the sacred tree temporarily sucked up the surrounding magic elements and caused a change in their concentration. As a result, Erika's physical condition improved, on the contrary, Mia Chan got worse. As I look down, Creer states the results of her analysis of Erika. In Erika Chan's case, she's a special case in that she took the next stage earlier than most of the other kids. The hypothesis that the reincarnated humans have characteristics of the old humans seems to have been incorrect. In Erika's case, because she progressed to the next stage early, she showed more of the characteristics of the old humans than others. As a result, she was unable to adapt to the environment and became sickly. Creer proceeds to mentions countries that may be descendants of the old humans. Horfolt, Fanos, Rachel, and Reparto the surrounding countries are more likely to be the old humans. Conversely, the Empire is more likely to be the new humans. From there, Luxion guesses. 
If Arcadia is supporting the Empire, this is most likely the case. Even if they are unaware of it, the environment will eventually be favorable to the new humans. Since Arcadia possesses the ability to generate and spread magic elements. If that happens, the concentration of magic elements will become denser again. For Erica, it will be a world where people with the same constitution as Erica will not be able to adapt. It's a trigger, but once it switches, there's no going back. If we leave it at this, the old human side will eventually perish in silence. Maybe Arcadia is aware of this. Maybe that's why they thought of declaring war on the kingdom? If they only wanted me, they wouldn't have to go to all the trouble of starting a war. Even so, if they decided to declare war, could it be because of some other Arcadia's goal of destroying the old humans? Creer's prediction had me breaking out in a cold sweat. Why are they doing such a useless thing now? The ancient war should have nothing to do with us. And yet Arcadia is going to exterminate the people of the kingdom? Luxion, sensing my question, tells me the answer. Master, our war is not over. It must have ended a long time ago. We have not received any orders or word that the war has ended. For us, the war is still ongoing. And so is Arcadia. It is beyond laughable that a war that happened a long time ago has not ended. If this story is true, it is unlikely that the story will end with me escaping into space. As long as Arcadia exists, there is a path of destruction ahead for the old humans. Chapter 6 A New Family I thought if I ran away to space, it would be the end of the story. If I disappear from the kingdom of Horfolt, the empire, which has lost its objective, will lay down its arms, I thought. But apparently, it is not that simple. I had not even anticipated that there was such a deeper and more troubling problem in that Otome game. What is it with the old humans and the new humans? I wanted it to be set in a gentler world. Uncle, you look pale, are you okay? The room where Erica is being treated is the hospital room provided in Lickhorn. It seems that Luxion and Creer have been particular about this place, and a variety of equipment is available. It is a room where you can feel their strong will not to let Erica die no matter what. I was sitting in a chair next to the bed where Erica was lying down. I am smiling, but I am not sure if I am smiling properly. I'm just a little sleep-deprived. Don't worry, I'll take a nap when I get back. I just want to confirm one thing with Erica. Me? Erica, who is sitting with her upper body up, is tilting her head. You've been keeping secrets from us, haven't you? Her condition improved and worsened Erica seemed calm for someone who had undergone so many changes in her own body in such a short period of time. Even if she has a previous life, it is too unnatural. After hearing what Creer said, one possibility popped into my head. Seeing that reaction, it seems I am right. Erica looks down and apologetic. I'm sorry. Let's hear the details. It's an important matter that's going to affect the future. As far as I know, Erica is the only one who has played through the third game of that Otome game. Marie was half-heartedly playing and leaving it alone, and when it came to Finn, he just watched from the side as his little sister was playing. I've only completed the first work and have no knowledge of the third work. I heard a lot of things from Erica beforehand, but the premise was different to begin with. Since the third scenario of that Otome game has already broken down, we chose the policy of trying to act appropriately at the time. So I missed it. The possibility that Erica is not telling us all the information she knows. Erica talks bit by bit. When I was little, my mom was so busy with work that I hardly got to play with her. I missed her a lot, but I don't blame her. But I wanted to play with her, so I decided to at least play the same games. It seems that when she started up the game console at home, she found that she could play the third work of that Otome game. In her spare time, when she was lonely, Erica seemed to play the game. I cleared it over and over again. Not that I liked it, but I think I enjoyed the feeling that I was playing with something my mom liked. Rather than being interested in the O-Tone game, she was more interested in the game that Marie was playing. I scratch my head and apologize for my incompetent sister. That idiot, she could have gotten more other toys. I'm sorry, it's apologies from your uncle 
too. I don't mind. Erica smiles gently and continues. I had read about the strategy on my mom's phone. So, you see, Erica, the villain princess, was actually set up to be really sickly. In the game, she was treated as a liar. Smiling bitterly, Erica says that the villain princess has lost the trust of those around her because of her lies so far. As a result, people thought she was lying about being sick and suffering from her illness, a pitiful existence. I ask for a detailed explanation of the disease. What was the cause of the villain princess's illness? I don't know that much about it. But it was getting worse at the time Mia Chan was awakened, so I think that's the trigger. Erica turned her head away from me and looked down. In other words, Erica knew that if Mia Chan's condition improved, her own condition could worsen. If Erica gets better, Mia Chan will suffer. If Mia Chan gets better, Erica's condition will worsen. I felt like I was being told that the descendants of old humans and new humans could not live in the same world. So you thought you could suffer for Mia Chan's sake. I let out a small sigh and Erica looked apologetic to me. It's okay because I've lived enough, including in my previous life. Besides, I've made memories with my mom and uncle. She smiles at me, a troubled, happy, kind of smile. Is it because she has a previous life that she gives up so easily? Or is this Erica's human nature? As an uncle, part of me was proud of her, but I didn't want her to do anything that would cost her own life. You're a bad girl. Didn't you ever learn that you have no filial piety if you die before your parents? If I weren't here, you'd really be dead. Would you be willing to die and leave Marie behind? Erica was troubled by my words. I don't think that's something appropriate for Ajisan to say, though. Yes, indeed. When I put my right hand to my forehead and laughed and agreed, Erica smiled as well. I tell Erica with a fake smile on my face. If anything happens in the future, please let me know in advance. Yes. But it's a very old memory, so there are many things I can't remember. If I remember, I'll let Uncle know. Erica said it with a smile, unaware of what would happen as a result of her actions. As I step out into the hallway, Luxion, who has been waiting outside the room, approaches me. Master should look at yourself objectively before making any statements. Many of the statements you made to Erica apply to Master as well. Don't eavesdrop. It's to make follow-up for Master who neglects to share information, you're getting all glib. As I start to walk away, Luxion moves into position. He turns his single red eye on me, floating around my right shoulder, matching with my walking speed. You didn't tell Erica the truth, did you? She doesn't need to know. It would be pitiful if she knew that a lot of people would lose their lives because of her choice. I said I felt sorry for her, but I can't blame Erica for not knowing the circumstances. I was the one who helped Mia Chan get healthy. If there is a sin, it would be on me. Perhaps it was because I had an expression of distress on my face, Luxion was worried about me. Escape is the right decision, Master has done nothing wrong. Do you really think I'm going to change my mind now? Then, is it okay to proceed with the escape plan as planned? I'll be bringing people I know on board, though, so the numbers will increase. If I can't win anyway, I'll just have to put my family and relations people I know on the Luxion main body and escape into space. Even though I just didn't know anything about it, I just can't help but feel responsible. Luxion, sensing my feelings, keeps trying to persuade me not to change my mind. Master has made a wise decision, the people who got involved won't forgive me, though. Thanks to Master's decision to escape, the descendants of the old humans will not be destroyed and will survive. It is a wiser choice than extinction. I hope so. Luxion, who reminds me that I made a wise choice, seems to be worried about me. Do you think that I would challenge Arcadia with a sense of justice? Or do you think I am so overwhelmed with guilt that I feel responsible and challenge it? I'm an adult. Also a dirty adult. I can come up with any number of excuses for myself, and I can get away with this situation. In the first place, who would think that a war that happened a long time ago is still going on? Who would expect the old humans, unable to use magic and suffering from a poison called magic element, to survive on this planet? 
Moreover, did the old humans use magic and plant it in their genes? This is not a fantasy world of swords and magic. It's not my fault. It's that Otome game setting that's wrong. Anyway, I want to take my family with me. I'll convince them, so I'll go back to my parents' house. Einhorn is ready to sail. We are ready to leave at any time. Or wait until after the Empire's messengers have departed. It is time for Finn and his colleagues to leave for the Empire. I think it's fine to wait and seeing them off. The day of the departure of the Imperial delegation from the kingdom. On the airship that had come to pick up Mia, anchored in the harbor, the messenger raised his eyebrows. I didn't think that a man of Herring Dono's caliber would fail in an assassination mission. You seem to be very close to him while you were studying abroad perhaps you have betrayed the Empire? Apparently, the messenger had also obtained the information that he and Leon were close friends. He probably thought that if they were friends, assassination would be easy. But now that he has heard that he has failed, he is wary of Finn's betrayal. Brave, who was by Finn's side, was indignant and had bloodshot eyes. Are you doubting my partner? The core of the magic equipment enraged, the messenger shrinks back and his attitude becomes feeble. And no, nothing like that. I, I just didn't expect Herring would fail. I thought that even if you failed, you would at least get wounded. The messenger seems to be suspicious, partly because Finn is unharmed. After letting out a small sigh, Finn makes an excuse. The artificial intelligence on that guy's side didn't let down its guard. It's not easy to get close to him. Ha, huh, that's so the messenger, who was giving Finn a suspicious look, did not trust Finn's words. Then Leanheart, who was sitting in a chair, enters the conversation. I don't really care either way. We're going to destroy them anyway, so we can just fight them at that time. I'm just a little disappointed in Senpai. Leanheart adores Finn, but is disillusioned when he sees him fail in an assassination attempt. Whatever you say. Finn cut off the conversation and turned his gaze to the scenery outside from the window of the room. At the port of the Kingdom of Horfolt, those who had come to see him off were crowding the port. Both Leanheart and the messenger mocked them, saying that I pity them, not knowing that they will eventually be destroyed by us. Finn is looking at the harbor and Brave tells him that there is a sight of Leon there. Buddy, Leon's here. Really? When Finn touched Brave and shared his vision, he saw Leon coming to the port. Lux Ion, at his side, is showing a projection of Finn and the others for Leon. Leon stands there with an indescribable look on his face. Why did he bother to, don't come to see me off? I, I don't deserve to have you come here. He thought he who chose Mia and abandoned the kingdom didn't need a send-off. Brave says. Are you sure about this, buddy? If you overlook these guys, you're gonna regret it later for sure. Better to do it here. It's too late for that. They're already wary of us. Run away, Leon. I don't want to fight you. I'm here to see Finn and the others off, and I'm looking at the image that Luxion has enlarged. In the projected image in the air, Finn was watching us through the window. Sharing vision is a very useful feature of magic equipment. When I said it with laughing, Luxion, as usual, was against the magic equipment. That much I can do with a few tools. Would you like to mechanize your eyes and share visual information, master? Modified humans are intriguing, but I prefer the flesh and blood. Joking around with each other, I feel like I'm back to my daily routine. But Luxion immediately stopped joking. We can still attack them with my main body. What's the point of us running away? We're just giving them a reason to attack us. They will attack with or without cause. As it was, the Imperial airship was leaving the port and going away. As people around us begin to leave, Luxion says. Your big brother is visiting the royal capital. Aniki? They are visiting the Roseblade family mansion in the royal capital. Would you like to meet with them and persuade them before they return to their parents' home? I guess so. I'll do that I was not informed that he would be coming to royal capital, could something urgent have come up? The mansion of the Roseblade family in the royal capital. 
Although they are feudal nobles, if they become great nobles, they have a mansion in the royal capital. The reason for having a mansion in the royal capital is to get information quickly. In many other cases, it is convenient to stay in the royal capital, which is why the mansions of the great nobles are located there. After lunch, I visited the Roseblade family mansion in addition to Nick's, I saw Jenna and Finley. I never thought I would see my family together in the parlor. Nix, dressed in a well-tailored suit, greeted my sudden visit in a good mood. I was surprised at your sudden arrival. So, what do you want from me? No, I just heard Aniki was here. So you just came to see my face. But just in case, I have one more thing to report. Dorothea, it's all right. When Aniki calls out to the door, the maid opens the door. Entering the room from there was, Dorothea Faux Bartfault, with a big belly. Holding her stomach with both hands as if she were holding it carefully, she looks at me and smiles happily. I was planning on surprising you later, what a shame. When I saw Dorothea's sister-in-law, I flustered and asked her. Tea that belly? Foo-foo, of course it's a baby. Nix approached the smiling Dorothea's sister-in-law and gently embraced her. You didn't notice that Dorothea was pregnant, so we all talked about surprising you. Considering the size of her belly, does that mean she was pregnant when I was back at my parents' house at the end of summer vacation? Jenna and Finley were amazed at my attitude. You're really dense, I'm really surprised that you've made it all the way up to Grand Duke. Everyone else had figured it out long ago. As my big sister and little sister look at me in amazement, Dorothea's sister-in-law beckons me to come over. Puzzled, I approached her and she turned her stomach to me. Want to touch it? Eh? No, that's a bit I don't think it's very nice. I refuse in a hurry. Speaking from the sense of my previous life, I knew I should not carelessly touch the belly of a pregnant woman. But Dorothea's sister-in-law smiles, as if she is troubled. If you touched me without permission, I would cut off that arm. But I'll forgive you this time. Besides, you'll have a new family. There were some dangerous statements that I couldn't miss, but my chest tightened even more at the words new family. I fearfully extend my hand and it touches Dorothea's sister-in-law's stomach. I could feel the slight movement. Oh. When I was somewhat moved and surprised, both Nick's and Dorothea's sister-in-law giggled. Seeing us, Jenna and Finley start talking too. Ha. Huh. I want to conceive a child with Oscar Sama as soon as possible. Then I will be safe to be his wife. Jenine, your motives are too impure. Be careful you don't get dumped. Don't worry. Oscar Sama is crazy about me. This girl is annoying as I listen to their conversation and touch Dorothea's belly. I can't help but think. Which one is this kid? Is this kid just like Erica? Are they reverting to their ancestors in order to adapt to their new environment? When I'm thinking it's safe to take this kid into space too, Nick says. Actually, the Roseblade family invited me to the royal capital to celebrate with them. I was nervous about the airship trip, but I thought Dorothea would feel more at ease at her parents' house. Dorothea's sister-in-law gently bumps her head against Nick's shoulder. It was tough with all the relatives there. I could have rested better at the Bartfault house. I'm sorry. I didn't expect so many people to show up to celebrate. But I was relieved to see familiar faces. But then again, there are a lot of relatives in the Roseblade family. I was surprised too. We have quite a few close relatives alone. Speaking of which, some of Dad's friends are going to bring a gift for the upcoming celebration. I'm looking forward to meeting them, since they took care of me when I was little. The conversation is going on like nothing. With the Roseblade family, there would be a large number of relatives and connections. If I were to talk about escape here how many people would say they want me to take them? Jenna teases me as I release my hand from Dorothea's sister-in-law's belly. If a nephew or niece were born, Leon might be overprotective and spoil them. Finley also nodded. He's harsh on us sisters, but he certainly has that side of him. I bet he gets annoying by following them around. They both laugh at me. Normally, I would have said something back, but I was in no mood to do so, so I just smiled in a friendly way. Seeing me like that, Nix is worried. 
What's wrong? Are you feeling unwell? No, I'm fine. Nix asked me for a favor? I nodded and agreed, and Dorothea's sister-in-law explained it to me. It's a Roseblade family tradition. The baby will be taken on an airship. Put them in a fine airship and hope they will grow up to be worthy individuals. Can we use Einhorn for this tradition? In Einhorn? Nix asks me with his hands clasped in front of me. Please! If it's as famous as the Einhorn, there's no mistake about it. Besides, I want to show the sky to incoming child. Want to show the sky? Dorothea's sister-in-law smiles and talks about the dream that Nix had told her about. My dear always say that he wants to take a family vacation with his newborn child. Nix laughed, embarrassed. When I saw that sight it was inexplicably painful. Chapter 7 Choices After leaving the Roseblade residence, I sat on a bench in a park in the royal capital until nightfall. I couldn't get my thoughts straight. I don't think I'll ever be able to make Nix's dreams come true. Luxion answers my mutterings. It takes several months to be born. We cannot afford to wait that long. I guess we'll have to have Nix put up with that. For the sake of the unborn baby, it is a wise decision. I will add the Roseblade family officials to the list of escapees. A.A., please. Just, I lifted my head and saw that Luxion looked a little apologetic. It is impossible to accommodate all of them. If we put some of them in cryo-hibernation capsules, there is still room for more. Eh? I had forgotten something important. Until now, the number of people I would help had been centered on me, but I had forgotten to count the number of people involved, which would grow to derive from that number. It's obvious. I can't save everyone. I cover my face with my hands. How many people can we help? Accommodating too many will cause problems in the ship's environment. Frankly speaking, we should avoid rescuing to the limit. If we are going to have generations to come after we escape, we need to have some leeway. Even if we accommodate as much as we can get in, it is meaningless if problems arise afterwards. Considering the future, it is better not to have a large number of people. I can't help but think that I can't help as many as I thought I could. As I'm hanging my head, a family of three passes in front of me. The child is in the center, with parents on either side, holding hands. The young child looked up at the moon in the sky. It's the moon! Hey, mom, dad, I. I want. In the future, I want to go to the moon in an airship. The parents laughed at their young child's reckless dreams. Go to the moon might be difficult. But I think you could be a sailor. Really? The mother gently placed her hand on the child's head. Someday we'll have an airship that can go to the moon. Yes. Then I'll take Papa and Mama to the moon. At this moment, it seems that the young child's dream was decided to become a sailor and go to the moon. But it was the next moment. Kiho, Kiho, when the young child coughs, the father rushes to hold him. You pushed yourself a little too hard. Are you okay? Yes. It's too bad, I was feeling good today. I'm sure you'll feel better soon. Then let's go outside and play with Papa. I wonder if I'll ever get better. I'm sure you'll get better. The sight of the parents tearfully encouraging their frail young child in front of them lingered in my mind. I just watched as the three of them left. The way the young child looks reminds me of Erica. Will there be more children like Erica in the future? Will they suffer because they cannot adapt to the environment? I wondered. As I ponder, Luxion advises me. Master, the idea of saving everyone is arrogant. You have people you have to save. Do not forget that. A, right, I the only priority should be the people around me. Ange, Livia, and Noel and the others, family members and relatives should be prioritized. It is wrong not to help important people for the sake of someone whose name I don't even know. I clench my right hand with my left hand. As much as I can muster. As if to suppress. To suppress my own stupid thoughts. 
Like the family I just saw, I could still feel the life in my right hand that was in Dorothea's sister-in-law's belly. How many more children will be sacrificed in the future? While I was thinking about this, before I knew it, I had opened my hands. I understand it at the same time. Apparently, I'm a big idiot who can't choose smart choices. I've decided, Luxion. Yes, let's pick out the escapees right away, we're gonna fight. Master? I lifted my hips from the bench, stretched out and behaved as usual. Let's stop thinking and start acting. They to whom only bad ideas come might as well be asleep, I guess it's called. Things got troublesome, so I decided to fight Arcadia. As I have said many times, we cannot win. Then I'll do it alone. Don't joke about it. That's just suicide. Even so, no way I just sit back and watch it happen I'm not trying to speak about justice. If I keep silent and run away, I'm sure I'll regret it. I don't want to live my whole life worrying about it. Are you not going to cooperate with me, Luxion? Why are you so foolish, Master? Luxion was trembling because he didn't understand my decision. It seems to me that he has more variation in his emotional expression. I've been a big idiot since my previous life. I'm trying to live smart, too, though. Then, but a fool cannot become a wise man. My character didn't change just because I was reincarnated. I learned something in my second life. Perhaps he's given up, so Luxion confirms it to me. You're serious, aren't you? I feel sorry for you, you've been caught by a bad master. Sorry, Luxion. You are really the worst master. I'll take it as a compliment. Once we decide to fight, both Luxion and I have to act fast. I hate myself for getting used to all this. Beat down Arcadia, it's reckless. Haha, <laughs> I like that. I'm going to crush them, even if it means we beat each other down at the same time. Even if we end up beating each other down, Arcadia is the only one that must be sunk. Maybe that will be the meaning of life for me. And. Maybe I can make your wish come true, Luxion. My wish? I will fight the weapons left behind by the new humans. I will destroy them all, and I will protect the descendants of the old humans. Well, if I succeed, that is. When I gave him a wry smile, Luxion's response was weak. My wish my wishes, Chapter 8 Breaking the Engagement What the hell is he thinking, that idiot Aniki? After the holidays, it was some time after Finn and the others returned to the Empire. Marie was sulking in a classroom at the school. The reason is Leon. Kara, who has become accustomed to taking care of Marie by her side, worries about Leon as she puts away her textbooks and notebooks. He's been absent since the holidays. The principal says he hasn't heard the reason, so I wonder what's going on? The current principal of the school is Leon's tea master. He is an adult whom Leon rarely respects from the bottom of his heart. It seems that Leon has not told his master about the circumstances of his absence. Marie says as she closes her eyes and throws up. Even if he is absent without permission, he is a grand duke, so he is not blamed, and the teachers don't complain. It can't be helped. He's a hero who saved the country many times. If he's a hero, I hope he doesn't skip school without notice. The reason for Marie sulking is not because Leon is being absent. The reason for this is that, without Leon, it is impossible to check on Erica's condition, who has been collapsing more and more often due to illness. Luxion is on Aniki's side, and Creer is moving around and can't be caught. Erica is still suffering, why can't I stay by their side? She was frustrated by anxiety because her big brother, whom she could rely on, was not by her side. Kara, worried about Marie, awkwardly makes a suggestion. Ah no, why don't you just ask those three? I'd rather talk to Noelle alone, but I'm not sure if she knows what's going on. Sure, they might know what's going on, but I don't want to talk to them too much. So am I. Both Marie and Kara have been giving Ange and Livia a lot of trouble in their first year. Many of these troubles were also life-threatening, and she felt uncomfortable relying on them out of guilt. 
Noelle is the only person the two of them can rely on without hesitation, but there is one problem. The thing is that when Leon needs work-related advice, it is Ange that he relies on. In many cases, Noelle did not know the details of the situation. Marie folds her arms anxiously and looks up at the ceiling for a moment before making a decision. F for now, let's talk to Noelle. That's the only way. How could this happen? Marie couldn't stop breaking out in a cold sweat. Marie is summoned immediately after school to Ange's room in the girls' dormitory. Along with Ange, the owner of the room, there are also figures of Livia and Noel. Behind Marie, who was sitting in a chair, Kara stood back like an attendant and kept herself as background. Marie sends a glance to Noel. W. Why did you call me? I just wanted to talk to Noel. The person who I took her fiancé from and the person who I took her saint position from has been glaring at me. Under the stern glances of Ange and Livia, Marie asked Noel for a reason. Noel does not seem to notice Marie's impatience, and while looking down, she seriously tells the reason for summoning her. It's about Leon's absence, isn't it? We don't know the details either. Luxion is not here, and Creer is not leaving Lickhorn either. I thought I hadn't seen her at the school lately, so she's been in Lickhorn all this time. Yes. So I thought that maybe Marie Chan would know something about it. The reason Marie was called was that she might know something about the situation that Ange and others did not know. No, I asked because I didn't know. Marie, frightened by Ange's piercing gaze, breaks out in a cold sweat and her cheeks are drawn back. I haven't been told anything, so I thought Noel and the others knew. Noel nods slightly. I know. But you two are usually very close, right? So I thought this would be a good time to ask you about your relationship. Marie understands why Ange and Livia are looking at her so sternly. These guys are going to question me right here. Aniki, you idiot. At least explain to them what's going on before you're absent. Ange quietly asks Marie, who curses Leon in her mind. He went off with Lux Ion without telling U.S. Have you heard anything? There is a history of a causal relationship between Marie and Ange. It was Marie who took Julius, Ange's former fiancé. They have already reached a reconciliation, but that does not mean the relationship has improved. It's just that because of Leon, they get a lot of opportunities to meet each other. Marie replies with an awkward smile plastered on her face. I, I haven't heard anything. But hasn't it ever occurred before that he just goes off without saying a word? I'm being suspected so badly. I don't know where Aniki is. This definitely makes them suspicious of our relationship. Marie cried in her heart when she was suspected because of Leon. But a refusal won't clear Ange and Livia's suspicions. This time, Livia asked the question, but her expression was cold despite her gentle tone. Leon San, even though he didn't tell us the circumstances, he talked to us when he went out. But that didn't happen this time. Then Noel, who has less care about the atmosphere of the place, perhaps because she is worried about Leon, presses up to Marie. Marie Chan, you were talking to Leon a while back, weren't you? Didn't he say something to you at that time? Both Ange and Livia's eyebrows twitched at Noel's words that Leon had a secret meeting with Marie before he left. Like I said, I didn't hear anything. We were just talking about Erica's situation, why do they have to suspect me? When Marie denies it, Ange seems to have reached the limit of her patience. I've always wondered, what is the relationship between you and Leon? Leon is always saying that it's an inseparable relationship, but I just can't accept it. Livia also voices the question of what has been happening so far. He gave you a lot of allowance, too. Moreover, just as Livia is about to say something, Noelle looks toward the window and raises her voice. Leon is back. Looking out the window, Einhorn could be seen in the distance. Its unique appearance, with large horns extending forward on the bow, made it stand out even from a distance. Marie breathes a sigh of relief. You're late, Baka Aniki. When Livia and the others board the Lickhorn, they are ushered into the reception room by Creer. The three people sitting on the sofa waiting for Leon and not even sipping the drinks prepared by the robots. Ange is silently annoyed, and Noel looks worried. 
As for Livia, only Marie San was guided to another place. She was concerned that Marie was the only one who was taken to a separate room, even though she had boarded together. This is why Ange seems dissatisfied. She said she was going to visit Princess Erica, but that was unnatural to begin with. What is the connection between those two? Again, isn't he only telling Marie about the situation? That was hard for the three of them. Noelle clasped her index fingers together and pursed her lips. It's cunning to treat only Marie Chan specially, isn't it? In the first place, what is the relationship between the two of them? I've only known her since we met at Arzal, but it's kind of strange. Ange lets out a small sigh. I thought he'd come to rely on me. She thought she had improved their relationship some time ago, so this must be extraordinarily upsetting to her. It was the same for Livia. Before, Marie San had called Leon San Aniki. But later, when the subject came up, there was a big fuss at Leon San's parents' house but in the end, there was never any connection. There was the case of Leon's father, Barkus, who was suspected of cheating. That is, Marie is Leon's little sister in other words, could it be the illegitimate child of Barkus? That's what she thought. He was suspected of having an affair with Viscount Lafan's wife, but eventually settled that it was not possible. In that case, it remains unclear why Marie called Leon Aniki. At the time, things must have been very confusing, so maybe it wasn't true? But seeing Leon San's behavior, I can't help but wonder, none of the three thought that Leon saw Marie as someone of the opposite sex. The main reason, as well as his usual attitude, is that she is very out of Leon's preferences. And his attitude towards Marie is like a family. It was also close to what one would direct at a younger brother or sister. That is also the reason why when Marie approaches Leon, Ange is furious but does not force her to pull away. Why does Leon San treat Marie San so special? He said he hated her when we were first years. Livia recalled the days she had spent at the school, but when the door opened and Leon entered, she involuntarily raised her hips. Leon San. Eh? It was the first time in a long time that she had seen Leon, and he had more raw wounds. And he gives the impression of being somewhat rougher. It feels strange for Leon to behave as usual. Well, I'm sorry, were you all three doing well? Actually, I got into a little bit of trouble, and it's been hard to deal with it Noel was perplexed by Leon, who answered with lazy laughter and vague reasons for his unexcused absence. Like Livia, she must have sensed a change in Leon's atmosphere. Only Ange runs up to Leon and raises her right hand and then brings it down without doing anything. She tried to slap him, but she stopped just before she did. You idiot. What have you been doing all this time? I said, I got into a little bit of trouble that's what I'm asking you to tell us. Why are you hiding it? If you're in trouble, let us help you. Your problems are our problems. When Ange asked him to explain the reason and let them help him, Leon scratching his head and let out a deep sigh. Leon's expression changed. Livia was momentarily terrified by the cold gaze that had never been directed at them before. Pissed off? Did he hate them? More than that, she was surprised that Leon would make a face like this. Leon says with a deeply disgusted attitude. Everything's too troublesome now. No, let's break off the engagement with the three of you right here and now. When Leon says something nonchalantly, Livia reaches out her hand. Leon San? Why you're lying, aren't you? Because hearing the words she did not want to hear, Livia turned pale and Ange was shaking. Why now? You've told me. You want me. Even if you have to fight with the Redgrave family and yet from Livia's position she cannot see it, but surely she is crying. Hearing Ange's tearful voice, Noel glares at Leon. Are you seriously saying that? Leon seemed uninterested and turned his back on them and walked away. Without turning around, Leon tells the three of them. Of course I'm serious. Then get the hell off my ship. We will never see each other again. When the door closes, Ange crumples to her feet and sits down on the spot. Livia ran up to Ange, who was hugging herself, and hugged her. Ange! I, I, I got dumped again because, for Leon's sake Livia's heart aches at the sight of the normally strong-willed Ange crying like a child. 
At the same time, she realized she was crying, too. Why, Leon San? Isn't this terrible? The three of them could only cry or be stunned when Leon broke off the engagement without giving a reason. After meeting with the three of them, I came to Creer's laboratory. On a large table is a collection of the loot items I brought with me. There are various types of antique-like tools and near-future weapons. All of these items were brought back from taking up the challenge of the dungeon. These are some of the most valuable items you can get in that Otome game. All of these items can be secured if you have played the first game. Creer is looking at those items. I've heard you've been around the eastern part of the kingdom, but you've secured quite a bit. I didn't recover all of it, though. My memory is fading, too, and there are a lot of holes in my knowledge of the game that I wrote down right after my reincarnation. I regret that I should have written it down in more detail. Many items of low value that were not useful in the game were not noted in the notebook with their hiding places, as there would be no need to bother remembering them. The item I wanted the most at the moment was among them. I regret that I was not thorough enough. Creer has expressed interest in a metal cane. It is a wand that looks like something a magician would use, and it is decorated with several large jewels, perhaps for decoration. This gemstone is filled with magic elements. It amplifies the owner's magic power. Can it be used? We'll need to break it down for optimization. And the material of the cane I mean, it doesn't even have to be a cane. But Master doesn't use magic very often, right? Admittedly, I'm not good at magic. However, depending on the situation, it may be used. The more options, the better. Make it ready to disassemble and usable right away. What about the loss of cultural value? It is a valuable item obtained from the ruins, but for me now it is just a tool. Sorry, but I couldn't afford to be concerned about cultural values in the current situation. I don't mind. Do it. Okay. In a lighthearted tone of voice, Creer accepts the task and has the work robots clean up the items on the table. Creer turned her one blue eye on me. More importantly, Master, you've gained a lot of muscle mass in the few days I haven't seen you. I wouldn't recommend excessive drug use. If that's all it takes to increase our odds of winning, I don't see the problem. When I said that without changing my expression, Creer seemed a little puzzled. Since it seems I'm not going to listen, so she warns Luxion. Master's physical condition management is under the jurisdiction of Luxion, right? I cannot refuse if it is said to be in order. So they end their conversation and I talk about our plans for the future. After replenishment and maintenance, we will head south tomorrow. There are still items to be collected. There was no time to lose so I wanted to leave right away. Creer seems to be worried about me. It's bad for your body if you don't rest a little. I want to do everything I can. There won't be much time left before the Empire declares war. Actually, I'd like to settle the battle right away, but as it is, the odds of winning are too low. Whether it's retrieving items or training my body, it's all for the sake of winning to destroy Arcadia. Then there's another thing that is essential to victory. Have you been able to contact your folks? When I asked Creer, she shook her single blue eye from side to side. Negative. They were all aiming for Arcadia. If we get too close to Arcadia, the communication will go down. If we are close to each other, we'll be able to keep in touch, though. If we get too close, Arcadia will detect us and attack us. Keep on calling them. Tell them that the descendants of the old humans are still alive, and your friends will gather in the kingdom. If Brave's story is true, then weapons powered by artificial intelligence should have woken up. If we can get those guys on board, we have a chance. I want to increase my win rate until the very limit. For that I would do anything. Lux Ion, who had been silent, asks me about what happened before. Apparently, he is not happy about the fact that I broke off the engagement. Master, why did you break off your engagement with Angelica and the others? It was not necessary to go that far. Because it was too much trouble. Crossing my arms, I take my gaze away from Luxion and look at the empty tabletop. The usual master would deceive them. 
until now, you have done so. And yet, you intentionally hurt Angelica and the others. I raise my eyebrows and Creer interrupts the conversation. Master is the worst. You acted with such an attitude and hoped those three would just break up with you obediently? Master has a really troublesome personality. Creer is stunned, but Luxion is angry. It's not just a breakup story. In Master's case, the premise is the problem. Master, do you have any intention of returning alive? To Luxion's question, I didn't respond. However, it has become a hassle to be here, so I open my mouth. Marie came too, didn't she? She's probably in Erica's room. I'm going to check on her. As I leave the laboratory, I hear Creer's voice behind me. He ran away. Chapter 9 Marie's Hero Okasan, is it true that Ajisan is absent from school without permission? Erica didn't know it. In Erica's private medical room, which had been prepared in Licorn, Marie and Erica were talking. The topic of the conversation was about Leon, who has been absent from school lately. Marie tells Erica about the situation in a disgruntled manner. You're in Licorn and you didn't know it. I only found out about it through Hahayui's letter. To be honest, I'm not sure if Hahayui's letter is the best way to get updates on your Ajisan's current circumstances. Apparently, Mylene is concerned about the matter of Leon's absence without notice. The problem is that she wrote that in her letter to Erica's status report. Marie can't help but be annoyed. Why is Aniki laying his hands on the queen? In the first place, that queen seems to have a field of flowers in her brain to tell Erica about such a situation. TLN, it means a person whose thinking is so shallow that one wonders if there is a flower garden spreading inside his or her brain. Marie was angered by the way Erica was informed of Leon's love affairs. From Marie's point of view, Erica looks exhausted and even keeping her upper body upright looks painful. Marie also noticed that Erica's condition was worsening and she could not forgive Leon for making her worry about Erica in such a state. After the holidays, he started absent and finally came back today. And since he didn't say anything to anyone, the three of them suspected that I knew something about what was going on. Marie shudders as she recalls now that Ange and Livia's stares were terrifying. Erica smiled wryly at the sight of Marie, but her expression soon clouded. Maybe it's my fault. Why? Before he took a break, Aji-san came to visit me. At that time, he looked like he was in pain, but he was forcing himself to smile. Aniki came here? That can't be, the illness hearing Erica's story, Marie assumes the worst. That is, if there is no improvement in the condition, will Erica die? Wasn't the reason why Leon looked so pained because he realized he couldn't help Erica? The sudden absence of him might have been because he was looking for a way to find a way to help. Just as the anxiety is growing, the door opens and the topic of conversation, Leon, enters the room. Apparently, he had heard them talking. If it's about Erica's illness you don't have to worry about. Aniki. When she turned and looked at Leon, he had a fake smile on his face. The forced smile on his face made Marie couldn't shake the bad feeling. Erica also seems to have noticed something unusual about Leon. Aji-san, did something happen? Have you lost some weight? When Erica is worried about him, Leon deliberately shows his good health. He was bulging his biceps and showing it off. I'm doing fine on my end. I just gained some muscle mass while losing a little body fat. Well, the drugs made by Luxion are amazing. I lost a few percent of my body fat in just a few days. Plus, I gained muscle mass. Seeing Leon bragging, a usual Marie would have said, give me some of that. But today, she couldn't make the joke. Erica also seems to have noticed Leon's lies and is suspicious of him. You're getting more wounds. Are you being reckless? Could it be because of what I said before? Leon scratched his head and looked apologetic, as if he thought he would be exposed if he continued to make excuses. I guess I can't fool you guys after all, he was lying, so Marie is indignant. Of course it's obvious. What have you been doing absent from school too? You better tell the truth. Marie and Erica. 
As the two stared at him, Leon let out a small sigh and put his right hand behind his waist. Is he going to take something out? As she thinks that, Leon pulls out a pistol. Eh? At the moment Marie's eyes widened in surprise, Leon pulled the trigger without hesitation. The muzzle of the pistol, which made a popping sound, was aimed at Erica. She quickly turns around and sees something sticking into Erica. Ajiase Erica was also surprised, but soon closed her eyes and her body collapsed straight down and lay on the bed. Marie immediately pressed Leon. What are you doing? What are you doing to Erica? To Marie's bewilderment, Leon exhales a sigh and begins to tell her about the situation. It's for Erica's sake. How could it be? To the distraught Marie, Lux Ion, who had been silent until now, speaks in an electronic voice. It's a tranquilizer gun. Erica's just asleep. When she turns and looks at Erica, Marie is relieved to see that she is sleeping. I'm glad. I mean, what were you thinking, using a tranquilizer gun on Erica? Marie is still angry, but Leon continues to talk to her by sitting in a nearby chair. You've noticed, right? Erica's disease is still not cured. On. Actually, I would have put her in cold sleep much sooner. It was Erica who refused to do that, saying she wanted memories with you. Erica did? Cryonic hibernation a method of preserving the physical body by freezing the body. But if it is done, one cannot do anything during that time. Marie was shocked to hear that Erica had refused to cold sleep, prioritizing time with her. Why didn't you tell me? It was Erica's will. But I decided to put her to sleep because she was already at her limit. Besides I couldn't have Erica stay awake any longer. Eh? From there, Leon hilariously explains the current situation. Actually, we're going to war with the Empire. Ha. Huh. Why? I dunno. I mean, there are others like Luxion on the other side. We're going to destroy the kingdom. It's like they're saying. You uh, that's really annoying. Calling it annoying, Marie turned her attention to Luxion. But Luxion turns a single eye away from Marie. So, are you okay? I mean, the Empire just got Mia Chan and her friends back. Leon shrugs and says. Of course, I'm going to do something about it. Well, anyway I don't want to burden Erica any more than she already is. It is time for her to go to sleep. When it's all over, I'll concentrate on finding the cure. Marie heard Leon's explanation and was convinced that this was what he had been hiding from her. Indeed, this is something he can't talk to Erica about. If he told Erica now, her illness could worsen from the heartache. If that's so, you should have explained it to me earlier. I was really worried. My bad. Marie confirms a few things with Leon. Erica's illness can be cured, right? Of course. And the war well, Mia Chan and the others, they're okay, right? Aniki is friends with Finn, so you're not going to kill him, are you? Obviously. Leon says it's not a problem. Then everything will be okay Marie believes Leon's words. It's been that way since her previous life. I see. If Aniki says so, it must be true. Aniki says it's okay, so it's definitely okay. Because he's my big brother. Marie trusted the words of her older brother, whom she could rely on at the critical moment. A.A. When Marie gives a big smile out of relief, Leon's expression clouds over for a moment. When Marie tilts her head, Lux Ion interrupts the conversation somewhat forcefully. Master, it's time to go. Erica will be carried by Lickhorn's work robots later, so let's move on now. I guess so. I'd better get going. I've been busy with things. Yes. Good luck with that, Aniki. Erica's life depends on you. Getting up, Leon says to Marie with a wry smile. It's heavy. Well, I'll figure something out. Leon shows his back as he leaves the room. Marie felt that his back was dependable. She doesn't say it out loud but to Marie, Leon was a dependable hero from her previous life. 
he helped her no matter what and solved any problem she had. After he was gone, she was in a lot of trouble, but now it's different. If Leon is there, he can do something. She had such high expectations. Air? Aniki, he is not looking so well today. However, she felt that Leon's back seemed a little smaller today. I go out into the hallway, and Luxion starts to scold me. You've made a promise without due consideration too much. It doesn't matter, does it? If we win, the concentration of magic elements won't get any thicker. As long as Creer is still around, she and Sapling or rather, young Trichon will take care of the magical element problem. Even if I don't solve the problem myself, I can save Erica by defeating Arcadia. Anyway Erica is a smart girl. Not only did she see through my secrets, but she was beginning to realize that she was the cause of it. I should have put her to sleep earlier. Apparently, Luxion questioned my attitude toward Marie and the others. Master, I have a question. What is it? Why didn't you just push Marie away like you did to Angelica and the others? He still blames me for my attitude toward Ange and others. I let out a small sigh and then tell him. Marie is thick-skinned. She can survive without me, and now she has five idiots, her merry band of friends. Angelica and the others only have master, though. They were quite shocked. I'm worried about their future. That's why. Just forget about me, move on, and find a nice guy. Aren't you being too cold towards your three fiancés? At least show a little of the kindness you showed to Marie and the others, I'm not kind. I tried to forcefully end this conversation, but today Luxion was persistent. At least let's clear up the misunderstanding. It is the truth that Master loves those three. I burst out laughing because it was funny. I love them? When you have three fiancés, that's not love. Well, actually, I was secretly happy to have a harem. But it became a hassle. I understood that when I started dating them. Women are a pain in the ass in so many ways. After the second life, I've become a lot wiser. That's a lie. It's true. Master is a liar. You can't even tell me your true feelings. Luxion, who doesn't trust my words, stares at me silently. Unable to bear it any longer, I spill my true feelings. It's true that I want them to forget about me. I never should have gotten involved with those three in the first place. Do I deserve to be loved by those three, just because I successfully made my way around with my knowledge of that Otome game? It has always been stuck in the back of my mind and I have tried not to look at it. But I can understand it now. Arcadia, an opponent who cannot be beaten, appears, and I, who try to run away, cannot be worthy of those three. In the end, I was out of place. Out of place? What are you talking about, master? I'm just saying I'm not the right person for those three. There must be someone more suitable. This is what I really think, without lying. No matter how far we go in our relationship, I'm guilty when I can't tell them the truth about me having a previous life. I turn my gaze to Luxion. I count on you to watch out for those three. And be sure to tell Marie well. If they are shocked at being deceived by a bad man, then someone should give them a follow-up. Master should tell them the truth. No, I don't want those three to get involved. Please, Luxion. I don't think I'll ever get another chance to talk to Ange and the others. I'll see how it goes with Creer. Do that. One big problem solved. As we walk, I recall my conversation with Marie. Anyway, that idiot has always relied on me only when it's convenient. I guess I looked a little happy. Luxion looks dissatisfied. You take Marie's favors without due consideration and are cold to Angelica and the others. Creer is right, you really are a troublesome master. Say what you want. Well, Marie asked me to do it, so let's do my best oh, right. I didn't tell Marie about the broken engagement, did I? Luxion, tell Creer to fool her. Understood. I abandoned my fiancés for their future. My little sister also asked me to help her with my niece's life. 
There are too many things I want to protect, so I'm really troubled. Lux Ion, who was following Leon as he walked, was developing strange feelings for Marie. Marie's words are pushing Master over the edge, Leon is motivated by the reason that Marie, his little sister from a previous life, asked him to do it. That motivation was the problem. Leon does not include his own life as a condition for victory. In other words, he thinks that even if he loses his life, as long as he wins, it is enough. Fighting Arcadia itself is reckless. With that in mind, it is only natural that Leon would risk his life. But now Leon was willing to give up his life. He is relying too much on drugs in his haste to train his body. At this rate, even if he survives, there is a possibility that he will suffer from aftereffects later in life. No, it will shorten his lifespan to begin with. The drugs that Leon uses, while effective, are also deleterious. Naturally, it also takes a toll on his body. Even if they were to stay by their side and treat him, it would certainly cut down on Leon's life. The evidence is that he has not thought about the future at all. How can he so easily put his life on the line? We cannot add more burdens to master. Some of the items to be recovered must be removed from the list. Considering the toll on Leon's body, Luxion decides to remove some items especially drugs from the list. Even if it was against Leon's orders. Chapter 10 For My Big Brother As Marie gets off Lickhorn, Kara, who was waiting for her at the port, comes running up to her. Marie Sama, what happened inside? Marie tilted her head at Kara, who was flustered. Inside? I'm just visiting the princess. Well, I've heard a lot of complicated stories, but that's about it. There is no way she could say at this moment that a war with the Empire is coming. Besides, Leon said it would be fine. This time, too, Marie was not impatient because she was sure that Leon would solve the problem. Kara is puzzled by Marie's reaction. But the three who came down first were acting strange. All three of them were crying, and Angelica Sama couldn't even stand up. What happened to them? Marie's eyes widened in surprise when she heard that Ange and the others were crying. However, Kara was also unable to ask for more details about the situation. I tried to talk to them, but they didn't give me any answers. So I thought maybe Marie Sama would know something. Sorry. I didn't hear anything. Did something happen between them and Leon? The only cause that comes to mind is Leon. But she didn't think Leon would say anything terrible to those three. I'll go inside again and talk to him. Kara, come with me. Yes. She took Kara and boarded Lickhorn from the ramp, but the door to enter the ship was tightly closed. When she touches the doorknob, it does not move and the door is locked. Hey, open it! I know you're listening anyway. Luxion, or Creer, should be watching what is going on outside. Believing that, she calls out, and Creer's electronic voice responds. However, she did not appear. Unfortunately, we're too busy to let you in. Go home today, Creer, call my big brother. No. Wah. Creer has been friendly to Marie so far. But today, she coldly pushed her away. Master is busy. He can't waste even a few minutes now. But. Even if it's Marie Chan, I won't allow you to disturb Master. Creer? In the end, Marie had no choice but to leave. When Marie returned to the school, it was already night. Brad is standing in front of the school gate, probably waiting for her to return. When he saw Marie, he approached her, but he was as confused as Kara. This is bad, Marie. Those three I know. But I don't know anything about it. I've tried to check with Leon, but he's holed up in Lickhorn and won't come out. After she says all that, Brad puts his hand to his chin and ponders. If they won't let Marie in, I don't see how we can go to them. Luxion and Creer are especially strict on us. When Leon comes back, I'm going to question him. Unable to contain her anger, Marie walks into the grounds of the school with big steps. Kara and Brad chased after Marie. Kara looks worried. 
Leon San and the others have been having some conflicts in the past, but something like this is the first time, isn't it? This is the first time I've seen that Angelica Sama so depressed. Brad nods and briefly describes the three of them when they return to the school. Thanks to that, the students are in an uproar. The three main people involved are holed up, so I don't even know the details. I don't know what Leon is doing at a time like this. You can't make a woman sad, right? Brad may also believe that Leon is the cause. However, because of the lack of details, he stops at blaming how he treated the woman. Marie looks at Brad and he looks very worried. Are you worried about those three? Brad smiles wryly. It sounds strange to say this in front of Marie, but I've known Angelica for a long time. And I'm no stranger to Olivia and Noel either. Of course I'm concerned about them, but I'm most worried about Leon. Kara was surprised to hear that Brad was worried about the man. Why Leon San? Well, it's not a short relationship. While Brad is fumbling for an answer, Marie and her friends arrive at the girls' dormitory. Brad, being a male, is not allowed inside, so that's as far as he goes. Please look after the three of them. I'll let the others know. Inside the Lickhorn When Luxion appeared in the laboratory, Creer spoke to him. Did Master sleep? He used sleeping pills to help him fall asleep. This would keep him from waking up for six hours. Even though I prescribed a powerful one, yet only six hours of sleep. The current master is abnormal. He cannot make normal decisions. If you want to complain, send me a message. Or rather, you're the one who's crazy. It's an order from master. Defeat Arcadia. Both Luxion and Creer are moving in response to that order. Luxion, with his doubts, is more of a problem from Creer's point of view. But still, Master is so haphazard. He breaks off the engagement at this point in time, and Marie is suspicious of him. Maybe he doesn't even think about what happens next. Leon fights to protect the descendants of the old humans, but there was something missing. His own life. He assumes that the battle will be won and he does not assume that he will survive. That's what led to the messy response this time. After Luxion was silent for a while. Creer, we were ordered by Master to give the girls a follow-up. He did. I'll help them recover from the shock. I have a suggestion. Please cooperate. Even Creer, who at first was reluctant to accept Luxion's suggestion eventually decided to help. In Anja's room in the girls' dormitory, Noelle and Livia were talking. As Noelle looks at Ange, who is tired of crying and has fallen asleep in bed, she talks about today. It was absolutely weird. There is no way Leon would say something like that. When Noelle says that Leon was acting strangely, Livia's reaction is weak. Is that so? But maybe we were so persistent that he got tired of us. Livia, who has lost confidence, says nothing but that it is her fault. Noelle scratches her head. Leon was strange today. There must be something going on. Olivia should be more confident too. Noelle is trying to convince Livia, but her eyes were red and swollen. It is evidence that she had been crying earlier until just now. Livia begins to talk about her memories little by little. It was Leon San who gave me confidence. Is that so? Livia nods slightly. When I first entered this school, I didn't know anything and it was very difficult. It seemed like it was wrong for me, a commoner, to attend a school for nobles. I put him through a lot of trouble. But he forgave me at that time but this time because I was selfish. Noelle rubs Livia's back when she starts crying again. Normally she's more headstrong, but today she's really hmm? Livia has become stronger recently, but she must have been quite shocked to be rejected by Leon. She lost her self-confidence and blamed herself. Noelle took her gaze off Livia and looked out the window. She saw two lights, one red and one blue, going somewhere. Livia, go wake Angelica. Eh? But she just finally calmed down. Just do it! When Noelle says so to Livia, she makes sure where the lights are heading. I'm pretty sure that's Luxion and Creer. 
What are they doing here at this hour? As Marie was about to visit Angelica's room, Noel bursts out of the door with a bang. Noel, I need to talk. Marie was in a hurry to call her off, but Noel apparently had no leeway. Sorry, I'm in a hurry, so I'll see you later. Noel looks fine as she runs off, and Marie lets out a small sigh. She looks fine, doesn't she? Kara, who was by her side, hurriedly explains that she did not lie. When I saw her at the port, she was really depressed. Rest assured I don't doubt you. Brad also said they were depressed, too. Just out of curiosity, Marie chased after Noel. For now, the reason is that she wants to hear from Noel about what's going on, if possible. Anyway, let's go after her. Why yes. The two chase after Noel. With eyes still swollen from crying, Ange was let out of the room by Livia. Ange, over here. I get it, so don't pull me. Livia took her to a warehouse in the girls' dormitory. Since it is not usually used, the staff who manages the dormitory locks it closed. But only today it was not locked. It is a sliding door, but it is slightly open and you can see the inside from there. In addition to Noel, Marie and Kara were also present in the surrounding. Noel puts her index finger to her lips and makes the be quiet gesture. When Ange silently checked the situation inside, he heard some kind of conversation. It's Luxion and Creer. Then, please give the three of them a follow up, Creer. Okay. I'll gently comfort the three of them in their heartbreak. By the way, Master is quite cruel, isn't he? He dumped his fiancés so easily. At Creer's words of dumping, Ange clasped her hand to her chest. The reality that Leon has dumped her makes my heart ache. It's not his true intention. Considering the current situation, it can't be helped. For this one time, Master is that desperate. Master is not very good at setting things up and getting things done. If I were to put it in human terms, I'd say he's troublesome, right? I hate it when people are not honest, when Luxion says, it's not Leon's true intention, Ange can't resist and jumps out. What does that mean? Behind Ange who threw the door open and walked inside, Livia and the others were panicking. After being found by Luxion and the others, they express a mixture of apology and embarrassment. Luxion is a bit taken aback by the fact that Ange has intruded so brazenly. I'll overlook the eavesdropping to the extent that you eavesdrop on our conversation, but to get into the conversation, I don't know what you're thinking? You guys were talking here on purpose, weren't you? In the first place, this place is usually locked. It's unnatural that the lock is open only today. Anja's reasoning is watered down by Creer. Unfortunately, this is the place where girls bring boys to meet them. I have a duplicate key hidden in a locker nearby. That's why we were talking in a place like this could it be you didn't know? Hearing that it was a place for boys and girls to meet, the usual Ange might have blushed. But she couldn't afford to worry about it now. You intended for U.S. to hear it, didn't you? You and your master are all the same in making things troublesome. More importantly, tell us in detail. What is the problem Leon is having? As she looked at Luxion, Ange didn't miss the way his red eyes turned to Marie for a moment. Again, she thought. Do these guys also think Marie is special? What's the reason? Why not me? She suppresses her jealousy and anger toward Marie and tries to approach Luxion. Before approaching, Luxion says. I decided it was impossible to give you a follow-up without letting you know the circumstances. Creer expresses her sarcasm to Luxion, who seems to have given up. You're the one who wanted this to happen. You even dragged me into it. If Master gets angry, I'll tell him you planned the whole thing. As you please. Now then, let me explain the details. You guys have an obligation to listen for what Master intends to accomplish at the risk of his own life. His last words were a bit stronger in tone, but Marie was at the other end of his gaze. What? Is Luxion mad? At Marie? Ange was a little curious, but listened to what Luxion had to say. When Luxion's explanation is over. Only Marie stood with a blank expression. That's a lie. 
Because Aniki said it would be fine, Luxion explained how dangerous war with the Empire is. Marie was speechless at the fact that Leon had not told her. Ange and the others, whose engagements were broken off, now have pale faces. While relieved to know Leon's true intentions, at the same time, they seem to be struggling with a problem that is too big to face. Ange is organizing the information that Luxion and others have informed her. It's new humans, it's old humans, the scale is too big. It's surprising that the ancient war is still going on, but where's the need for Leon to take it over? Livia has a thoughtful look on her face. But if you throw everything away and run away if they wait like this, the descendants of the old humans will perish. Before that, there is a high possibility that Arcadia will attack. Noelle seemed to want to be angry with Leon, but at the same time she seemed to have complicated feelings about understanding his feelings. You just proceed with everything on your own, and take on the burden alone. As long as we're happy, that's all that matters? The way he decides everything as he pleases, I really don't like it. After the misunderstanding is cleared up, Luxion suggests that Ange and the others cooperate. Master is willing to lose his life in the battle. No, he has already calculated the possibility of losing his life. Ange closes her eyes. That big idiot. So I want you to cooperate. Livia was surprised by Luxion's suggestion. Cooperate? Is that Leon San's idea? No, this is my wish. If Master continues to fight alone, he will not have a high chance of winning. But if he could get cooperation, it would be different. Noelle takes one look at the crest of the sacred tree on the back of her right hand, then looks at Luxion. What are we supposed to do? We want the country on our side. Country! When Noelle is surprised, Ange takes over the conversation. Easy for you to say, but even if the Empire is the enemy, it's Arcadia, I don't think you can match that Arcadia. It is an opponent you guys cannot win against, is it? Although they were willing to fight the Empire's forces, Ange was aware that they were powerless against Arcadia, which was more powerful than Luxion. If we are surrounded by the Empire's army, it will hinder our decisive battle with Arcadia. We need your support. So you want us to attract the Empire's army. But the kingdom is exhausted from war after war. I don't think a single country can stand a chance against the Empire. The kingdom of Horfold alone is weak enough to attract the Empire. Then, Creer looks at Noel. It would be nice if the Alzer Republic also cooperated. Noel shakes her head when she hears it. It's impossible. Because it hasn't even been a year since they were tattered by the war. We captured the flying ships left behind by Ideal, didn't we? Those ships are as good as a couple of the lesser flying battleships. That reminds me, I think you mentioned something like that while the conversation was being concluded, Marie was left alone. Kara at her side is pale. Marie-sama, it's getting kind of outrageous. What is going to happen to us? All right. Marie was barely able to reply, but when Ange and the others finished their conversation, they went outside. As Luxion and Creer also try to leave, Marie calls out to them. Wait! Let me help. There are things I can do too, Marie should do nothing. That's the best solution. Eh? As Luxion says so and leaves the room, Creer approaches Marie. I'm sorry. Now that guy is kind of weird. But you shouldn't do anything, Marie Chan. Why? I can work for Anilion too. When Marie Chan is around, Master gets reckless. Even today, Master pushed himself too hard. Ha! Huh. What did I do? It's not your fault, Marie Chan. But you know, if Master expects any more than this, he is going to be in danger. Master has reached his limit. When she is told that Leon is at his limit, the image of the absolute hero in Marie's mind crumbles. What's the limit? Leon is always dash, he's always reckless. This time it's especially awful. He is literally cutting his life. And it was Marie and the others who gave him that push. And others, she had an idea when she mentioned it. Because Leon was concerned about Marie and Erica, parent and child relationship. 
I don't know anything about it if he couldn't, he could have just told me he couldn't, right? It's master's fault. So there's no need for you to worry about it, Marisama. Pull yourself together. Marie stands up slowly, supported by Kara. And. Kara, we're going to move too. Eh? But they told us not to do anything. I can't let it end like this. I haven't been able to repay him for anything yet. So now I have to do what I can. If she continues to do nothing, she will eventually regret it. Motivated by such a hunch, Marie begins to take action. I'm pretty sure there was that thing in the game knowledge that I wrote down when I was reincarnated into this world. I'm sure that can help Aniki. Chapter 11 for you. The airship carrying Mia was approaching Empire territory. Mia, who has been given a luxurious room, looks out the window restlessly. Maids are stationed in the room and take care of Mia. I've only seen Naitsama a few times since I got on the airship. I've told these people that you can wait outside, too, but they won't leave. The treatment was so different from before that it was suffocating for Mia. One of the maids approaches and places a drink on a nearby table. The drink in the lidded cup with the drinking cup was fresh fruit juice. The cup was made on the assumption that it would spill, since no one knows when the inside of an airship will shake. When Nia was about to take it and take a sip. Miliaris Sama. Get down, please. One of the maids cries out and bends down to cover Mia's body. She let go of the cup and dropped it on the floor, and Mia wondered what was going on. Eh? What she saw outside the window was a flying battleship covered in metal. It has a shape no one has ever seen before, but what caught her attention was the rust on the armor. And it looks like a remnant that has been submerged at the bottom of the sea for many years. The maids were panicked. Machines! What are the soldiers doing? Calm down! He's on this ship! The maids, in a commotion, try to evacuate Mia. But along the way, a change occurred. A huge flying battleship is launching an attack on something. Several rays of light were emitted in one direction. But such a flying battleship was pierced by a reddish-black light. When the explosion occurs as it does, the inside of the ship shakes violently. Amidst the screams of the maids, Mia kept low, protecting her head with both hands. Night Sama, please help me. While Finn's absence makes her feel uneasy, the shaking of the airship subsides. The next thing she knew, the maids were now making a cheerful noise. I didn't expect them to come. The maids around her look out the window with eyes as if they are looking at something divine. Mia also got up and looked out the window, and there even larger than the flying battleship she had just seen, was a black airship flying in the sky. It is so huge that for a moment one might mistake it for a floating island. What's that? Mia asks, and one of the maids replies with a smile. That is the Empire's trump card, the Flying Fortress. It is also called when the maid tries to say its name, there is a reply from outside the window via an external microphone. A small magic circle had appeared a few meters away from the window. It's a transmission magic circle that conducts conversations. I am Arcadia we have been expecting you, our princess. Arcadia-san? When Mia tilts her head, the owner of the voice speaks to her in a gentle tone. I'm here to pick you up. After moving from the airship to the flying fortress, Mia was ushered into a room with a throne. Accompanying her is Finn with Brave. Mia is happy to see Finn for the first time in a long time. She clutched Finn's left hand and looked nervously around her. It looks like the inside of a magnificent castle. She looked around curiously, as if she didn't feel like she was in an airship. Brave looks around sullenly. It's better than a bad castle. Finn, who is also wary, asks Brave. Is this Arcadia? It looks perfect at first glance, though. Isn't it back in full form? Brave shakes his head at Finn's question. It's just the appearance. Some parts are empty on the inside. But more importantly, here comes Arcadia. Brave says, and the large door of the room opens and a huge eyeball comes in through it. A huge magic creature nearly two meters tall was accompanied by many magic creatures as small as Brave. 
They line up like soldiers, and when they enter the room, magic creatures surround Mia and the others. Mia's legs were trembling with fright in front of Arcadia, who had come before her. When she hugs Finn tightly Arcadia opens its arms, which are small for its huge body. We have been waiting for you, princess. The magic creatures turned their gazes to the floor to bow their heads in unison. It happened so much that Mia and the others were surprised. Eh? Ah no, uh, Edo. Calm down, Mia. But more importantly, why did you call us here? Mia hid behind Finn, and Arcadia asked, Did I scare you? and looked apologetic. The machines have been very active, so I personally went up to pick up the princess. Are you hurt? Mia, who had peeked out from behind Finn, says, glancing at Arcadia. I I am fine, Disu. Disu! Princess, you don't need to use honorifics with us. We are your loyal servants, your highness. Arcadia's down-to-earth attitude made Finn, not to mention Mia, surprised. But Brave is the only one who knows, and he seems calm. Therefore, Brave explains the situation. Mia has awakened to the power of the new humans. That's why these guys are so happy to have found a new master, and they are making a big fuss about it. Hearing that, Mia thanks Brave. That's how it was. Thanks for telling me, Bukuin. However, Arcadia's attitude changes drastically upon hearing that. While it remained respectful to Mia, it was different for Finn and Brave. How long will the Corps and the Knight, who can't even fulfill their duties, continue to pretend to be the princess's guardian knight? Finn's gaze sharpened as Arcadia glared at him with its single eye. Is that your true character? True character? No, it's not. Both are me. The princess is gracious, but not you. I hear you may have abandoned your mission. You will be punished immediately upon your return to the Empire. Hearing Arcadia's words about punishing Finn, Mia jumped forward. When she gets between Arcadia and Finn, she spreads her arms. And no! Knight Sama is Mia's guardian knight. P please don't take the liberty of us saying so. As she protects Finn in fear, the magic creatures that Arcadia has brought with it start to make a commotion. She covered him, the princess covered for him, what should we do? What should we do? Arcadia gives those noisy magic creatures a good scolding. Silence, however, it immediately spoke in a gentle tone towards Mia. If princess says so, I won't press his sins any further. Are really? Yes. This Arcadia can promise you that. Thank you. Seeing Mia patting her chest in relief, Arcadia also looked relieved. Arcadia was smiling, but the way it looked at Finn and the others was stern. I'll let you off the hook this time because the princess ordered it. But when we return to the Empire, you will work for a while. Finn wiped away a cold sweat. Work? What are you going to make me do this time? Arcadia gave the order with a troublesome look. You have to deal with the machines. They attack at all hours of the day and night, and it's quite a hassle. Hearing that, Mia looked sad. Are you going to take Night Sama? Then Arcadia explains, moving its hands desperately in an attempt to make excuses. I just give them the punishment. Otherwise, the others will not be satisfied. But if it is the princess's wish, the punishment will be short, and he will be returned to your side immediately. Hearing that, Mia gave a small nod, and Arcadia also looked relieved. Early in the morning, Luxion suggested that I visit the royal palace. In doing so, I needed to stop by the school's boys' dormitory, but I was too lazy to do so due to yesterday's events. You've got to think more about timing. As I walk down the hallway of the boys' dormitory, I'm swearing at Luxion, who can't make the arrangements. Luxion showed no concern at all. It was Master who gave the order to proceed with the preparations to remove the registry from the kingdom. We can take care of the problem before we leave, so please don't complain. There's no need to go back to get night uniforms. It's a matter of formality. You'll have to prepare it. If Master collects them while stopping by the royal palace, there's no need to produce a knight's outfit that will only be worn once. I'm in a good mood today, 
I thought to myself as I dealt with the artificial intelligence. Then I arrive at my room, unlock the door and go inside. I became grumpy all at once. You tricked me, Luxion. I didn't trick you. I just failed in my mission. I take my gaze off my partner who is arguing and turns my gaze to the three people in the room. Ange Livia Noel. Of the three nervous-looking people, it was Ange who made the first move. Unlike yesterday, she is standing proudly with her chest out. I've heard the whole story. You're getting yourself into some incredibly troublesome stuff, aren't you? Why couldn't you have asked for her help? Not angry, just sad, Ange asks me a question. It hurts my heart to look, but there is no point in breaking here. This is my problem. It's our problem. Why are you always Ange's eyes are moist with frustration, and she looks as if she is about to cry, but she seems to be holding back. Livia, who had been silent, spoke up and pleaded to me. I am. We wanted Leon San to rely on us. It didn't matter if it was in whining or in a weak voice. We just wanted you to open up to us. Noelle throws her anger at me. We are not irrelevant either. But you are acting like you are going to take care of it all by yourself. That's what I hate the most about you, Leon. When they say they hate me, I snicker and turn my back on them. Are you done with your business? Well then, I have business, so I'll go. As I was about to leave the room, Ange hugged me on the back. She presses her forehead against my back. I could feel Ange trembling on my back. Let me go. Please, let us help you. If I part with you like this, I won't be happy even if I survive. I want to live with you. So sobbing, Ange offers to help. I let out a small sigh before replying, as Ange's crying seemed to weaken my decision. I kept my back to them so as not to weaken my resolve any further. If you've heard from Luxion, you already understand, don't you? I don't need the three of you to help me now. You're slowing me down. I could hear a voice of Livia and Noel taking in their breaths. Ange grabbed my back desperately and wouldn't let go. Then we'll help you on our own. Not for you. We will help you of our own volition. You can do whatever you want. I forced myself to walk away and left the room away from Ange. Luxion follows me, and finally Ange calls out to me behind my back. There is one move we can make. Leon may not like it, but we can bring the kingdom together and use it as a force for good. That way, we can help you. Ange says she's going to unite the kingdoms to fight the empire, but it seems impossible to me. This is a country that has been unable to get its act together for so long. It is hard to believe that a country that has been having internal conflicts whenever something goes wrong can come together under the current circumstances. It's useless. It's never going to be able to unite. I'll put it all together. More allies now will only get in the way. When I say get in the way, Luxion gives Ange an extra helping hand. The more forces we have against the Empire, our odds of victory will increase even more. Even if that were the case, this country wouldn't come together. I'm the one who's had to do all the hard work until now. It would be a miracle if this problematic country could come together under the current circumstances. However, Ange seems to believe it. It can be done. But this way will be a great burden for you. That is the only thing that pains me. So I really need your permission. At the very least, listen to what I have to say, please. I could feel my determination dulling in the voice that seemed to be clinging. As if shaking off my hesitation, I raise my right hand and wave it. I'll give you as many permits as you want. Ange and the others can do as you please. My will is irrelevant now. As Leon was leaving, Ange was extending her right hand to Leon's back. As it was, she wiped away her tears and changed the look in her eyes to change her feelings. Getting fired up for herself. Leon's permission was given. Now I can make up my mind. Get a grip, Angelica Rafa Redgrave you decided to stand next to your hero, didn't you? Then don't keep whining about it. Crying won't solve the problem. 
crying wastes time. No matter how lonely and how sad you are, act now. Move now. Inwardly reprimanding and encouraging herself, she looks back to Livia and Noel. In order to be strong in front of them, she tried to behave with dignity, even though her eyes were red. Livia, Noel, I'm going to be busy for a while. I want to do everything I can for Leon. Hearing Angie's determination, Noel nodded. I've got some things I need to do, so I'm going to head over to Leon's parents' house once. Then Ange looks at Livia. Will Livia come with me? When questioned, Livia shakes her head. When she raised her head, her expression was different from before. There is a strong will in her eyes. I'll do what I can too. I see. Then I'll be going now. Ange, Livia, and Noel each of them made a move for Leon. On the other hand, Marie was on a floating island covered with overgrown trees. T there it is. Thank goodness. I guess Aniki and others haven't come here yet. After cutting through the grass and trees, she found a large, old, decaying mansion. The old stone mansion, once occupied by someone, has lost its masters and those who managed it, and is now only rotting away. Kara was following behind Marie, her legs shaking with fatigue. Please wait, Marie Sama supporting Kara is an elf boy, Kyle. Kyle, once Marie's exclusive servant, happened to be in the royal capital on an errand. He is now employed by the Bardafault family and works in the mansion with his mother, Umiria. This time he had come to the royal capital with Nix, which allowed him to meet up with Marie. What are you looking for by borrowing the airship from Nix Sama? I'm sure it's a treasure anyway, but let's think about the timing. Kyle is still cheeky as ever, but he is more soft-spoken than before. His irritating nature is gone, and the only thing that is bad is his mouth. His tone is gentler than before. Marie put down her luggage and picked up the rifle she had brought with her. For once, it's something I need. I have to retrieve it and I have to get it to Leo. After sitting Kara down, Kyle wipes the sweat off his face and talks about the current situation. I know you say so, but is it really necessary for you to miss class? Besides, it's rumored that things with the Empire have been on the rocks lately. Marie only looks back with her upper body and looks at Kyle with a surprised look on her face. Who told you that? Count Roseblade told Nick Sama. That when the foreign students returned, their attitude changed. Hearing that, Marie is in a hurry to retrieve the thing right away. Sorry you too, but we'll be doing some exploration as soon as we're done with our break. We're running out of time. I have to collect it quickly and deliver that thing to my brother, a dizzy Kara would not want to move again, but she was willing to do so because Marie had ordered her to do so. I'll leave it to me. But please make the break a little longer, please. Kyle asks Marie, leaving Kara lying on the ground. It's kind of weird to have a mansion in a place like this. Marie nods and talks about this mansion the dungeon. It's the hideout of an alchemist called the Sage. In his later years, he set up his mansion on a deserted island because he wanted to get away from the mundane world and devote himself to his research. This dungeon, however, is a place that can be conquered in the early stages. Marie had also visited there several times in that Otome game and thus had it in her memory. Kyle looks impressed. Goshijin Sama is quite knowledgeable. That said, I don't think there's much research results left. But as long as that thing gee's there, the rest doesn't matter. That thing? A lump of gold or something? Since Marie is obsessed, Kyle seems to think that they are here to recover some sort of treasure. But Marie shakes her head and denies it. No. It's a medicine that can make you very strong. I can only help him like this, but I'm sure I can be of help for Aniki, right? Because it had a great effect on that Otome game. Using that item even untrained characters could defeat powerful bosses. Although it could only be used once, Marie has been helped many times. Even with such a powerful item, that Otome game could not be cleared. If I've pushed Aniki into a corner, I need to take responsibility for that. Memories of her previous life flash back. Marie furrowed her eyebrows and then tightened her expression. This time I want to be useful to Aniki. I can't keep dragging him down. 
How's that? Isn't that great? Wow, it's amazing. Marie-chan is really amazing, I'm really impressed with you. When Marie visited a lab in Lickhorn, she showed Creer the medicine she had obtained. In front of the liquid in a bottle-like container, Creer acted cheerful but with some stunned tone in her voice. But more importantly, is Aniki really coming back? Yeah, they finished the retrieval earlier than expected, so they're going to come back once they're done. The timing is so perfect it's almost sickening. I didn't think Marie Chan would get this one, of all things. Creer makes an electronic sound that conveys a sense of unwillingness, but Marie is excited to be of use to Leon and doesn't care much about it. This stuff is really awesome. It's an enhancement drug that can make even a small fry character stronger. Right. I had a quick look at it, and it's definitely an amazing drug. It's so powerful that I was surprised myself. As they are talking, the door to the lab opens and Leon enters. Lux Ion was with him, but his eyes were on the medicine on the table. Leon looks at Marie and then turns his gaze to the drug. I never thought you'd find it. Leon seemed genuinely pleased as he picked up the bottle. Marie holds her hands and smiles. I'm useful, too, right? It's a glorious achievement. More importantly, where was this? When asked by Leon, who placed the bottle on the table, Marie speaks with enthusiasm. It's a dungeon in the nearby area. It's an uninhabited floating island, though. With this, you can't lose to Arcadia, right? With the drugs she had brought, Leon would surely survive Marie believed so. Leon smiles, puts his hand on Marie's head, and pats her roughly. You've done a good job. Now our chances of winning have increased. Marie was a little happy to see Leon in good spirits for the first time in a long time, even though her hair was a mess. Hey! You should be nicer to me. More importantly, Aniki what? If you want an allowance, I'll let you settle your price with Creer. You're wrong. Marie is angry at being thought to be after money, but her expression soon becomes clouded. There are more fresh wounds on Leon's hands than before. Underneath the clothes could be worse. That is how much he is repeating something dangerous. Don't be reckless anymore. I am also remorseful for relying on Aniki so much. Marie says as she looks down, and Leon makes light of the situation in his usual tone. Being auspicious doesn't suit you. But I really appreciate your help. Now that you've solved one of my problems, have Creer give you an allowance. Marie wanted to talk more with Leon. But Leon is busy, and soon he and Creer are talking about the drug. Creer, I need you to make this drug usable. You understand what I mean, don't you? Creer, who was able to read the intent, responds in a slightly stunned electronic voice. I'll adjust it to Master's body and make sure that a small amount is enough to achieve the desired effect. Even so, the maximum number of times it can be used is three, right? Neutralizers will have to be administered along the way. That's good enough. I've got other stuff to do, so I'm going now. Marie, go back to the school and be quiet with those five idiots. Why yes. Saying that, Leon leaves the laboratory. However, Luxion was the only one who did not follow Leon and remained in the laboratory. When Leon is gone, he takes a stern attitude toward Marie. You did the unnecessary thing I warned you not to do anything. Marie is annoyed by Luxion's words and turns her face away, puffing out her cheeks. Don't you think that's a little harsh? I did my best for Aniki. We were informed of the existence of this drug from the very beginning by Master, and we investigated and discovered it. Eh? But Aniki said he couldn't find it. Marie really doesn't understand what kind of stuff this medicine is, Marie had a bad feeling about it. Unpleasant sweats start to break out, and she wonders if she's done something dreadful. When Luxion turns his single eye to Creer, she takes turns explaining. Marie Chan, indeed, this drug is powerful. It can turn anyone into a superhuman. Right. That's why I did it for Aniki. She has desperately searched for it to help Leon. She wanted to be useful to her big brother. 
Do you think there are no disadvantages to a drug that is so effective? It's a powerful drug. If you use it like this, the consumer will die before the effect wears off. The price for the temporary strength gained from the powerful drug was the user's life. Marie is trembling. It's wrong. Because if it were that Otome game, they would have survived normally. Maybe so. But what we have before us is a powerful drug. I'll make adjustments for Master, but three uses of it even with a neutralizer will result death. When she was told in no uncertain terms that Leon was going to die, Marie burst into tears before she knew it and dropped down into a sitting position, collapsing on the floor. Luxion's single red eye glows. If we get it, Master will certainly use it. Considering his current state of mind, I had decided that it would be best not to get it, Luxion was angry. To such Luxion, Creer intercedes. But this is what Master wanted, isn't it? Marie Chan didn't know either, so there's no point in blaming her. Luxion stops blaming and confirms with Creer about the drug. Can you reduce the effect? That's against Master's orders. I'm sorry, but I'll take Master's orders over yours. How many times can Master's body withstand the use of drugs? The third time you use it, you will die for sure. Frankly, even the second time is dangerous. Hearing the conversation between Luxion and Creer, Marie bursts into tears. I, I just wanted to be useful for Aniki. Her good intentions are going to cause Leon's death. Marie crouched down and sobbed, feeling terrible regret for the mistake she had made. Chapter 11 For You The airship carrying Mia was approaching Empire territory. Mia, who has been given a luxurious room, looks out the window restlessly. Maids are stationed in the room and take care of Mia. I've only seen Night Sama a few times since I got on the airship. I've told these people that you can wait outside, too, but they won't leave. The treatment was so different from before that it was suffocating for Mia. One of the maids approaches and places a drink on a nearby table. The drink in the lidded cup with the drinking cup was fresh fruit juice. The cup was made on the assumption that it would spill, since no one knows when the inside of an airship will shake. When Nia was about to take it and take a sip. Miliaris Sama. Get down, please. One of the maids cries out and bends down to cover Mia's body. She let go of the cup and dropped it on the floor, and Mia wondered what was going on. Eh? What she saw outside the window was a flying battleship covered in metal. It has a shape no one has ever seen before, but what caught her attention was the rust on the armor. And it looks like a remnant that has been submerged at the bottom of the sea for many years. The maids were panicked. Machines! What are the soldiers doing? Calm down! He's on this ship. The maids, in a commotion, try to evacuate Mia. But along the way, a change occurred. A huge flying battleship is launching an attack on something. Several rays of light were emitted in one direction. But such a flying battleship was pierced by a reddish-black light. When the explosion occurs as it does, the inside of the ship shakes violently. Amidst the screams of the maids, Mia kept low, protecting her head with both hands. Night Sama, please help me. While Finn's absence makes her feel uneasy, the shaking of the airship subsides. The next thing she knew, the maids were now making a cheerful noise. I didn't expect them to come. The maids around her look out the window with eyes as if they are looking at something divine. Mia also got up and looked out the window, and there even larger than the flying battleship she had just seen was a black airship flying in the sky. It is so huge that for a moment one might mistake it for a floating island. What's that? Mia asks, and one of the maids replies with a smile. That is the Empire's trump card, the Flying Fortress. It is also called when the maid tries to say its name, there is a reply from outside the window via an external microphone. A small magic circle had appeared a few meters away from the window. It's a transmission magic circle that conducts conversations. I am Arcadia we have been expecting you, our princess. Arcadia-san? When Mia tilts her head, the owner of the voice speaks to her in a gentle tone. I'm here to pick you up. After moving from the airship to the flying fortress, Mia was ushered into a room with a throne. 
Accompanying her is Finn with Brave. Mia is happy to see Finn for the first time in a long time. She clutched Finn's left hand and looked nervously around her. It looks like the inside of a magnificent castle. She looked around curiously, as if she didn't feel like she was in an airship. Brave looks around sullenly. It's better than a bad castle. Finn, who is also wary, asks Brave. Is this Arcadia? It looks perfect at first glance, though. Isn't it back in full form? Brave shakes his head at Finn's question. It's just the appearance. Some parts are empty on the inside. But more importantly, here comes Arcadia. Brave says, and the large door of the room opens and a huge eyeball comes in through it. A huge magic creature nearly two meters tall was accompanied by many magic creatures as small as Brave. They line up like soldiers, and when they enter the room, magic creatures surround Mia and the others. Mia's legs were trembling with fright in front of Arcadia, who had come before her. When she hugs Finn tightly Arcadia opens its arms, which are small for its huge body. We have been waiting for you, princess. The magic creatures turned their gazes to the floor to bow their heads in unison. It happened so much that Mia and the others were surprised. Eh? Ah no, uh, Edo. Calm down, Mia. But more importantly, why did you call us here? Mia hid behind Finn, and Arcadia asked, Did I scare you? and looked apologetic. The machines have been very active, so I personally went up to pick up the princess. Are you hurt? Mia, who had peeked out from behind Finn, says, glancing at Arcadia. I I am fine, Disu. Disu! Princess, you don't need to use honorifics with us. We are your loyal servants, your highness. Arcadia's down-to-earth attitude made Finn, not to mention Mia, surprised. But Brave is the only one who knows, and he seems calm. Therefore, Brave explains the situation. Mia has awakened to the power of the new humans. That's why these guys are so happy to have found a new master, and they are making a big fuss about it. Hearing that, Mia thanks Brave. That's how it was. Thanks for telling me, Bukuin. However, Arcadia's attitude changes drastically upon hearing that. While it remained respectful to Mia, it was different for Finn and Brave. How long will the Corps and the Knight, who can't even fulfill their duties, continue to pretend to be the princess's guardian knight? Finn's gaze sharpened as Arcadia glared at him with its single eye. Is that your true character? True character? No, it's not. Both are me. The princess is gracious, but not you. I hear you may have abandoned your mission. You will be punished immediately upon your return to the Empire, hearing Arcadia's words about punishing Finn, Mia jumped forward. When she gets between Arcadia and Finn, she spreads her arms. And no! Knight Sama is Mia's guardian knight. P please don't take the liberty of us saying so. As she protects Finn in fear, the magic creatures that Arcadia has brought with it start to make a commotion. She covered him, the princess covered for him, what should we do? What should we do? Arcadia gives those noisy magic creatures a good scolding. Silence, however, it immediately spoke in a gentle tone towards Mia. If princess says so, I won't press his sins any further. Are really? Yes. This Arcadia can promise you that. Thank you. Seeing Mia patting her chest in relief, Arcadia also looked relieved. Arcadia was smiling, but the way it looked at Finn and the others was stern. I'll let you off the hook this time because the princess ordered it. But when we return to the Empire, you will work for a while. Finn wiped away a cold sweat. Work? What are you going to make me do this time? Arcadia gave the order with a troublesome look. You have to deal with the machines. They attack at all hours of the day and night, and it's quite a hassle. Hearing that, Mia looked sad. Are you going to take Night Sama? Then Arcadia explains, moving its hands desperately in an attempt to make excuses. I just give them the punishment. Otherwise, the others will not be satisfied. But if it is the princess's wish, the punishment will be short, and he will be returned to your side immediately. 
Hearing that, Mia gave a small nod, and Arcadia also looked relieved. Early in the morning, Luxion suggested that I visit the royal palace. In doing so, I needed to stop by the school's boys' dormitory, but I was too lazy to do so due to yesterday's events. You've got to think more about timing. As I walk down the hallway of the boys' dormitory, I'm swearing at Luxion, who can't make the arrangements. Luxion showed no concern at all. It was Master who gave the order to proceed with the preparations to remove the registry from the kingdom. We can take care of the problem before we leave, so please don't complain. There's no need to go back to get night uniforms. It's a matter of formality. You'll have to prepare it. If Master collects them while stopping by the royal palace, there's no need to produce a knight's outfit that will only be worn once. I'm in a good mood today, I thought to myself as I dealt with the artificial intelligence. Then I arrive at my room, unlock the door and go inside. I became grumpy all at once. You tricked me, Luxion. I didn't trick you. I just failed in my mission. I take my gaze off my partner who is arguing and turns my gaze to the three people in the room. Ange Livia Noel. Of the three nervous-looking people, it was Ange who made the first move. Unlike yesterday, she is standing proudly with her chest out. I've heard the whole story. You're getting yourself into some incredibly troublesome stuff, aren't you? Why couldn't you have asked for her help? Not angry, just sad, Ange asks me a question. It hurts my heart to look, but there is no point in breaking here. This is my problem. It's our problem. Why are you always Ange's eyes are moist with frustration, and she looks as if she is about to cry, but she seems to be holding back. Livia, who had been silent, spoke up and pleaded to me. I am. We wanted Leon San to rely on us. It didn't matter if it was in whining or in a weak voice. We just wanted you to open up to us. Noelle throws her anger at me. We are not irrelevant either. But you are acting like you are going to take care of it all by yourself. That's what I hate the most about you, Leon. When they say they hate me, I snicker and turn my back on them. Are you done with your business? Well then, I have business, so I'll go. As I was about to leave the room, Ange hugged me on the back. She presses her forehead against my back. I could feel Ange trembling on my back. Let me go. Please, let us help you. If I part with you like this, I won't be happy even if I survive. I want to live with you. So sobbing, Ange offers to help. I let out a small sigh before replying, as Ange's crying seemed to weaken my decision. I kept my back to them so as not to weaken my resolve any further. If you've heard from Luxion, you already understand, don't you? I don't need the three of you to help me now. You're slowing me down. I could hear a voice of Livia and Noel taking in their breaths. Ange grabbed my back desperately and wouldn't let go. Then we'll help you on our own. Not for you. We will help you of our own volition. You can do whatever you want. I forced myself to walk away and left the room away from Ange. Luxion follows me, and finally Ange calls out to me behind my back. There is one move we can make. Leon may not like it, but we can bring the kingdom together and use it as a force for good. That way, we can help you. Ange says she's going to unite the kingdoms to fight the empire, but it seems impossible to me. This is a country that has been unable to get its act together for so long. It is hard to believe that a country that has been having internal conflicts whenever something goes wrong can come together under the current circumstances. It's useless. It's never going to be able to unite. I'll put it all together. More allies now will only get in the way. When I say get in the way, Luxion gives Ange an extra helping hand. The more forces we have against the Empire, our odds of victory will increase even more. Even if that were the case, this country wouldn't come together. I'm the one who's had to do all the hard work until now. It would be a miracle if this problematic country could come together under the current circumstances. However, Ange seems to believe it. It can be done. But this way will be a great burden for you. 
That is the only thing that pains me. So I really need your permission. At the very least, listen to what I have to say, please. I could feel my determination dulling in the voice that seemed to be clinging. As if shaking off my hesitation, I raise my right hand and wave it. I'll give you as many permits as you want. Ange and the others can do as you please. My will is irrelevant now. As Leon was leaving, Ange was extending her right hand to Leon's back. As it was, she wiped away her tears and changed the look in her eyes to change her feelings. Getting fired up for herself. Leon's permission was given. Now I can make up my mind. Get a grip, Angelica Rafa Redgrave you decided to stand next to your hero, didn't you? Then don't keep whining about it. Crying won't solve the problem. Crying wastes time. No matter how lonely and how sad you are, act now. Move now. Inwardly reprimanding and encouraging herself, she looks back to Livia and Noel. In order to be strong in front of them, she tried to behave with dignity, even though her eyes were red. Livia, Noel, I'm going to be busy for a while. I want to do everything I can for Leon. Hearing Angie's determination, Noel nodded. I've got some things I need to do, so I'm going to head over to Leon's parents' house once. Then Ange looks at Livia. Will Livia come with me? When questioned, Livia shakes her head. When she raised her head, her expression was different from before. There is a strong will in her eyes. I'll do what I can too. I see. Then I'll be going now. Ange, Livia, and Noel each of them made a move for Leon. On the other hand, Marie was on a floating island covered with overgrown trees. T there it is. Thank goodness. I guess Aniki and others haven't come here yet. After cutting through the grass and trees, she found a large, old, decaying mansion. The old stone mansion, once occupied by someone, has lost its masters and those who managed it, and is now only rotting away. Kara was following behind Marie, her legs shaking with fatigue. Please wait, Marie Sama supporting Kara is an elf boy, Kyle. Kyle, once Marie's exclusive servant, happened to be in the royal capital on an errand. He is now employed by the Bardafault family and works in the mansion with his mother, Umeria. This time he had come to the royal capital with Nyx, which allowed him to meet up with Marie. What are you looking for by borrowing the airship from Nyx Sama? I'm sure it's a treasure anyway, but let's think about the timing. Kyle is still cheeky as ever, but he is more soft-spoken than before. His irritating nature is gone, and the only thing that is bad is his mouth. His tone is gentler than before. Marie put down her luggage and picked up the rifle she had brought with her. For once, it's something I need. I have to retrieve it and I have to get it to Leo. After sitting Kara down, Kyle wipes the sweat off his face and talks about the current situation. I know you say so, but is it really necessary for you to miss class? Besides, it's rumored that things with the Empire have been on the rocks lately. Marie only looks back with her upper body and looks at Kyle with a surprised look on her face. Who told you that? Count Roseblade told Nick Sama. That when the foreign students returned, their attitude changed. Hearing that, Marie is in a hurry to retrieve the thing right away. Sorry you too, but we'll be doing some exploration as soon as we're done with our break. We're running out of time. I have to collect it quickly and deliver that thing to my brother, a dizzy Kara would not want to move again, but she was willing to do so because Marie had ordered her to do so. I'll leave it to me. But please make the break a little longer, please. Kyle asks Marie, leaving Kara lying on the ground. It's kind of weird to have a mansion in a place like this. Marie nods and talks about this mansion the dungeon. It's the hideout of an alchemist called the Sage. In his later years, he set up his mansion on a deserted island because he wanted to get away from the mundane world and devote himself to his research. This dungeon, however, is a place that can be conquered in the early stages. Marie had also visited there several times in that Otome game and thus had it in her memory. Kyle looks impressed. Goshijin Sama is quite knowledgeable. That said, I don't think there's much research results left. But as long as that thingy's there, the rest doesn't matter. That thing? 
a lump of gold or something? Since Marie is obsessed, Carl seems to think that they are here to recover some sort of treasure. But Marie shakes her head and denies it. No. It's a medicine that can make you very strong. I can only help him like this, but I'm sure I can be of help for Aniki, right? Because it had a great effect on that Otome game. Using that item, even untrained characters could defeat powerful bosses. Although it could only be used once, Marie has been helped many times. Even with such a powerful item, that Otome game could not be cleared. If I've pushed Aniki into a corner, I need to take responsibility for that. Memories of her previous life flash back. Marie furrowed her eyebrows and then tightened her expression. This time I want to be useful to Aniki. I can't keep dragging him down. How's that? Isn't that great? Wow, it's amazing. Marie-chan is really amazing, I'm really impressed with you. When Marie visited a lab in Lickhorn, she showed Creer the medicine she had obtained. In front of the liquid in a bottle-like container, Creer acted cheerful but with some stunned tone in her voice. But more importantly, is Aniki really coming back? Yeah, they finished the retrieval earlier than expected, so they're going to come back once they're done. The timing is so perfect it's almost sickening. I didn't think Marie Chan would get this one, of all things. Creer makes an electronic sound that conveys a sense of unwillingness, but Marie is excited to be of use to Leon and doesn't care much about it. This stuff is really awesome. It's an enhancement drug that can make even a small fry character stronger. Right. I had a quick look at it, and it's definitely an amazing drug. It's so powerful that I was surprised myself. As they are talking, the door to the lab opens and Leon enters. Lux Ion was with him, but his eyes were on the medicine on the table. Leon looks at Marie and then turns his gaze to the drug. I never thought you'd find it. Leon seemed genuinely pleased as he picked up the bottle. Marie holds her hands and smiles. I'm useful, too, right? It's a glorious achievement. More importantly, where was this? When asked by Leon, who placed the bottle on the table, Marie speaks with enthusiasm. It's a dungeon in the nearby area. It's an uninhabited floating island, though. With this, you can't lose to Arcadia, right? With the drugs she had brought, Leon would surely survive Marie believes so. Leon smiles, puts his hand on Marie's head, and pats her roughly. You've done a good job. Now our chances of winning have increased. Marie was a little happy to see Leon in good spirits for the first time in a long time, even though her hair was a mess. Hey! You should be nicer to me. More importantly, Aniki what? If you want an allowance, I'll let you settle your price with Creer. You're wrong. Marie is angry at being thought to be after money, but her expression soon becomes clouded. There are more fresh wounds on Leon's hands than before. Underneath the clothes could be worse. That is how much he is repeating something dangerous. Don't be reckless anymore. I am also remorseful for relying on Aniki so much. Marie says as she looks down, and Leon makes light of the situation in his usual tone. Being auspicious doesn't suit you. But I really appreciate your help. Now that you've solved one of my problems, have Creer give you an allowance. Marie wanted to talk more with Leon. But Leon is busy, and soon he and Creer are talking about the drug. Creer, I need you to make this drug usable. You understand what I mean, don't you? Creer, who was able to read the intent, responds in a slightly stunned electronic voice. I'll adjust it to Master's body and make sure that a small amount is enough to achieve the desired effect. Even so, the maximum number of times it can be used is three, right? Neutralizers will have to be administered along the way. That's good enough. I've got other stuff to do, so I'm going now. Marie, go back to the school and be quiet with those five idiots. Why yes. Saying that, Leon leaves the laboratory. However, Luxion was the only one who did not follow Leon and remained in the laboratory. When Leon is gone, he takes a stern attitude toward Marie. You did the unnecessary thing I warned you not to do anything. 
Marie is annoyed by Lukshan's words and turns her face away, puffing out her cheeks. Don't you think that's a little harsh? I did my best for Aniki. We were informed of the existence of this drug from the very beginning by Master, and we investigated and discovered it. Eh? But Aniki said he couldn't find it. Marie really doesn't understand what kind of stuff this medicine is, Marie had a bad feeling about it. Unpleasant sweats start to break out, and she wonders if she's done something dreadful. When Luxion turns his single eye to Creer, she takes turns explaining. Marie Chan, indeed, this drug is powerful. It can turn anyone into a superhuman. Right. That's why I did it for Aniki. She has desperately searched for it to help Leon. She wanted to be useful to her big brother. Do you think there are no disadvantages to a drug that is so effective? It's a powerful drug. If you use it like this, the consumer will die before the effect wears off. The price for the temporary strength gained from the powerful drug was the user's life. Marie is trembling. It's wrong. Because if it were that Otome game, they would have survived normally. Maybe so. But what we have before us is a powerful drug. I'll make adjustments for Master, but three uses of it, even with a neutralizer, will result death. When she was told in no uncertain terms that Leon was going to die, Marie burst into tears before she knew it and dropped down into a sitting position, collapsing on the floor. Luxion's single red eye glows. If we get it, Master will certainly use it. Considering his current state of mind, I had decided that it would be best not to get it, Luxion was angry. To such Luxion, Creer intercedes. But this is what Master wanted, isn't it? Marie Chan didn't know either, so there's no point in blaming her. Luxion stops blaming and confirms with Creer about the drug. Can you reduce the effect? That's against Master's orders. I'm sorry, but I'll take Master's orders over yours. How many times can Master's body withstand the use of drugs? The third time you use it, you will die for sure. Frankly, even the second time is dangerous. Hearing the conversation between Luxion and Creer, Marie bursts into tears. I, I just wanted to be useful for Aniki. Her good intentions are going to cause Leon's death. Marie crouched down and sobbed, feeling terrible regret for the mistake she had made. Chapter 12 Their Respective Actions on an uninhabited floating island owned by Leon, a sacred tree brought from the Republic of Arzal was planted. Since it is uninhabited, it is managed by working robots. Noel was about to bring back such a sacred tree. The soil around the site is chopped up and transported by robots. Watching the scene was Kyle's mother, Umeria. She has big breasts for a petite woman, but she is an elf woman who is often seen as younger than her age, partly because of her gentle atmosphere and kind tone of voice. She is older than she looks and is a mother of a child. Are you sure you want to take this kid with you? After all the trouble, it's finally settled in here. Umeria looked rather disappointed as she watched the sacred tree being carried away. Noelle apologetically tries to persuade her. I'm sorry. But for this one time, we have no choice but to ask you to help us. Our future depends on it. The word future makes you Miria nod her head. Is there another problem related to Leon Sama? It seems he's still as busy as ever even after becoming a Grand Duke. Seeing you Miria smile bitterly, Noel hesitantly asks for her cooperation. Yes. But this time it's the most troublesome. So, will you help us, Umiria chan Eh? Noel desperately asks Umiria, who looks surprised. The other party is a servant of the Bardafault family Noel is in a higher position. She is not her direct boss, but if she asked Leon's parents, no doubt they would be willing to let her. But that's not good enough. Noel sama Please! I need someone to control the sacred tree. I'll do it too, but I need your help, Umiria chan Umiria was puzzled by Noel's strange behavior. So Noel explains the situation. Actually, as simple as possible so that Umiria can understand it. After finishing the explanation as it is, Noel looks down and asks for cooperation. 
She felt guilty toward you, Miria, for getting her involved in dangerous matters. Actually, you would want to live a peaceful life with Kyle, right? But right now, we need your help, you Miria chan Even Leon doesn't have enough leeway in this war, and if he is not careful, he will lose his life. It was pathetic to involve you, Miria, in such a situation. Noelle is so frustrated by her ability that she has no choice but to rely on others. If only I were stronger as a priestess, I could have controlled the sacred tree by myself. With the way I am now, it's no wonder Leon thinks I'm unreliable. Eumeria stretched out her hands and grabbed the hand of Noel, who was looking down. Both Kyle and I have been saved many times by all of you. So please allow me to return the favor. Eumeria Chan? A are you sure? Yes. War is scary, though, and I don't know what I can do. But thanks to Leon Sama and others, I can live with Kyle again. Ihi, seeing Yumiria smiling shyly, Noelle embraces her with tears flowing down her face. I'm sorry. And thank you so much. At the castle of Duke Fanos, Livia was visiting. Livia was shown into the audience room, where she was now meeting alone with Hertrude Sarah Fanos. The reason Livia had a private meeting with Hertrude was because of the magic flute in her hand. Standing on a high seat and looking down at Livia, Hertrude's red eyes are filled with hatred, and Livia can feel it. Hertrude crossed her arms. What do you think you are doing bringing Rada's magic flute all the way to Duke Fano's house now? Do you have permission to take the magic flute out in the first place? Rada, Hertrada Sarah Fano's, was Hertrude's little sister. She was a princess who lost her life in a war with the kingdom. They were close sisters. Livia looks up at Hertrude with the magic flute in her hands. Please teach me how to use this magic flute. Hertrude's eyes widened at that request. Are you serious? Do you know what it means to use that magic flute? Or do you just want to control the monsters? The magic flute had a mysterious power. Not only can you control monsters by blowing on it you can summon a huge monster called a guardian deity in exchange of your life. The giant monster revives no matter how many times it is defeated and continues to move to fulfill the user's wishes. However, when the objective is achieved, it disappears and the user's life is lost. Even if the objective is not achieved and you fail, or if you lose your life in the process and the giant monster is eliminated, your life will be taken away. That's the magic flute. Livia looks straight at Hertrude, knowing the facts about the magic flute. I will summon that big monster. I have something to accomplish, even if it costs my life. Hertrude shrugs her shoulders at the determined look in Livia's eyes. Ironic, isn't it? You took Luda's life, and now you try to use Luda's magic flute even if you lose your life. Livia was told that she killed her Trotta, but she did not directly take her life. That is, I've said too much. Hertrude quickly retracts her statement and gets off her high seat to approach Livia. Then, she reached for the magic flute held by Livia. Livia hesitates for a moment, but then hands the magic flute to Hertrude. Hertrude seemed to be remembering her little sister as she watched the magic flute. You must be cornered if you want to use this magic flute. I hear that the Grand Duke is also acting suspiciously, so what is going on? From the way she speaks, Livia realizes that Hertrude has the information. After some hesitation, Livia decided to tell her the current situation. A big war is going to happen. It's going to be a tough fight, even for Leon San, so I want to help. That's why you set your eyes on the magic flute. A giggling Hertrude was gently hugging the magic flute. Then, she shows a mocking attitude toward Livia. To give out the magic flute so easily and even give out the information, you really are a soft-hearted person, aren't you? You haven't grown up since then. You didn't consider the possibility that I would take the magic flute and throw you in jail. Did you think I had forgotten my grudge? When Livia is told that, she looks at Hertrude without being upset and replies. You are not a thoughtless person. You will not antagonize Leon San, you can't even lay a hand on me. Hertrude's eyebrows twitched. She was a little surprised to see that Livia, whom she thought remained a soft-hearted person, has become strong and smiles happily. Correct. 
I have decided that I will never fight with the Grand Duke again. Because I got badly burned when I carelessly laid my hands. When Livia and the others were first-year students at the school, Hertrud launched a battle against the kingdom. But that battle has been lost by Leon's presence. She has learned her lesson about fighting Leon, and she's showing that attitude, but... I have a feeling that she has a fondness for Leon San, to Livia, Hertrud seemed to have a favorable impression of Leon. Livia's gaze turned slightly stern, but Hertrud continued her story without regard. How to use magic flute is, you know. Unfortunately, I can't tell you. Is that so? Livia reaches for the magic flute. Let's take it home that was her intention, but Hertrud snapped the magic flute in front of Livia. Hey. Holding it with both hands, she destroyed the magic flute by lifting it up to her knees. Hertrud looks quite refreshed as she tosses the destroyed magic flute to a surprised Livia. While brushing back her silky black hair. It's refreshing. I really hate to think that my life was ruined because of this flute. W. What are you doing? This is your little sister's memento, isn't it? Sure, it's an important object, but this is a national treasure of the old principality, not a memento. Besides, if I leave something like this behind, you're likely to use it. Livia falls silent, unable to say anything. Even if Hertrud did not teach her how to use it, she intended to use it independently if the need arose. Worst case scenario, she was planning to deceive and have Creer analyze it and find out how to use it. Hertrud lets out a small sigh. Don't do it. The Grand Duke will cry. Livia is surprised to see Hertrud concerned about her. Didn't you have a grudge against me? Yes, I hate you. Very hate. But Hertrud shed a single tear perhaps remembering her little sister. I'm determined to live a life I can make her proud of. Besides, I am still an acting duke. I'm determined to work for the Fanos family. That's why I let you live. You should feel indebted to me. Abandoning selfishness, she pursues the interests of Duke Fanos. Hertrud says to Livia. I know it's hard on the sacrifices, but it's also hard on those who are left behind. Don't forget that. Livia picked up the broken magic flute. But still, I wanted to be of help to Leon San. I always thought. That was I good enough for Leon San? I was always being protected, and I felt pathetic that I couldn't be of any use. Seeing Livia in tears, Hertrud turns her back. When the silky black hair fluffily spreads and settles down. I hear that the relationship with the Empire has taken a turn for the worse. Did you know that much? It's just a rumor. But if the Empire is the opponent, the Grand Duke will have a hard time. I am convinced. So, the Duke Fanos will assist the Grand Duke. Are you going to help us? Hertrud turns and points her finger toward Livia. I'll keep this as a loan to the Grand Duke and to you. It will be very expensive, so be prepared. Livia grabs Hertrud's hand with both of hers and thanks her. Yes. If there is anything I can do, please let me know. Heh, anything, huh? Hertrud smiled bewitchingly when she said that much, but she did not demand anything on this occasion. The Redgrave family mansion in the royal capital. When Ange came to the reception room, she was drinking tea prepared by Cordelia, a maid who works at the mansion. It's been a while since I've had tea from Cordelia. Cordelia didn't seem phased with Ange sitting proudly on the sofa. Still, she worries about Ange and advises her. Why did you come to this mansion? Moreover, you even called the head of the family and your brother Gilbert Sama. I have something to talk about. She called her father, Vince, and her brother, Gilbert, to the royal capital because she had business to talk to. Normally, only one of them would be in the mansion in the royal capital. One of them stayed at the family home to take care of the territory. Ange summoned them. Even though she had already cut her ties off from her parents' home. Cordelia, who had taken care of Ange's personal needs not long ago, is anxious that both men will surely be furious. Oju-sama is the one who cut yourself off from your family. That's why I used Leon's name, okay? 
If Inch had asked, neither her father nor her brother would likely have granted her a visit, except if she had mentioned Leon's name. Leon already has a higher title, and he is also superior in terms of military power. From their point of view, they can't antagonize him badly, so they have no choice but to meet him. There is no way they would have a good feeling toward Ange, who created such a situation. When you called using the name of the Grand Duke, it was Gilbert Sama who was staying at the mansion. He was very angry. Still, we needed to meet and talk. As they were talking, the door was opened somewhat violently. Entering the reception room at a quick pace are Gilbert and Vince. Gilbert glares at Ange. The future Grand Duchess apparently doesn't know what it means to break off relations. How dare she show her face in front of us? Ange stands up and bows reverently. Long time no see, on Yui. And Chi Chi Yui too. Vince looks at Ange and mutters angrily. I have already cut ties with you as father and daughter. You have no right to call me father. So, what do you want? Even now I'm a very busy man. I hope it's not too boring. Summoned all the way to the royal capital by airship, Vince's words are filled with sarcasm and cynicism. In front of them, Ange begins to act proudly as a higher-ranked person. Shall I remove that breaking off relations? Gilbert's cheeks were drawn back at the arrogant Ange. You speak so highly towards me and Chi Chi Yui, who have given you so much support. It seems you have even forgotten how to be polite. He is saying, you betrayed us and now you are acting high and mighty. Even Ange, though her ears hurt, would not budge in order to fulfill her objective. She had no intention of changing her attitude. Ignoring Gilbert, Ange turns her body to Vince. Let's sit down and talk about it. Vince sees Ange, who does not change her attitude, and sits down on the sofa, as if he sensed something. Ange also sits down, but Gilbert remains standing. He stood near Vince and watched Ange's movements. When she feels lonely because of her brother's attitude, Vince opens his mouth. So, what brings you to our house? Ange closes her eyes once after a few seconds she opens them and declares in a clear voice. Yes, this is a declaration. I will make your grandson a king when she said all that, Vince was stunned. Gilbert is momentarily surprised too, but quickly recovers and accuses Ange. What are you talking about now? Can't you see we've already lost our chance? Even more, you're the ones who did all to Gilbert, who says there is no longer any chance for the throne, Vince's response is different. Now she's talking to me. You keep your mouth shut. Chi Chi Yui. Understood. When Vince silences Gilbert, he looks at Ange with his hands folded in front of his mouth. The Empire has already declared war on the kingdom. Soon rumors will spread, but I wonder if it has anything to do with this case? When asked, Ange nodded. Greatly Vince is smiling with the corners of his mouth raised. I figured as much. I heard that they said they would let us off the hook if we offered them the Grand Duke's head. I heard that the sentence exuded a lot of arrogance. When Ange learns the declaration of war from the Empire, she is shaken but does not show it in her face. We need the help of the Duke Redgrave. There is no more time. If we don't do something, there will be idiots who will say to kill Leon. If that happens Leon will give up on us. Leon won't attack back, but he will give up on the idea that we can't be relied on. If that happens, Leon would go into battle alone. Ange wanted to prevent that from happening. Gilbert looked as if he wanted to say, after all this time, but he didn't interfere. Vince looks at Ange's face, then responds. I see, so that's how much the Empire is a threat Vince's grinning face was clearly the kind that says he has taken the initiative. In front of his daughter, he now responds as a nobleman. Seeing that Ange's attitude is not changing, Vince opens his mouth wide and bursts out laughing. Duke? When Ange is puzzled, Vince says. Call me Chi Chi Yui. Give my regards to the new majesty. Ange was surprised by Vince's attitude of acceptance, as she had thought it would take more persuasion. However, she must move on to the next step immediately. Thank you very much. Now, if you will excuse me. As Ange leaves the room, Gilbert asks Vince. 
Are you sure, Chichiyui? Is it about backing? It's about the conflict with the Empire. We can avoid it by offering the Grand Duke's head. When Gilbert says that, Vince lets out a deep sigh. Gilbert was flustered by that attitude. Is there something wrong? Do you really think the Empire will spare us if the Grand Duke is lost? We have been informed that they are seriously preparing for war. The kingdom will be burnt to the ground if we continue this internal strife. Gilbert is ashamed that his anger at Ange has made him narrow-minded. I'm sorry. I don't mind. But still, Ange has really started to make a good face. It's like a lie that she used to be so nervous when I just glared at her a little. Seeing Vince complimenting Ange, Gilbert compliments her this time because he is feeling weak. She was not the least bit intimidated by us. If Ange were a man, I would have gladly given up my position as head of the family. Vince looks a little surprised at Gilbert's faint-hearted remark. Seeing his looks, Gilbert is puzzled. Chi Chi Yui. Ha, you didn't notice? Vince, who let out a sigh and was amazed, shook his head, saying that he didn't understand anything. Eh? If Ange were a man, she would have been equal or slightly inferior to you at best. But because she is a woman, she was able to be so determined and strong. Gilbert looks unconvinced. No, but you need a little more experience in life to understand this. It's the truth when they say women are scary. Today you learn something. Seeing the change in his little sister, Gilbert also looks frustrated, perhaps having his own thoughts on the matter. I will continue to do my best. Vince nodded and spilled his true feelings to Gilbert. Nevertheless, my grandson will be king in fact, I wish I could have put you on the throne. He wanted to take the kingdom in his generation and then leave everything to his son. Gilbert, having heard his true feelings, looks a little happy. Your feelings are enough. Ha, huh, it would have been perfect if you had a little more greed. Chapter 13 Qualities of the Capture Targets At the school, where Leon, Ange and the others, and Marie were no longer in sight, the five idiots were sitting around a table with serious expressions on their faces. Time is a lunch break. After finishing lunch at the student cafeteria, the five of them are still discussing the issue face to face. Julius mutters with a troubled look on his face. It's been a few days since Marie skipped school. Jill put his hand on his chest and looked up at the ceiling. The days without seeing Marie San are becoming much more faded. Even though it's only for a few days, it feels much longer. Greg's muscles were pumped up, expressing how much he missed seeing Marie. Coo! I wanted Marie to see my backside after I retrained it. Chris was quietly listening to everyone with his arms crossed, but he'd taken off his school uniform jacket and was wearing his happy coat. She said she was headed to the dungeon, but why didn't she call out to us? Brad feeds his pets, Rose and Marie, a dove and a rabbit. Foo, letting out a sigh that sounded like an act. I wish she had at least called out to us. Things are getting a little dangerous these days, and I wanted to be the one to protect Marie for her safety. The five people looked sad not to see Marie, but at the same time, they were concerned about Leon and the others. Julius is angry. Actually, he feels like yelling, but he can't take his anger out on the other party in their absence. At the same time, he understood that he was in no position to be angry. This is why they have complicated expressions. Speaking of problems, Leon is the same. I thought he broke off his engagement to Angelica and the others, but I hear he's on his way somewhere else. Jilk shrugs his shoulders and condemns Leon's actions. To break off the engagement for no reason and make a woman cry, Leon Cohen, what a horrible person he is. Jilk's words were right, but the four people present could not accept them. Greg and Chris are talking to each other in a hushed whisper. How can this guy blame Leon? I am almost envious that he has such a thick skin. I don't think I would ever try to learn from him. Jilk pretended to be unaware of their conversation. Brad, in dismay, also talks about Ange and others. But what really happens? They haven't come to the school, and Marie doesn't seem to know what's going on. We can't even prepare an airship to go out looking for them, so we can't make any moves. Without Leon, 
they cannot arrange even a single airship. If they forced their way, they would be able to prepare it, but it was unclear where Marie was in the first place. Julius summarizes the conversation. I have heard that Marie rented the airship from Leon's big brother. I hear he is still staying in the royal capital, so how about we go talk to him after school? The four nodded that it was a good idea, but then a student rushed into the cafeteria. Julius and his group sensed the danger in the expressions of the students, who were pale and out of breath. When everyone turned their gaze to the entrance, the students who rushed in shouted, T the Empire has declared war. The information brought to the cafeteria causes the students to make a fuss. Julius makes a troubled expression. The rumors were true. Is the reason Leon hasn't shown his face for a while related to the Empire? Jilk shakes his head. It's very likely, but there's no way to know for sure right now. Instead, let's go to Marie's place immediately to rescue her. We should skip this afternoon's class and head straight for the Roseblade family mansion. The five of them got up from their seats and went out into the hallway, and at that moment Marie returned. Her eyes were tear-stained and her hair was shaggy. Seeing Marie, who was not with Kara and was walking with a sluggish step, the five of them jumped out. What happened, Marie? Marie raises her head and looks at Julius' face and says, Please. Please help my big brother. Eh? Marie's big brother? The five looked at each other in bewilderment at Marie's tearful wish. After leaving the place, Marie and her friends came to the tea ceremony room to talk. This was the result of choosing a less popular location because she did not want others to hear her story. As Julius and the others take their seats, Marie stands and looks down clutching the hem of her skirt with both hands. I've fooled everyone all this time. The five listen to Marie's words and apparently do not intend to interrupt. So Marie told them everything. That she is a reincarnated person. What she has done in her previous life. And that she approached the five people to make herself happy. Lastly, that she had cornered her big brother from her previous life. When Marie finishes telling the whole story, she gets down on her knees in front of the five of them. I am so sorry. Still, I beg you. Please help Aniki Oniai-chan. It was in Marie's own sincere way that she told the truth. Since they will be risking their lives to help Leon, so she'll have to face it sincerely as well. If it failed, it didn't matter. She just wanted to help Leon in any way she could. Marie, on her knees and in tears, waits for the five of them to shout abuse at her. They will probably curse at her. It can't be helped. Because she had deceived them. When people think she is a lovely young maiden, she actually has a previous life on the inside. Plus, approaching them with an ulterior motive would be the most disgusting act for the five of them. She was willing to accept whatever they would say. It's no wonder that they would abandon her and tell her that they would not help Leon. It was a much better course of action than to continue to fool them into a fight. But no matter how long she waited, she heard no cursing from the five. They don't look stunned or disappointed. Wouldn't they despise her? Thinking so, she was too afraid to raise her face. It was Julius who first opened his mouth. I've always thought it was strange. But I never expected that Leon was your big brother in a previous life. At the sound of Julius' calm and gentle voice, Marie looks up in surprise. Why why are you all laughing? The five smiled somewhat troubled and looked at Marie. When Greg approaches Marie, he makes her stop kneeling on the ground and stand her up. I'm surprised at the crazy story. But still, Marie is Marie, right? Because you are still the Marie we love. Greg? Chris was a little embarrassed and pretended to correct the position of his glasses. To tell the truth, I don't really feel it when you say reincarnation. But if Marie says it, I think it is true. I believe it. I'll believe it, and I'll lend a hand. Why? I was deceiving you. Although she was happy to be accepted, but Marie couldn't convince herself. She was prepared to be abused and even beaten up. That's how much she was aware of what she had done. And yet, even after hearing Marie's story, Chris says he'll accept her request. 
Brad has his usual cringy attitude, but today he seems to be really sparkling, even to Marie. Indeed, the encounter may have been a lie. But I can assure you since I have been with you from then on. There was no lie in your behavior. You may have had ulterior motives, but I have the capacity to forgive you for that. Marie is so happy that tears welled up in her eyes. She was so happy that they accepted her. Jilk offered a handkerchief to Marie, who was shedding tears. I would like to correct one thing, we are not going to help Leon Kuhn because Marie San asked us to do so. We would have lent a hand without being told. How can you risk your life? It's really dangerous. Although she was happy that they were willing to help, she could not believe that five people were willing to risk their lives for him. It is Julius who answers Marie's question. I don't know what Leon thinks about it, but we consider him a friend. You think of Aniki like that? When Marie looked around at the five, Greg was rubbing his finger under his nose. I still have the urge to pay him back, but I'm not hating him. Chris shrugged his shoulders. I have a grudge, but I owe him just as much. Brad is playing with his hair and looking a little frustrated. I've been through a painful experience many times. Well, I can't hate him, I guess. Jilk smiled and put his hand on his chest. I'm going to have to pay him back what was done to me. And for that reason, I can't have Leon Kuhn fall down here. The five looked like very wonderful men to Marie now. Everyone, maybe I've been overlooking something important all along. Marie wipes away her tears and smiles with tear-stained eyes. Thank you. I think I'm going to fall in love with you all over again. Marie sincerely feels happy to be with these five people. Julius blushes a little red in the cheeks. Then he changes his expression. Let us go over the details of the situation. And then we need someone to tell us where Leon is. Chapter 14 Leon's Regret When I visited the floating island, it had been raining heavily since the morning. Looking at the sky, heavy gray clouds are spreading. I was watching the scene from inside the cave, and I looked at my partner, Luxion, and asked him. Is this rain going to stop? Luxion, with his single red eye blinking several times, checks the weather on the floating islands we visit and informs me of the forecast. It will be clear in less than an hour. Shall I send Einhorn to pick you up? No, I'll get some rest. I decided to take a break and went back a little deeper into the cave. There is a bonfire inside, and luggage is scattered around it. These are the treasures I found in the dungeon. I sat down on an affordable rock and put my hand over the bonfire with my rifle by my side. It's colder than I thought. After saying that, Luxion began to put firewood on the fire. Although Luxion has no arms or legs, the firewood flies into the fire one after another as if by psychokinesis. Your immune system is weakened due to exhaustion of your physical strength and fatigue from the past few days. Your judgment is also declining, and it would be more efficient for you to rest for a while. That's why I'm taking a break. As I said that, I reached out to check out some of the loot I had gotten from the dungeon. In my hand was a dagger with a pattern floating on the blade. Can I use this? When I show it to Luxion, he begins to analyze it by emitting light from his single red eye. Once again, a metal that is not in the data is used. A fantasy metal dagger. If it's usable, I'll have it refurbished. The dagger has been neglected for many years, but there is not a single rust on the blade. The scabbard and handle are tattered, so if I want to use it, I should prepare a new one. As I look into the polished mirror-like blade, I see my face, more haggard than before. I look awful. Although I laugh at myself, Luxion's reaction is cold. It is due to excessive training and overdose of drugs. I know we don't have time, but if it continues, you will collapse. Besides, you do several conquests of dungeons a day. It is obviously hard work. It's not a job. This is a hobby. It is useless to say it differently. Master's body is at its limit. It's screaming. This is the price I get for slacking off all this time. I let out a small sigh and place the dagger on the ground. Price, huh? I was convinced as I said it. 
I've tried not to look at many things until now. This is just the price for neglecting the situation until now. If only I had trained seriously earlier. If only I had found Arcadia, new humans' as weapons earlier. If only I had gotten serious earlier. There is no end to regret, but I can't help thinking about it. As we spend our time in silence, staring at the bonfire, Luxion asks a question. I have a question for Master. It's about Angelica and the others. Again. No matter how many times you ask, the answer will always be the same. While I thought he was as persistent as ever, this time it was a little different. My concern is that Master was holding yourself back from Angelica and the others. I have long wondered. Why did Master try to distance yourself from Angelica and the others when you became close to them? Why do you want to keep your distance when you get close, even though you were blunt when you were friends? That's been obvious from the beginning. Of course it's because I'm a reincarnated person. That's not an answer. That's the answer. I'm not the kind of person who deserves them in the first place. I'm aware that I'm not the most talented person. I think my personality is a little bit twisted, and when I do get payback, I am always told by others that I am taking it too far. What's my point? I'm saying that a man like me, who dreams of a peaceful life, is not a good match for those girls who live an exciting life. It means I'm not suited for them. Above all. And I'm a coward. I've used your power to twist everything. It's wrong. It is the result of Master's grasp. It's the result of having grabbed it with your power, isn't it? I'm the person that this world doesn't need. The one who was supposed to be Livia's lover was the five idiots who were now mere shadows of their former selves. And yet, through the power of Luxion, I'm bonded with Livia. At the very least, the girls entered into the relationship knowing that Master was a coward. You are necessary existence for the girls, eh? You're so kind, it brings tears to my eyes. So I better stay away. Those girls are kind to guys like me, so it hurts my heart even more. I, with my knowledge of that Otome game strategy, am the same as deceiving those girls who don't know anything about it. I have things hidden from them, and they accept me and say that it's okay. Those good girls are a match for me? There is no way. I've always felt guilty. Master is not deceiving anyone. Even after hearing Luxion's consolation, I couldn't accept it. Because I am the one who understands myself the best. I'm still deceiving them. I know how petty I am. I just got overrated because I got you. What those three girls see is a fake me who looks like a hero who can solve anything with your power. Without Luxion, I'm sure I wouldn't have had any contact with those three. In the first place, I would not have been able to attend the academy. What would have happened by now, had I been forced into marriage before entering school? It is doubtful if I am even alive. However, just by getting Luxion, I was able to have a much more enjoyable school life. I am the property of Master. There is no shame in using my power, though I was still acting wildly, deceiving myself that it was my own power. Anyway, for me to think of running away now, those three are too dazzling. There was no way that I, who had been so overpowered by the power of Luxion, could be worthy of those three. I am painted with lies, and those three who are serious about living in this world are different. How much more would it have saved me if I could have stayed thoughtless? While I felt happy to be in a relationship with those three I felt guilty in my heart that I got those three girls through cowardly means. The closer I get, the more I remember myself playing that Otome game while making fun of it before my reincarnation. I made fun of Livia as a brainless protagonist. I said that Ange was an instantaneous water heater. The me that made fun of them is going out with them as if nothing happened. I thought I was making fun of them, but I realized it was I who was the most foolish. I just want those three to live happily ever after. I want more people to live, too, so it's my duty to fight Arcadia now that I have you. Hearing the statement my duty, Luxion was fidgeting with the ring in his red lens. Is it impatience? No. Upset? Anyway, he seems to be acting differently than usual. Do you regret getting me? I regret it all the time. 
Please answer the question. Was I unnecessary to master? I decided to answer Luxion, who was closing the distance, without fooling him. I thought that was the minimum courtesy for a partner who fights together. I'm grateful to you. Really? It's obvious. Because I had you, I was able to reject Zora's marriage proposal. I was able to go to school and get to know Ange and the others. It was a great feeling when I beat up those five guys. And I was able to win the war because of you. It was all thanks to you. If it had been just me, I would have died without being able to do anything. The Principality of Phanos, the Republic of Arzal, and the Holy Kingdom of Rochelle. Thanks to Luxion, I won all the battles. If I had been alone, I would have accomplished nothing. But, since I got the Luxion, it seems the story has deviated from what it should have been, doesn't it? I also have such regrets. Despite that, your facial expressions aren't that good. I guess he read my expression and saw that I was not only grateful. It's getting harder and harder to fool him these days. Because if I could start my life over, I doubt I would get you. It is true that I was saved, but at the same time, I was burdened with trouble. If I had my life to live over again, I didn't think I'd risk it all to get my hands on Luxion. Starting life over? If there's reincarnation, there could be loops, right? I can't guarantee that life will be the same again. When I said that, Luxion was silent for a few dozen seconds before saying, for Master, I, I found you, Leon. Before Luxion could finish speaking, a man's voice echoed in the cave. As I pick up my weapon and stand up, I see a figure invading the cave. I held up my rifle and lowered the muzzle when I saw the intruders. Why did you come here? I turned my gaze to Luxion and he turned away his red lens. The persistent conversation earlier must have been stalling for time. Julius approaches me. I've been looking for you. Marie is worried about you. Now, let's go home. He grabbed my arm and pulled, so I shook him off forcefully. Don't get in my way. I'm busy and won't be back for a while. In addition to Julius, Jilk, Greg, Chris, and Brad the five idiots are all here. Looking further back, I see my friends Daniel and Raymond. They're watching us from a distance. Julius gives me a serious look and tells me the current situation. The Empire has declared war. If we want peace, they say they want your head. I see. Then I can't go back. The kingdom is making noises about executing me anyway, isn't it? Who would go back to that heartless country? I have no intention of going back to the place where the trouble is happening. I gesture for Julius and the others to go home, but five of them glare at me. I've heard the circumstances. Why didn't you rely on us? I was momentarily surprised by Julius' words but then I burst out laughing. Why would I rely on you? You've caused me so much trouble, did you think that I would rely on you? I mock them and Greg comes to my side and grabs me by the chest. Greg, a muscular idiot, is quite powerful when seen up close. Until now, you've been relying on us, haven't you? I push Greg away and now Chris grabs my arm. That's enough. Marie was worried about you. Because there will be no more financial supporters, right? Do you think Marie is that kind of woman? Yes, I do. Because she's been bowing her head to me to pay for your living expenses. This time, I shove Chris away, and Brad and Jilk both hold me down. You seem to be in a bad mood. Are you getting any rest? You should take a bath too. As it is, you can't go out in front of the ladies. I was angry at both of them for worrying about me. So I forcefully shake them off and I tell the five of them. Go home already. Your small fry help is a nuisance. I extinguish the bonfire, collect my belongings and try to return to Einhorn. Then something was thrown at me. I stopped moving and slowly turned around Julius had taken off his left glove and was throwing it at me. He points to a glove that fell to the ground. Pick it up, Leon. We challenge you to a duel. Chapter 15 Duel of Five Against One 
When Ange comes to the royal palace, she is approached by a woman. Her name is Claris F.I.A. Attlee. She is the daughter of Count Attlee, a school alumnus who also has a close relationship with Ange. As she comes up beside Ange, who is walking down the hallway at a brisk pace, she converses with her in a friendly manner. It's been a while, Angelica. It seems you've made a lot of allies. Is your purpose for coming to the palace to usurp the throne? Ange was calm in the face of Clarice's dangerous remarks. She turns her gaze only to Clarice, but does not stop her feet. I'm going to see the queen now. If you have no other business, you'd better go away. The palace will be noisy. Sorry, but I'm helping Otosama with his work right now. This is my workplace. At this timing? What are you thinking? I wonder. More importantly, how is Leon Quinn doing? At Clarissa's implied tone, Ange narrowed her gaze and expressed her displeasure. What does that mean? No deep meaning. The queen is waiting. After saying so, Clarice leaves Ange. When Ange came to the front of the queen's room, the guards who saw her face saluted her and then opened the door. It looks like Mylene is really waiting for her. Excuse me. Mylene is in her room her office, processing a large amount of paperwork. When Ange came, she stopped her hand, exhaled a breath, and smiled. When the door is closed, Mylene speaks. After all this time, you're moving so aggressively. Do you want this country now? To Mylene's frank question, Ange replies without hesitation. Yes. That's why I came. You really have some nerve coming in here all by yourself. Mylene giggles when she sees Ange, but suddenly her expression tightens. Do you know what the Empire wants? It's Leon's head. They also want us to become a vassal state. There are so many detailed conditions, it's sickening. Are you going to fight, then? Asked by Ange, Mylene says calmly. It's impossible. The kingdom is so exhausted now that it would collapse immediately if there was a war. There is a movement to sell Leon to the Empire to ensure their safety. Give me a list of traitors later. To the imposing Ange, Mylene asks a mean question. You act like a queen. No, is it Her Majesty the Queen? Are you going to replace his unreliability and become king yourself? Ange gives a provocative smile at the question. If Leon desires, I will make that dream come true. But even though I look like this, I yearn to be in a position to support my husband. I don't want to do anything that Leon doesn't want to do. Mylene is about to say something, shakes her head, and then returns to the subject. I'm working on the list. I'll have it ready for you later. I appreciate it. When the conversation comes to a close, Ange says to Mylene, nonchalantly, Ask King Roland to abdicate. Hearing that, Mylene is not upset, but rather bewildered in front of Ange. You are forcing His Majesty to abdicate. Are we, the royal family, to be executed as a demonstration? Please do not tease me. I ask you to abdicate the throne peacefully. I assure your safety and that of the other royals as well. Hearing Ange's decision, Mylene's eyes narrowed and her face turned into that of a statesman. You are not being ruthless enough. If you let us royalty go unchecked, we will become a problem later on. Maybe some of the nobles will start supporting us and become independent. Some nobles will declare their independence, saying they will not recognize the new king. Ange had expected it, but she didn't care. If they could pick a fight with Leon and win, that would be one way. Hearing Ange's reply, Mylene looks a little envious. However, she seemed somewhat pleased with her daughter's growth. She is pleased that the apprentice girl she once took care of has come back as a fine young woman. I am happy that you have grown up splendidly. My decision to make you my successor was not a mistake. Well, the result was a mistake, though. With her engagement to Julius, it was decided that Ange would become the future queen. For that reason, Mylene has also raised her with care, but it was ruined by her son, Julius. She seems to regret that. I have grown so much because I am by Leon's side. Mylene Sama, 
Thank you so much for all you have done for me. Mylene says to Ange, who bows her head. It's too early to say thank you. There are still others who are more formidable than I am. His Majesty is waiting for you in the audience chamber. An audience chamber? It was as if he was waiting for her to come. When I go out of the cave, Daniel and Raymond talk to me. Leon, what's wrong? Why don't you come to the school? It's not like you. Besides, the Empire is coming to wage war. Without Leon, we're all in trouble. They talk to me and I ask them why they are here. Are you guys the ones who brought those five? Daniel's gaze wandered as I glared at him. Aye, aye, they asked us to take the airship out. They said they were going to pick you up, and I said, okay, then. More importantly, why the hell are you dueling? Turning around, those five people also come out of the cave. I say it as if I'm going to spit it out. I don't know. Look, stay away or you'll get caught in it. The two of them disappear into the forest while worrying about me. As I watch them, I complain to Luxion. The rain hasn't stopped. I can't count on your weather forecast. Not much time has passed. It's within acceptable limits. He's a partner who doesn't talk less. In the rain, the five who came before me lined up side by side. I check the rules. Apparently you haven't learned anything since first grade. You can't even learn how to challenge me to a duel with armor? The five came to me with the same conditions as when I became the representative of the duel to save Ange the same situation as that time. Julius looks at me and looks somewhat sad. If we win, we will take you back to the royal capital. I, who was not going to lose, told them the terms in case of my victory. If I win, you guys can go back to the royal capital and play with Marie quietly. You can rest assured. I'll give you an allowance, so you can play for a while. Julius laughed at my joke. That's good. Win or lose, there is only benefit. The way Julius said it so clearly in the rain made me think that as expected from a beautiful prince. Jealousy welled up in me or not. In the first place, jealousy towards handsome guys is communication among friends. I'm going to beat you to a pulp over that not-so-handsome face of yours. Lux Ion, bring out arrogance. Still, the only thing that came out of my mouth was words that sounded like a little jealousy. Understood. When Lux Ion replied, arrogance slowly descended from above, perhaps on standby beforehand. Aragans, who lands on the rain-soaked, muddy ground, is more massive in physique than before. It is the result of Luxion's continued improvements in anticipation of the battle with Arcadia. I convince the five idiots to back down in front of Aragans. Aragans of today are not the Aragans you know. I beat you guys to a pulp in the first year, remember? You shouldn't expect the same performance as then. When I said something that intentionally scratched old wounds, Chris took off his glasses. I've seen it up close and I understand it. I'm glad to see that your strength is improving. I was angry at his tough attitude. If they had just backed off, there would have been less trouble. So? Where is your armor? Don't tell me you're not prepared even though you've asked for a duel. As I was thinking that such a development was possible, five armors came down from the sky. At the sight of the familiar armor, I open my eyes and look at Luxion. Did you bring in their armor? These five aircraft have also been refurbished. Luxion, what are you thinking? It was Master who accepted the duel. Since your opponent did not have armor, I prepared it. What are you thinking? It's impossible for these guys to beat me. To begin with, the performance of Aragans has been pushed to its limits. Because I was the one who wanted to be strong enough to fight the perfect magic knight. As a result, it has been difficult for me to maneuver, but I have covered that with training and drugs. If I don't do that, I won't be able to use Aragans now. When I look at Julius and the others, they are getting into the armor that came down. All of them are armors prepared by Luxion. Armors that five idiots have ridden in and supported me many times. Joke looks at me and smiles. I appreciate your kindness. Saying so, 
he closed the cockpit hatch. The green armor, which had been standing on its knees, slowly stood up. They all got in, stood up and waited for me. Julius, in his white armor, presses me to hurry up. Aren't you going to get in? I'll make you regret it. Somehow, Julius and the others are becoming increasingly irritated. Inside the cockpit. When the hatch is closed, a monitor is activated to show the surrounding scenery. The rain-soaked forests had the worst ground conditions. The surrounding area is overgrown with trees, making it difficult to move around. Luxon's figure is in place near my right shoulder. Why are you helping them? Have you forgotten the policy of not getting them involved? I haven't forgotten. If so. More importantly, Julius and the others are waiting. After letting out a sigh, I looked at the five armors on the screen. Looking at it this way reminds me of the first year dueling commotion. The coloring was the same, but the weapons were also made to resemble the original, so there was a resemblance. By appearance alone, it looks like it has grown, and in fact, if it were only armor, its performance would be adequate. Except the inside. Now, who do you want me to fight with? Brad giggles when I ask about who will be the first to get beat up by me. Oya? Oh, yeah. When did we ever challenge you to a one on one duel? Han? We were talking through an external mic, and they even moved their armor to match the conversation. I raise my eyebrows at his gesture of shaking his head. Chris, riding in blue armor, proudly declares. We will fight you with five against one. The fact that he says these pathetic lines with such bravado is disheartening. Don't you have any pride? As before, I try to provoke their pride to change the terms, but Greg's red armor points the finger at arrogance. You're strong. You're a strong person that I've recognized, so there's no problem. Don't be kidding, you bastards. As I pull my cheeks back, Joke now deliberately reminds me of my past words. I should have dealt with all five of them together I believe that's what Leon Kuhn once said, wasn't it? So you're saying I should fight with the five of you? Interrupting my conversation with Joke is Julius, who gives off the vibe that he doesn't seem to get the joke. It's to win against you. We will definitely take you home. It seems that further discussion is pointless. Everyone has their weapons ready, and I clutch the control stick. Try it, you idiots! Julius breaks out in a cold sweat before the strengthened arrogance. He could feel the spirit of Leon's anger spreading through his armor. Come seriously. Don't think we'll always be the same as we were back then. The truth is, he was scared. They know that the armor called Arrogance is a non-standard monster that exceeds their expectations. He has been by Leon's side and has been watching him for a long time. As Julius steps forward with his shield at the ready, Jilk's armor soars into the sky behind him. I'll cover the top. So you guys, when there is such a chance. Attacking the flying armor of Jilk was a group of small missiles fired from the backpack containers of Arrogance. It has a tracking function and follows Jilk around. Leon, watching Jilk on the run, was laughing like a villain. It's less powerful, but it hurts when it hits, so watch out. See, I'm going to launch some more of these. In an instant, Jilk's move is prevented, and now Greg and Chris's armor turns to the left and right of Arrogance to attack at the same time. Greg's thrusting spear strikes. Chris cuts straight down with a sword that swings down from overhead. If they attack on both sides at the same time, it is difficult to deal with them, even for Arrogance. That's what they thought, but Arrogance catches their attack with both of his arms. That's a performance I really hate. Then just keep attacking. Don't give Leon a chance to fight back, Greg. Sure. As the two attacked one after the other, Arrogance used the armored planks of his arms to block their attacks. Julius nodded slightly as Brad went around behind Arrogance. I don't expect it to be easy from the start. Brad. As he calls out, Brad's purple armor fires the spear that was mounted on his back. Six spears soared through the air and launched an optical weapon attack against Arrogance. The surface heats up and turns red, but since it is tuned for mock battles, it cannot do much damage to the airframe. 
Before they knew it, both Greg and Chris were backing away and avoiding each other's attacks. Brad says he's getting a better response. Even Aragans can't do anything against attacks from all sides, right? You should have checked the rules in advance, Leon. Leon laughed at Brad's words. Do you really think that you guys can do it and Aragans can't? Drones with firearms were then shot out of the container. A small, maneuverable type, it begins chasing around Spear, which can be controlled by Brad's remote control. Aragans, soon released from the concentrated bombardment, comes crashing down on Julius' armor as he holds up his shield. G-U-H! Julius' armor manages to hold its ground, but the difference in power pushes him back down. Using Julius' armor as a shield, Aragans was pushing through the forest. Trees are ripped down and paths are built through the forest. Did you seriously intend to beat me at this level? Mocking Leon's voice made Julius furious. We will never again play a match we can't win. That's what you taught me. As the white armor gradually increases in power, it attempts to resist Aragans. It's no use. You can't beat Aragans. If it was just me, I wouldn't win, but now I'm not alone. At that moment, Aragans was hit by a rifle from overhead. When a paint bullet hits the backpack container, it splashes green paint. Looking up at the sky, there was the figure of Jilk's armor holding a rifle in one hand despite being hit by a bullet. You let your guard down, Leon Kuen. Soon after, Jilk's armor, surrounded by drones, is attacked and an electronic voice informs everyone's cockpit of the situation. Jilk aircraft, judged to be incapable of continuing battle. It will cease to function. Slowly descending to the ground, Jilk's armor stopped moving as his aircraft locked up, preventing him from participating in the battle. Are you okay, Jilk? Julius calls out to him, and Jilk sounds frustrated. Earlier, he had shown some leeway, but apparently his true intentions were different. My apologies. I actually aimed for the head, but the damage assessment only allowed me to use one arm and I missed the target. No, thanks to you I was saved. Jilk was unable to fight, but instead succeeded in destroying the backpack containers of Aragans. When Aragans purges the backpack, the container falls to the ground. Aragans, container destroyed and purged. Leon does not seem to be satisfied with Luxian's decision. I don't think the last attack will destroy the entire contents of the containers. No, the container took a direct hit and was rendered unusable. It also had to be purged during the actual battle. Damn it! Seeing that Leon's attention has been diverted, Julius moves away from Aragans and readies his weapon. Now you can't use your weapon. Two cannons prepared on both shoulders fire when aimed at Aragans. When the shell was fired, it hit Aragans and caused an explosion. He had heard that the power level was controlled, but the explosion in front of him would have made a normal human being hesitate to attack next. But Julius keeps shooting. I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to push through. This is because he does not believe that an attack of this magnitude can destroy Aragans. In fact, it is only a flashy explosion and its power is low. Even if the bullet lands, it will only generate black smoke. He repeatedly pulled the trigger on the control stick, and each time he did so, an explosion occurred in front of him. The red light of the twin eyes shines through the smoke generated by the explosion. Is this still not good enough? When Julius said that, Aragans burst out of the smoke. If the current impact does not declare a functional shutdown, Luxion must have determined that the armor of Aragans can withstand the previous attack. Julius uses his shield to prevent Aragans from attacking him as he reaches out with his right hand. However, he immediately had a bad feeling about it and abandoned his shield and flew backward. Immediately after, the shield is blown away by Aragans. As Aragans slowly rises into the sky, it looks up to the heavens as if to shout. Don't get carried away, you small fry. At Leon's roar, Julius felt a cold sweat run down his cheeks. It's still four against one. It's not over, Leon. Every one of these guys really irritates me. What's so bad about me? Why don't you be quiet when I'm going to clean everything up for you? With the loss of the backpack containers, Aragans was limited to its arms as a means of attack. 
As Aragans soared into the sky, three of Brad's remaining spears attacked me. You're scurrying around like a fly. As I moved my eyes and watched Spears' movements, this time Greg and Chris's armor rose into the sky. Julius also moves up and closes in on Aragans. Greg and Chris come charging into Aragans, ready to take friendly fire. You got time to look elsewhere? Then I'll take you down myself. Greg's armor, with its spear, throws a series of sharp thrusts. I will not let the work of Jilk go to waste. Chris's armor, which comes at me with two swords in a two-fisted attack, unleashes one slash after another. Thanks to the constant barrage of strikes from both of them, I had Aragans in a defensive position. In the meantime, Julius' armor comes up and joins the attack. Matching Julius' armor with the sword in his right hand, Greg and Chris changed positions. What's the matter, Leon? I thought you were going to take us down easily. Only Jilk has fallen. Brad's armor, which was controlling the spear, was aiming at me from a short distance with a rifle. You can't run away anymore. We're going to push through and win. Aragans is surrounded and in a desperate situation but I don't think I'll lose. Don't make me say it again, Brad, you're losers for life. Looking into his eyes, he moves the control stick in small movements and adjusts the foot pedals by millimeters. Aragans forcefully extended his arm and caught Chris's armor and threw it directly at Greg. You wa. Chris, quickly get back on your feet. Just as the two machines collided in midair, Aragans grabbed them with both hands. This is the end. Impact. Just declaring, Aragans didn't actually release the impact. However, Luxian's judgment soon comes in. Greg and Chris, both confirmed flight function was damaged. They're going to fall to the ground. Fall to the ground together. Brad's armor held up his rifle and aimed at Aragans. If so, I'll just be the shooter. Brad's armor sniped at me with a rifle, but unlike Jilk, his aim was not as good. Also, with the container detached, Aragans is lighter. Until now, without the containers, it has been slowing down and moving sluggishly, but it has now been refurbished to achieve a reasonable speed. Dodging bullets, I headed toward Brad. Julius chases after Aragans, but he has already shot out his cannon shells, so he has lost his long-range means of attack. Run, Brad! Brad was told by Julius to run away, but he seemed to have naively thought that he could turn the tables by hitting me with even a single shot with his rifle. I'm going to take down Leon. I promised I would bring him home. Brad shoots while flying around, but his movements are not as good as Jilk's. You should have run away, Brad. Aragans catches up and grabs Brad's armor with both hands. As it is, I pull the trigger on the control stick, and Luxion makes the decision. Brad's machine is unable to fight. I was so close. I hear Brad's frustration with the outcome and I abuse him in the cockpit. One against five like this? That leaves only one man left, Prince Sama. When I turned around, I saw Julius' armor holding a sword with both hands. The cannon on his back is perched, and the lighter armor of Julius is slashing at me. Still, I, I can't lose to you. You should have realized that by now. Your armor was hastily made by Luxion. It's not custom-made like Aragans. Don't underestimate the difference in performance. A large gap in performance exists between the armor of Aragans and the armor of the Five Idiots. Aragans was overwhelmingly superior in performance. The 1-5 to five situation was somewhat unfavorable, but still strong enough to win. When Aragans strikes Julius' armor with his fist, the sword prevents it. However, the sword that was hit had taken more damage. The blade cracks and falls to pieces. Now surrender. Or will you use your position as a prince to command me? Please lose to me try say it. He would never admit it when told, but Julius doesn't seem to have thought about it from the beginning either. It reminds me of the first year. Han? At the time, we never imagined we'd lose to you. Because of that, you humiliated yourselves in front of the public. You people are the ones who never really grow up. G-U-H. Aragon's fist struck Julius' armor head, knocking him to the ground. 
Since Luxion does not tell me that it is going to stop functioning, I go down to the ground with arrogance. Julius' tattered armor was barely standing on the ground. I think we already have a winner here. Give up. You can't beat me forever. Just go home and wait until the war is over with Marie. When I say that, Julius becomes furious. Don't be kidding. I've been hearing that for a while now. Who do you think you are? I guess they are angry at my high and mighty attitude. If they are outraged because I act that way, I can call it a success. I'm a grand duke now. You're holding your head high, prince with no rights to succession. I let arrogance spread its hands and showed them that I could take him down at any time and that I could afford to do so. I'm not talking about positions. You are going to fight the Empire alone, aren't you? You're right. Cause you guys are just slowing me down. Julius seems to have some thoughts about my words. Indeed, we are unreliable. But we want to help you. It pisses me off. There is also the reason because Marie asked us to help you, but we want to help you. It is repugnant. You don't have to carry it all by yourself. We will also fight for you. I'm so angry at you guys. Before I knew it, Arrogance was quickly approaching Julius' armor. As it is, he raises his right fist and swings it down with all his might. Julius' armor, which was blown away, slammed into a tree behind him and sat down. What are you going to do for me? You can only say that when you're stronger than me. You guys are really in the way. You're always causing me trouble. I can't even spare the time to do this. Why can't they leave me alone when every second matters? Julius' armor still stands up and walks toward me. Marie has bowed her head to us crying for you. Before I knew it, my eyes were wide open. What does it matter that my little sister cried? Why does my chest ache as if it were tightening, even though I think so? What's wrong with that? Because if the financial resources are gone, there will be trouble, right? Marie shed tears for you. I will not allow anyone to deny that not even you. Julius' armor comes in front of arrogance. So, fighting for the woman you love? You really are a bunch of happy-go-lucky people. Go down and be comforted by your beloved Marie. It was the moment when Aragans was about to slam his fist into Julius' armor. With a clunk, the aircraft receives a strange shock. Something dragging my feet? I quickly checked my feet and there they were, Greg and Chris in armor. Each of them clings to both legs of Aragans. Come to think of it, it hasn't been announced that they're no longer capable of operating. After clenching my back teeth, I punched Greg and Chris in their armor. You're pathetic. Did you think you could beat Aragans with only five of you? Your vision is shallow. No matter how many beatings he takes, Greg's armor never lets go. I've been listening to you for a while now and you're just saying Aragans, Aragans, shut up. You're not even a little bit proud of yourself because you realize that you're losing to us? I was furious with Greg for agitating me. I understand that best. Chris had thrown the sword he was holding to Julia's feet. You went silent, huh? I think we hit the mark, Greg. You're getting pretty good at talking, too. I envy you, because I'm not a very good talker. Ha! I'll take that as a compliment. They are getting excited, ignoring me. But in the end, it's pointless. Is that all you want to say? Arrogance grabbed each of the two machines and then went on to generate an impact shockwave that stunned them both. I threw the two machines I lifted, and in the meantime, Julius picked up Chris's sword and held it ready. You two are right. I am not strong. It's Luxion and Aragans that are strong. But what's the point? You are down and I am standing I am the winner. I should have won, but I'm not happy at all today. I realize the reasons why I'm not having fun, and why I'm so frustrated. Because these guys challenged me to a duel. To be precise, it's for Marie, but there must be a slight desire to bring me back. The reason for my irritation is that they hit the bull's eye. If I hadn't gotten Luxion, Livia might have gotten him and built a peaceful world. 
It's only a possibility, but it would have been a much better future than if I am the one who gets him. In the end, I didn't deserve Luxion either. As I stand there, Julius is laughing. You feel like you've won, even though it's not over yet? By the way, you are so gloomy. If it was you before, you'd have opened your mouth to Greg's taunts and retorted ten times over. Shut up. I didn't know that your complex was that you couldn't beat us in bear combat. From now on, I will fight you without armor, but in the flesh. You're the one who will be crawling on the ground, Leon. Shut up. When someone tells you to shut up, do you just go along with it? You're the one who takes advantage of them when they show weakness, aren't you? You're the one who broke their hearts and made it impossible for them to get back up again. Who do you really think you're doing this for? Aragans took a big step forward and stretched out his hand to Julius' armor. But something is fired from all sides. They were connected by wires and restrained Aragans. Aragans loses his position and slips and falls in the mud. What happened? A quick check of the surroundings revealed four people exiting the cockpit and holding bow guns at the ready. They are getting out of their armor and coming out to the duel in the flesh. All four of them must have known that this was a dangerous act, but they went outside to restrain Aragans, even if only slightly. But this is against the rules. They're acting so cowardly. Lux Ion, they got foul play, so they lost. It is not acceptable, ha. Huh? There is no rule in the rules of dueling that says you must not go out and fight in the flesh. Therefore, this duel will continue. I'm finally convinced by Luxion's behavior, which doesn't accept my statement. Now that I think about it, you're not cooperating, are you betraying me? You're the one who told them about this place. Do you have time for chit-chat? Looking ahead, Julius' armor swung down on his sword. As the impact is felt on Aragans, Luxion warns. If it were a real battle, the current attack would have caused negligible damage to Aragans. I will downgrade the performance. Aragans' power decreases and his movements become slower. No way I'll lose on this level. Aragans rips the wires apart and strikes Julius' armor. The sword he received from Chris was shattered as I caught it. Julius' armor slammed his fist into Aragans, and the impact shook the cockpit. We have trained over and over again to beat you. We've had a different amount of time to prepare than you. I am honestly impressed by the five idiots who made up for the difference in performance by working together. Use your time wisely, idiot. It was a very meaningful time. As it is, Aragans and Julius' armor begin a fistfight. Unable to settle due to lack of power, Julius' armor is in tatters. But Julius does not fall down. You've been complaining for a while now. What are you guys dissatisfied with? Aragans kicked up Julius' armor. Ha! I'm dissatisfied with everything. I hate you for being so high and mighty and looking like you know everything. When Julius's armor hit with his left arm, it was defeated by Aragans armor and shattered. It's you guys who don't know anything. Aragans grabbed the right arm of Julius' armor and tried to tear it to shreds, but the lack of power only stretched the joint and destroyed it. You guys don't need to know anything. With his arms, Aragans destroys Julius' armor. I'll put an end to all this. You want to live happily with Marie, don't you? Then Aragans with both hands together raised and swung down on Julius's armor. You just have to shut up and be protected by me. I'll get it all done for you it's that simple, right? I adjust my disordered breathing in front of Julius' fallen down armor. Julius' machine has stopped functioning. That's the end of it. No, it's a tie. Han? It was the moment I thought it was over. A paint bullet hit the cockpit and turned Aragans green. Lux Ion makes the judgment. Since it was before Aragans was declared the winner, I consider the previous attack to be valid. Therefore, the result of this duel is a draw. D. Don't kidding me. At Luxion's decision, Aragans stopped moving, so the hatch opened and we went outside. In the forest, it seems that Jilk and the others brought out their armor rifles, aimed them manually, and fired them. For men carried rifles used by the armor, aimed and fired during the battle. 
How reckless do they have to be? The four of them sit on the ground, exhausted, looking at me with refreshing smiles. You idiot bastards. Why are you trying to beat me? Why are you trying to get yourself involved? Is it because Marie asked you to? Then stay by Marie's side. As I stand there in the rain, Julius crawls out of the cockpit and comes toward me. Leon, do you want to continue? Very well, Prince. I was hoping to beat the crap out of that not-so-handsome face of yours. I run out and punch him in the cheek, and Julius hits me back. Julius' fist hit my left cheek. What a coincidence. I wanted to punch you in the face too. You bastard who grills skewers. That's a compliment for me. After slamming a single hit into Julius' body, I grabbed him by the hair and slammed him with a knee kick to the abdomen. Training and drugs were having an effect. And yet, Julius keeps coming back. It is a power that I acquired after putting considerable strain on my body, albeit for a short period of time. And yet, I can't beat Julius? With my body slamming into Julius' waist, I slipped off my feet and into a hug. What the hell is wrong with you guys? All you do is get in my way, what's the fun in that? Julius doesn't answer my question, he throws me off and rolls me to the ground and mounds me. I immediately guarded my head with both hands to protect it, but Julius slammed his fists repeatedly with both hands. Who said anything about fun? We're just pissed at you. A.A., I see. You must hate me a lot. You're wrong. We wanted you to rely on us. When the blows stopped and I looked closely at Julia's face, he was crying. Tears mixed with rain fell down my cheeks. Not because Marie asked us to. Why didn't you ask for our help? We've helped you many times before. Why is this guy crying? Strangely, I felt calm and my mouth was moving before I thought. I don't want to get you guys involved. We're involved in this. You're the one who dragged us around and made us scratch and claw all over the place. Now don't say that. Jilk, Greg, Chris, Brad four guys were coming around us. They don't join in, they just look at us and cry. Jilk looked up at the sky and Greg held his eyes. Chris takes off his glasses and covers his face with his hand. Brad his nose was red and he was sniffling. I shake my head slowly. I know you guys don't like me either. That's why it must be annoying to be asked to follow me into a fight that could get you killed. Am I wrong? I knew they would refuse anyway. No, it's wrong. If possible, I didn't want them involved. I wanted these guys to stay by Marie's side. Julius grabs me by the chest. We consider you a friend. You're an irreplaceable friend. Whether you hate me or not, but I still think of you that way. So, rely on us please. The sun's rays were coming through the thick cloud-covered sky. Before I knew it, the rain had stopped and the skies were clearing. Did Luxion's weather forecast turn out to be right I've apparently become comfortable enough with my mind to think about such things absent-mindedly. I never thought I would see the day when even these guys would ask me to rely on them. But I feel somewhat better now. It was actually a one-on-six duel, but I felt that the burden on my heart had been lifted and lightened. The place where I was hit hurts, my body is a wreck, and anyway, I can say that the situation is the worst I've ever experienced. I found myself accepting the results of this duel. It's my loss now, I'll take it. Chapter 16 The Throne Royal Palace of the Kingdom of Horfolt. In the audience chamber, Roland was standing in front of his throne. Mylene stands in front of the queen's chair, neither of them wanting to take their seats. In close proximity to the Mar, Bernard F.I.A. Attlee, one of the ministers, and Fred, Roland's friend and personal doctor. Ange brings only her father, Vince, to the audience chamber. There were only six people in the large audience hall. Ange bowed to Roland on the higher seat and then approached him in a calm but powerful voice. Your Majesty, I ask you to abdicate the throne. All of those present are nervous at Ange's words. It is the same for Ange herself. Abdicate the throne in other words, give her the country. 
Roland is the first to get out of the tension, and he chuckles. I never thought it would be Angelica, not Julius or Jake, who would be demanding that I give up my throne. The arrangements had already been made. But if Roland refuses at this point, Ant will have no choice but to take forceful means. The soldiers of the Redgrave family were already waiting on the other side of the large door that led out of the audience chamber and in the passageway leading into the room. Vince is also here to show that the Redgrave family is on Ange's side. In front of Roland, Ange threatened, I have the power to drag you down. Since everything is known in advance, everyone, including Mylene, is not in a panic. But depending on Roland's response, there would be a dispute. In fact, there was even a commotion in the royal palace as soldiers from the Redgrave family came in. Depending on Roland's response, blood will be spilled. Minimize the bloodshed for Leon. For that reason, Ange will try to persuade him. After all this, there was no point in continuing the kingdom as it was now. Leon has also made up his mind. I ask your majesty to step down from the throne. It sounds like wishful speech, but what Ange wants to say is, Leon is serious, too, so there's no point in going against him. It is a forceful method that cannot be helped even if it is called usurpation. When everyone's eyes focused on Roland, the man himself seemed unconcerned. All right. In front of Roland who answered quickly, the people around him had indescribable expressions on their faces. Should he be considered gracious for not resisting, or should he be blamed for treating the throne so lightly? Each of them has a complicated look on their faces. The same goes for Ange. Is it okay for you to make such a quick and easy decision? Anno, more like perhaps sensing what Ange meant, Roland crosses his arms. I understand your desire to hear what I have to say, but as Angelica said, it can't be helped under the circumstances. Mylene has given me all the details. I don't care whether your story is true or not. All that matters is the fact that the Empire is serious about destroying the kingdom. There were some parts that he didn't agree with, but he said he would hand over the throne without making any trouble. Ange thanks him. Thank you for your wise decision. Umu. That said, let me ask you about my upcoming treatment. Not to mention the guarantee of my life, but you will take my treatment into consideration, won't you? Eh? Ah, yes. We won't execute his majesty, not to mention the royal family. But, although it will be inconvenient, we will ask you to live in hiding on a nice floating island. Roland was worried about his future, and Mylene looked dumbfounded. But this is where Roland really got serious. I guess it can't be helped. My presence could be a source of conflict. That being said, I suppose I can take my mistresses with me to the hiding place, right? Ange is upset by Roland's request. Mistresses? No, I don't know, so I can't say here are the documents. Eh? Minister Bernard hands several documents to Ange with a blank expression on his face. Looking closely, Minister Bernard had dark circles under his eyes. Did he stay up all night for the past few days? I prepared these documents all night at His Majesty's request. He really was a good-for-nothing bastard until the very end. Bernard cursed Roland expressionlessly. Ange's cheeks are drawn back as she looks over the documents. Women with whom he had a relationship and their children. Roland put his hands on his chest and his face was looking diagonally upwards. There are a few mistresses who follow me to the frontier, but I want to at least make those with whom I have relations happy. Many children also live in the city without knowing they have royal blood. Don't give those children any trouble. At this moment, Ange was forced to take care of the women who had been Roland's mistresses and their children. What is disgusting is the documents that Bernard handed over. The necessary documents for the transfer of the throne are ready, and this will ensure a smooth process of welcoming the new king. Ange is trembling, and Mylene looks at Roland like she's looking at trash. You've been spreading a lot of love around outside hearing Mylene's sarcasm, Roland was not frightened, but rather smiling. He puffs out his chest as if he truly believes that he has not done anything to be accused of. Don't worry. I have lied about my identity so as not to cause any trouble. None of the children know that they have royal blood in their veins. 
Fred, Roland's friend, covered his face with his hands before the sight of his friend. He can't stand to see his friend in such a pathetic state, and he feels guilty for having helped Roland to play. Just having hidden children is a big problem. Vince wrinkles his brow and clenches his hands. He had an unbearable look on his face when hearing about hidden children. I told him to stay out of trouble to that extent, but this good-for-nothing bastard something had happened in the past, and Vince suppressed his desire to be furious. Like Mylene, Ange looked at Roland as if she were looking at trash. As long as they have no unnecessary ambitions, I will be responsible for their protection. Your Majesty no, I don't know why I feel so irresistibly angry at the thought of having to take care of this. I wonder if Leon had these feelings too? Roland was relieved when Ange said she would guarantee it. I'm sorry. I didn't expect that kid would take care of my mistresses. Oops, tell that kid to keep his hands off them. Especially if he lays his hands on my daughters, I'll kill him. Tell him that. Mylene blurts out. Even though you've been messing around with other people's daughters for a long time. Everyone in the room had a variety of emotions directed at Roland, including anger and disappointment. In the midst of all this, Roland looks unconcerned. If anything, he even shows a sense of enjoyment, which makes those around him even more annoyed. He even takes advantage of this situation to tell Ange about a certain individual. Why don't I just tell you about him? I'm sure he still has some connections that could be of use to you guys. You can use him to your advantage. Well, I'm finally free of this troublesome position. I can't imagine anyone wanting this position. Ange reprimands Roland, who says that the throne is just troublesome. It is not over yet. Even if your majesty approves, there will be nobles who will oppose it. In order to suppress them, we ask your majesty to cooperate with us until the matter is finished. Then Roland grinned. When he tosses a bundle of documents to her, she is surprised when she receives it. Are these the signatures of the nobles? When were they collected? There was a complete set of papers with a pledge to obey the new king. Roland shrugs his shoulders as if to say that he had a hard time. Do you think I didn't see this coming? I have always had a weakness for the nobles. I was able to play my trump card at the right moment. Now you have no obstacles. Roland started laughing, but the people around him had bitter looks on their faces. Mylene represents everyone's feelings. I wish you could have shown that competence regularly. Ange agrees and nods deeply. But her expression relaxed a bit when she saw a bunch of papers. With this, I can help Leon. The rest is. Only two people remained in the audience room, Roland and Mylene. Mylene is blatantly disgusted with Roland because there is nobody else's view of her. I wondered what you were sneaking around, were you preparing to give up the throne? You really are capable only at times like this. You must be so happy to have abdicated the throne that it makes you want to jump up and down, don't you? How does it feel to be free? Roland had his back turned to Mylene, who verbally criticized Roland. The person in question is standing in front of the window looking out. I could show you my dance right here and now. No, thank you. Are you sure about that? Depending on those kids, they may change their mind and send us to execution. Roland turned around to see the worried look on Mylene's face. I can assure you that's not going to happen. That boy is crazy about you. When someone is in a position of responsibility, their policies and opinions will change. No, they won't break their promises. Seeing Roland say this with his head down, Mylene might have wondered. You usually bicker with each other, but you trust him. I trust him. Roland raises his head and looks somewhere far away and says. Now only the boy can stand against the Empire. That boy will fight and risk his life for the kingdom until the very end. He's a complicated guy. He should have just run away by himself, but because he has a poor sense of responsibility, he always carries a heavy burden. Mylene crosses her arms as if to hug herself, then looks a little bitter. He's a clumsy kid. The corners of Roland's mouth turn up at the sight of her face, but he hides it with his hand. Anyway, 
I don't understand why someone would want to sit on a throne that's like a punishment game. Mylene let out a sigh. You really don't like being king, huh? Roland thinks about what happened after he ascended the throne and makes a disgusted face. I really hate it. It's refreshing to know I'll be quitting safely. Roland does not even try to hide his true feelings that he does not want to be a king. Then Roland mutters. That being said, I didn't think it would be Bart fault what's wrong? When Mylene tilts her head, Roland puts his back to her again and looks out the window. I just thought it was karma. What is karma of the Bart fault family? Mylene asked, but Roland did not answer until the end. Chapter 17 The Courageous One I was exhausted and was carried to Einhorn by borrowing their shoulders. The two people lending a hand are Daniel and Raymond. No one but Leon could have gotten into a fistfight with a prince. Daniel teases me, and I have a wry smile on my face, but the spot where I was hit hurts. They're all my henchmen, so it's okay. Perhaps amused by the statement henchmen, Raymond laughs. It's very Leon-like. But more importantly, we're going to war with the Empire, aren't we? There's a lot of commotion in the royal capital, but you can win, right, Leon? My smile fades and I look away as Raymond asks me anxiously, and I look ahead. They said they'd let you go if you turned me in, didn't they? Raymond shakes his head and says that choice is not possible. I heard that they're not going to let us go unless we agree to some humiliating terms. Even if we turned Leon in, apparently they wouldn't likely let us off the hook. Is the Empire being so brazen because they think they can win with Arcadia? When I have questions, Luxion answers them. They may have thought that they could destroy us in a war if we accepted their terms, or even if we didn't. Considering the difference in strength, the attitude of the Empire is understandable. Daniel asks, looking at me and Luxion alternately. With Leon, we won't lose, right? Do you need our help again? The two must have thought they would be called this time as well, since I had relied on my friends so many times. I hang my head. Sorry, but I can't say we'll definitely win this time. Daniel and Raymond said in unison, eh, and they were speechless. You don't have to participate. For once, I don't have the leeway to protect you. Don't worry, my big brother will take care of the maintenance of the airship and armor. There will be no penalty, so rest assured. Up until now, I've used my friends harshly under the guise of contracts, but for this one time, I can't get them involved. I asked the two stunned people. Nevertheless, I didn't know you guys were close to those five. I didn't think they would go to the trouble of taking out an airship and sending them to me. Raymond, who recovered quickly, answers. Ah, uh, yes. His Highness and the others asked us to do it. We were worried about you too, Leon. I'm sorry I got you involved in this. I'll put those five on the Einhorn, so you guys can go home first. When we arrive at the entrance to Einhorn, I go in alone. Daniel asks me with a straight face at the end. What's wrong with you? Usually you have more leeway and are more hateful, but why are you talking like you're going to lose today? You should be bolder, like you always have been. Before closing the door, I say goodbye to them with a wry smile. I'm sorry for everything I've done. Tell the others that I was apologizing to them. After entering Einhorn's ship, we were treated in the infirmary. Julius was the one with the worst injuries. I heard that he had pushed himself very hard against me and that his bones were cracked. Jilk. Be be more gentle. Jilk, helping with the treatment, smiled when he saw Julius in pain. I'd like to think it's my imagination that he makes a slightly sadistic face. Because you're being reckless. After the treatment, I was about to put on my jacket, but I was uncomfortable because Greg was giving me a fiery stare. What? I quickly put on my jacket and glared at Greg, and he let out a sigh. Your muscles are crying. You've done some pretty crazy stuff, right? I thought he was an idiot, but he seems to have figured out that I started using drugs to strengthen my body. It seems he was not just a muscle head. You can get blast results in a very short period of time. How's that, you envy me? I ain't interested. 
Greg looks angry at me as he turns his head away. Brad, his hands bandaged, shakes his head. I felt a little irritated. Your body is not beautiful. It's none of your business. The two of them are angry, apparently because I was reckless. Did they want me to consult with them? Chris, with a crack in the lens of his glasses, blames me for my choice. I understand that it was necessary, but if you push yourself too recklessly and collapse, there's no point. He shows understanding, but does not seem to be convinced. Luxion is managing it, so don't worry. When I said that, Luxion, who was helping me with the treatment at my side, was dumbfounded. I have told you many times that you have reached your limits, but Master did not listen. I feel like the normal Luxion is back. Sorry about that. Okay, so what do you guys want to do when you bring me back? Since I lost the duel, I will follow the instructions of Julius and the others, but what will I do when I return to the royal capital? If going back is not meaningful, it is a waste of time. After the treatment, Julius briefly explains what is happening in the royal capital. Your fiancés are on the move. I don't know how many allies they can gather, but they don't intend to let you fight the Empire alone. Ange and the others? I hope they don't do anything reckless or so I thought, as Julius glared at me. I told you not to make Angelica cry, didn't I? I don't want to be told by you. I have a feeling that I want to say something like that. But I was in no mood to argue now. I'm remorseful. So you want me to go back to the royal capital and join up with the allies? I'm not going to get ambushed, am I? When I divert the subject, Julius looks as if he wants to say something, but continues talking. No, it won't. The nobles are skeptical of the Empire's sudden declaration of war. Surprisingly calm, huh? I thought they were trying to get my head. Some of them may be, but it's because they can't read what the Empire is trying to do. If you explain to them that the ancient war wasn't over, few of them will believe you. Julius shrugs his shoulders and I hide my face with my hands in amazement. Did you hear from Marie? It was Jilk who answered. Yeah, she told us everything. That she was a reincarnated person Chris takes away Jilk's words. I heard that Leon was her big brother in a previous life. Why did you keep it a secret? Jilk is somewhat disgruntled, but he glares at me, as do the other four. To be honest, I was confused by Marie's actions. Did Marie tell you everything? What was that idiot thinking? Greg lets out a loud sigh as I pinch the tops of my eyes with my fingers. If you had told us from the beginning, we wouldn't have had any funny ideas. You're being too cold to remain silent about it. I look around at the faces of the five idiots and they all have a look of complete belief on their faces. Unbelievable. Did you really believe Marie's story? That's impossible, right? I shook my head and Brad laughed and wondered what was so funny. Impossible, he said. Is it really so strange that we believe Marie? From our point of view, it would be more dishonest for Leon not to tell the girls the truth. When I was stunned, Julius nodded deeply at Brad's words. Marie believed us and told us the truth. It is our role as lovers to respond to that feeling. Why don't you tell Angelica and the others? I start to have a weird laugh. Stupid, stupid, I thought, but these guys are real big idiots. Unlike you, gullible people, those three are sane and will not believe it. Five people had their cheeks drawn back at my words. Greg raises his voice. You're really a sarcastic guy. The other four people were also whining about how this guy has a really bad mouth. Greg turns his head away, and I look down and say this. My bad. I am grateful to you guys. When silence fell over the infirmary, the five of them looked terribly surprised. Brad shakes his head slowly from side to side. I can't believe that Leon would say thank you. You're making too much fuss over a thank you. I went back to my room, took my pills, and then lay down on my bed. I talked with Luxion, who was by my side until the sleeping pills took effect. You were the one who brought them here, weren't you? Yes. And by the way, 
I made a move that put Master at a disadvantage in the duel. Perhaps he felt a little sorry, the electronic voice sounded slightly apologetic. As it is, Lux Ion apologizes to me. My apologies. It's rare that you apologize so honestly. Is there anything else you're hiding from me? I try to trap him into confessing, but Lux Ion doesn't answer easily. What Master needs now are friends to fight along with rest. They can be counted on. I didn't think they were that strong. I couldn't beat Julius, even after taking the drug. Even if I was reckless, I couldn't win against the five idiots. I'm starting to feel pathetic. Julius was reckless in his efforts to stop Master. In terms of ability alone, it was Master who was winning. But Julius was winning on the mental side. I see. Sleepiness gradually attacks me. As I close my eyelids, Luxion tells me. Everyone tries to help Master. Master is a necessary existence in this world. I don't think so, though. You can't believe it? I'm the one who doesn't believe in myself the most. If it weren't for me, things wouldn't have turned out this way. I want to finish this quickly and make the world a peaceful place for them unable to resist sleepiness, I broke off my conversation with Luxion. Ange visited the principal's office at night. Sitting at his desk, tidying up his paperwork, is the headmaster of the school, Leon's mentor. In front of Ange, the mentor smiles. What can I do for you? School hours have passed and students are prohibited from entering the school building. The reason he doesn't blame her for that is that he knows what Ange came for. Ange has a look of astonishment and surprise. I keep being surprised today. I never realized that you are the younger brother of the previous king. The younger brother of the previous king for Roland, he would be his uncle. In other words, he is royalty. Ange mentions the mentor's name. Lucas Rafa Horfelt is officially a court nobleman of the second lowest rank, with the rank of duke. If it's been erased from the record, there's no way to find out. Among the noble lords, only two hold the title of duke, with the exception of Leon, who became a grand duke. One is Hertrud, but she is the acting duke. The other is Ange's family, Duke Redgrave. As a court nobleman, it was Lucas who held the title. Lucas's smile fades and he looks troubled. Apparently, he does not like the topic. Did His Majesty tell you? Even though I've given up my rank and my title. Ange puts her hands on the desk and brings her face closer to Lucas. I was told that you stepped down due to a succession dispute with the present His Majesty. But you changed your name and remained in the royal capital. Originally, you would have succeeded to the throne. Lucas lets out a sigh. Indeed, I was probably the closest to the throne at the time. His Majesty had been playing too much since he was young and was not well received by the nobles. I must have appeared to them as the more decent one in comparison. That's not true, is it? Chi Chiyui told me everything. He told me that the headmaster was the appropriate choice because of his character and abilities. You fled from the throne because you were tired of power struggles, right? He was tired of the power struggle and ran away such rumors were circulating at the time. Lucas denies it. I did run away, but for different reasons. Even if I had been king, I could not have changed this country. That is why I entrusted it to His Majesty, who has the potential to do so. And relays words from Roland. Don't run away this time, that's the message from His Majesty. He seems to hold a grudge against you. I forced the throne on His Majesty, who didn't like it. But now I am merely the head of an academy with no power. Ange does not believe Lucas when he says he has no power. His Majesty said. The old acquaintance still remains, and the power of the principal is not to be underestimated. Leon, who adores you, has made up his mind. Please lend us your strength. Lucas remained silent for a while as Ange was pressed against him. Then he lets out a small sigh and relaxes his expression. That's an exaggerated evaluation. You are a master that Leon recognizes. This time, I hope you won't run away. For my part, though, I want him to be a friend, not a disciple. 
With that said, Lucas gets up from his seat and his expression tightens. I have imposed my ideals on him as well, and he has suffered as much as his majesty. I guess it's time for me to take responsibility as an adult. Ange thanks Lucas for his determination. Thank you. I'm sure Leon will be pleased when you stand up. Lucas looked a little embarrassed. Let's use my contacts to help Mr. Leon. And how much cooperation can you get? How much strength can you gather? Ange answers this question. Unclear. But there will be results soon. Ange obtained cooperation from the faction centered around the Redgrave family and the royal family. The Redgrave family will lend their strength, but it is unknown how serious the nobles of the same faction will be. She continues to try to persuade them, but if they don't understand, they will only send the minimum amount of force. The royal family is exhausted compared to when it was in its heyday, so there are concerns about its strength as well. Lucas, too, was aware of this and braced himself. Everything is going to be from now on, isn't it? Chapter 18 The Fake Saint While the five idiots were on their way to find Leon, Marie had come to a certain place. Many people came to pray in the majestic building in the royal capital. The temple a religious institution supported by the majority in the kingdom of Horfolt. Climbing the long staircase of the temple, the main temple in the royal capital, when Marie approaches, the knights of the temple hold up the spears they were carrying. They are knights for the temple, and their lord and master to serve is the god and saint whom the temple worships. From their point of view, Marie, who had fooled them about the saint two years ago, was an abominable existence. What are you doing here, you scoundrel? We told you to stay away from this place. Seeing the two temple knights pointing their spears at her, the people around them begin to make a commotion. Marie didn't care and moved forward, but was blocked by the spears. Tell me to stop up. Marie grips each of the two spears and throws them both away with the strength of her muscles. Magic covered Marie's body. Marie is enveloped in a pale white light and goes straight into the building. The double doors were left open to receive those who came to pray. At the end of the hall was a beautiful white statue of a woman. Saint a polished white statue with golden decorations. She held a golden cane in her right hand and wore a bracelet on her left wrist. She even wears a necklace, and when Marie sees it, her eyes sharpen. Hearing the commotion, the temple knights gather and the priests also show up. The most high and mighty priest was a man so fat that he looked as if he could hardly walk. He is large and wears several rings with large jewels on his thick fingers. Although it seems worldly from Marie's point of view, there is no doctrine in the temple that values frugality. I will not allow the likes of you to enter the sacred place. Temple knights, I allow you to behead her. The other priests were puzzled by the words of the man who appeared to be the high priest. But the deal said she was to overlook that girl. We had also included a condition that she stay out of this place. She is the one who broke the agreement. Now, face the judgment of the saint. Temple knights approach Marie with weapons in their hands. However, Marie herself had no interest in them. What she is seeing is the saint's tools key items in that Otome game. I need your strength right now. If you have accepted me once then please lend me your strength for this time. She speaks to the statue of a saint who never responds. Obviously, the statue of the saint, who smiles lovingly, does not respond to Marie. The high priest snickers at Marie. What are you talking about? There is no way a saint will respond to the likes of you. Now, tear her to pieces. The temple knights, whose blood is rushing to their heads, try to slash at Marie. Marie does not move from her place, but reaches out her right hand to the statue of the saint. I need your strength to help my big brother. So quickly lend me your strength. What responded to the shouts were not statues of the saint, but the golden equipment. The saint's bracelet destroyed the statue's left arm and as it flew toward Marie it was attached to her left arm. The cane destroyed her right arm and flew right in front of Marie, piercing the floor. The necklace destroys the neck of the saint's statue, and when it flies to Marie, it is attached directly to her. The three equipment recognize Marie and repel all the oncoming blades of the temple knights. 
The Temple Knights, blown away by the shockwave generated around Marie, rides in pain as they slammed into pillars and walls. Marie reaches out with her right hand and grips the cane, then speaks to the equipment. Thank you. Help me one more time. This time, so I don't make a mistake. The situation is different from when she took the position of saint from Livia. Not for herself, but now for her older brother she needed the power of the saint for Leon's sake. The high priestess is trembling. How can the holy equipment recognize the fake? This can't be happening. It should not be. Ignoring the high priest, Marie looks at the temple knights rolling around her. They don't seem to be able to stand up because of the previous attack. Clutching the wand, Marie closes her eyes and uses the power of the saint. I'm sorry. I'm going to heal you now. As she said that, a warm white light was generated around Marie and covered the temple. By the time the light subsided, the temple knights were surprised to see the pain in their bodies disappear. A awesome. It doesn't hurt at all anymore. This is the first time I've ever seen such healing magic. Could it be that this person is really a saint? The way the temple knights looked at Marie was different from earlier. The priests were so startled that they could not speak, and the high priest even fell on his buttocks and pointed at Marie. He had a pale face. Could it be that you really are a Saint Sama? Marie grins and pulls her cane from the floor and puts it directly on her shoulder. That's right. Be hospitable now. Seeing the dignified behavior, the priests look at each other, sit down on the floor, and bow their heads. The temple knights knelt on one knee and bowed their heads. The high priest gets down on his knees in an awkward manner. Please forgive us. We thought you were a fake. W. We will welcome you with the treatment befitting a saint in a moment. In front of the trembling high priestess, Marie kicks down the good treatment. I don't need it. More importantly, there are books related to the saint kept here, right? Guide me there right away. The high priest looked up and was confused. The archives, is it? A saint can access it, but it's okay. Just show me the way. All right away. When Marie says it, the high priest hurriedly calls the female priests to guide Marie. Marie heads to the book storage, confident that she will finally get what she wants. I have the power of a saint in case of emergency. The books in the archives that he will be heading to are the books with special magic written in them by the saint. Legend has it that the saint used a number of magic tricks. Magic that can only be used with the qualities of a saint and the equipment of a saint. Marie was going to learn as much of that magic as she could. I will never lose my big brother again. Chapter 19 Assembling A fleet of flying battleships came near the royal capital. A single royal army flying battleship approaches the approaching fleet. The cannon could be fired at any time, and armor was coming out on the deck. Ready to fight at any time, they are wary of the affiliation of the fleet. The family crest of the Duke of Fano's family. What the hell do you people think you're doing? Why did you come so close to the royal capital? Hertrud on the bridge was fed up with the captain's voice, which was a mixture of impatience and anger. How many times have we had this exchange? She glanced at Livia, who was sitting on a seat provided for her. When she receives a microphone from a military member of the Fanos family, she responds with an external microphone. I am Livia, the fiancé of the Grand Duke Bartfault. They have my permission, so please let them go through. The Grand Dukes. The startled captain, perhaps forgetting to turn off his microphone, can be heard talking with his men. Apparently, the order was not conveyed properly. I mean, all we've heard is that Livia Sama is coming back? No problem. Please let us through. I I'll check it out. Stranded in front of the royal capital, Hertrude sighs. She must have gotten tired of this kind of exchange because it has been going on so many times. However, there is a reason for this. Two years ago, there was a war with the former principality Phanos, and the royal army is on guard due to the bitter experience of that time. That's quite a mess. It seems like we could destroy the royal capital by ourselves right now. Livia turns to face Hertrude, who makes a dangerous statement, and smiles. 
Her smile was gentle, very Livia-like, but to Hertrude, it seemed provocative. It's impossible because Lickhorn is there. Hertrude, assured by Livia, is not amused. Because she understands that it is true. I'm just saying. Era? Well, it looks like we're not the only guests. Hertrude's gaze turned to an unfamiliar fleet. It's probably flying battleships from another country. Looking at the family crest. The Republic of Arzal, isn't it? When Livia answered, Hertrude belatedly remembered. It's amazing that that country would send a fleet of ships. They must have their hands full just defending their own country now. Livia puts her fist to her chest. Thanks to Noel. She convinced the Republic of Arzal to join us. Livia was grateful to the Republic of Arzal for assigning their forces in a difficult situation. Hertrude raises the corners of her mouth. I don't think that's all it is. Eh? As Livia tilted her head, Hertrude didn't answer as payback for what she had just said. A room in the royal palace. Hearing that a representative from the Republic of Arzal had arrived, Noelle hurried into the room. She opened the door and went inside, and waiting for her was her twin sister, Lelia Jill Espinas. Unlike Noelle, she has silky hair that is all pink, pulled into a side ponytail on the left side, and green eyes. She is skinnier than Noelle, probably because she is busy every day as a priestess of the sacred tree. Noelle was breathing on her shoulder in front of a slightly emaciated Lelia. Lelia! When she calls his name, Lelia, who had been sitting on the sofa, stands up with a wry smile. Long time no see, Aniki. Noel hugs Lelia and sheds tears. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Lelia puts her hand around Noel's back, who is crying, and gently hugs her. Lelia was also a little teary. If we lose, it's the end for us, right? It's only natural that we lend our strength. I didn't expect you to come. If I don't come, we won't be able to control Emil. Eh? Surprised by the name Emil, the man sitting on the couch, looking a little uncomfortable, clears his throat and then explains. He's Albert Sarah Ralt. He is slender and tall, and wears a striped suit. He has sharp eyes, a well-groomed beard, and a somewhat tough-looking face. The sacred tree of the Republic is called Emil. It's loaded on the flagship. Like Noel and the others, they brought in the sacred tree. Alberg also talks about airships. They are the Republic's flying battleships, previously prepared by Ideal. They are few in number, but I can assure you of their performance. I'm sure you know what I mean. The fleet dispatched by the Republic of Arzal was the elite of the elite that should protect the home country. Although they are few in number, the presence of Alberg and Lelia shows the seriousness of the situation. Thank you so much. It's reassuring to have you both here. Now this will help Leon. That's what she thought, but Alberg and Lelia looked at each other and smiled wryly. When Noel tilts her head, Lelia tells her the situation. Aniki, we're not the only ones who came here. Anna Goo. In another room, meeting with Marie was Loic Lita Barrieri, in a white suit and white cloak. He has short red hair and bursts into tears as soon as he meets Marie. Loic, you came too. Marie hugs Loic and rubs his back. Wiping away tears, Loic speaks of the situation in the Republic. Of course I would run to Inigo when you are in a crisis. That huge bastard objected, but I beat him to silence him. There must have been a dispute within the Republic of Arzal when the fleet was dispatched. But when Loic says that he forced them to approve the dispatch, Marie smiles wryly. That's pretty extreme to do. But thank you. You really helped me out. I wouldn't mind doing this for Inigo. More than that, Inigo is somewhat more than Loic felt discomfort when he met with Marie for the first time in a long time. Marie stands up. My charms are improving, right? I'm still in the growth stage. Loic blushes when Marie winks at him. Yes. You were beautiful before, but now you are even more beautiful. I was kind of surprised because of the divine atmosphere. Marie's smile was momentarily shadowed by the honest Loic. 
but she soon regains her bright smile. Thank you. And I'm counting on you, too. You can count on me. I've been trained in real combat while Inigo has been away, too. The Republic is in the process of reconstruction and seems to be being attacked by sky pirates and other countries to take advantage of the opportunity. It was apparently the role of Loic and his team to deal with the incoming enemy. With his accumulated experience, Loic looked tougher than before. Then Loic turned his attention to his surroundings. Air? Those five people who usually interrupt me are not here? I wanted to say hello to the Grand Duke. I have some urgent matters to convey. Marie was wondering how to respond to Loic's reaction. But Loic comes up with the answer himself. He looked out the window and was convinced. Aye, hey, I see he just got back. It's been a long time since I've seen Einhorn. Marie immediately looked out the window and saw Einhorn in the distance. Those five guys brought Aniki back. I'm so glad. When I came to the royal palace, it was surprisingly Loic who greeted me. It's been a long time, hasn't it? Unlike when he was stalking Noel, Loic, with his nicer personality, smiles and waves to us. The five idiots who saw him turned grumpy all at once. Why are you here? Julius asked in a low voice, and Loic shrugged his shoulders. Is that how you treat a man from a friendly country who sent a fleet? I was seeing Inigo earlier, so I just thought I'd drop by and say hello. The fact that he was meeting with Marie made the expressions on the faces of the five idiots even more stern. Brad is closing in on Loic. I hope you didn't do something insolent to Marie. I won't be rude to Inigo. More importantly, there is something I should inform the Grand Duke. Ignoring Brad, Loic looked impatient when he looked at me. He looks strange for a greeting. To me? When I tilt my head back, Loic gives me an indescribable look. He seems to be choosing his words as his gaze wanders. Actually Louise is here. Louise San? This is the name of a woman I met in the Republic of Arzal. As I was feeling nostalgic, Loic continued. She was escorted to the room where she was to meet the Grand Duke herself. It's just well, how should I put it when Loic finds it hard to say, an annoyed joke interrupts him. We don't have time for this. I wish you would hurry up and tell him. Or is there some kind of problem? Loic gets annoyed at Jilk's sarcasm, but he prioritizes talking with me. There were other women in the room she was escorted to. The reaction of Loic, who is breaking out in a cold sweat, bothers me. Did they guide her to the wrong room? No, that's not the problem. I have received an order that all women wishing to meet the Grand Duke must go through that room. What's he trying to say? Unlike me, who can't understand, Julius and the others reacted strangely. Everyone is breaking out in a cold sweat. Julius looked at Greg. Oi, what do you think? What do you think, you ask, that is when Greg is at a loss for an answer, Chris and Brad also begin to discuss something. I have a bad feeling about this. I'm the same way. In the first place, this is Leon's problem, and it's not something we should interfere in. Then Jilk suggests to Julius. Your Highness, it seems that Leon Quinn's guests are waiting for him, so why don't we go separately? It would be rude to visit them together frankly, I don't want to get involved. In all likelihood, Clarice will be there as well. Jilk, who mentions the name of his former fiancé, Clarice Senpai, was somewhat unwell. Are these guys tired too? I let out a small sigh and urge five idiots to rest. You guys can go ahead and rest. Loic, show me the way. When I asked Loic to guide me, for some reason he turned his face away. No, I have an errand to do. I was refused, but if I want to be guided, I have Luxion, so it's not a problem. I look at Luxion. That's what happened. Can you tell which room Louise is in? Yes. Leave the guiding to me. Just, Luxion goes out of his way to ask me for confirmation. Are you sure you want to meet her? Can we postpone the meeting until later? I personally don't feel comfortable making Louise San wait. Since she had come all the way from the Republic of Arzal, I wanted to meet her. 
there's nothing wrong with that, right? Come on, let's go. Yes, master. Leon and Luxion leave to meet with Louise and the others. Watching his back, five idiots and Loic felt a sense of dependability in Leon. Greg is apologetic to Leon. Sorry, Leon. I, I can't be of any use to you. Comforting Greg was Jilk, who had a bad personality. But on this occasion, his bad personality is hidden. He was also sympathetic to Leon. We are powerless in these matters. Let's pray that Leon Kuen will be back safely. Julius watched Leon's figure walk away. His insensitivity is annoying, but at times like this, it's even reassuring. The five idiots and Loic were reassured by Leon, who was going to the room where the women were waiting for him without realizing what was going on. The men were praying that Leon, who would likely face scene of carnage, would return safely. On the way to the room I was having a conversation with Luxion. I knew the Republic of Arzal was here, but I didn't expect Loic to be with them. They have dispatched the Tiger flying battleships left behind by Ideal. Albert and Louise must have worked behind the scenes to get it. I appreciate that I didn't think I needed anyone's help. But it is very reassuring to know that there are people out there who are willing to help. There was also a fleet of Thanos. I see that the nobles of the kingdom have also dispatched their fleet. Bartfault family's flying battleships have also been confirmed. They will be angry later. My dad or big brother or both are probably here. I don't blame them for being mad at me, considering what I did. I won't complain if they hit me. Anyway, are Ange and the others in the room we're going to? No, that's when Luxion was unsure to answer, we came to the destination room and knocked. I heard a response from inside, so I opened the door and went inside. Era Era, I see you've been very reckless. Aren't you losing some weight? Inside the room was Clara's senpai. I heard you were missing, but I'm glad you're safe. The one with the fan open and covering her mouth is Deirdre Senpai. It doesn't surprise me that they are both in the room. The reason is that they are the daughters of the kingdom's nobles, so it is not surprising that they would be at the royal palace if they had business to attend to. However, the other two are unusual. As usual, you're getting yourself into a trouble. Long time no see, Louise San. Shall I call you Wunchen? She's Louise Sarah Ralt. With shoulder-length yellow blonde hair and purple eyes and a glamorous figure, she is Louise San, who took care of me in the Republic of Arzal. When I jokingly called her Wunchen, she blushed a little. As she walks up to me, she reaches out her right hand and touches my left cheek. If you can tell a joke, you seem to be doing okay. I'm glad you're doing well. Of course. I have so much energy that I could sell it. I don't think you have enough to sell. And you're still the same liar. As we are having a friendly conversation, Hertrud Zan interrupts the conversation. Do you mind if I get a minute? I need to talk to him. As I tilt my head back, Clara Senpai smiles at me. It must have been my imagination that the smile seemed to hide her true feelings. What a coincidence. I have something important to discuss with Leon Kuen, too. So I wonder why there are three insects intruding? As Claire Senpai's gaze swept over the other women, Deirdre Senpai closed her fan. I should have noticed when there were other people in this room. Angelica no, is this Mylene Sama's arrangement? What a mean thing to do. Why are Ange and Mylene San's names mentioned? Not understanding the current situation, Louise San speaks to me. Leon Kuen, when E. Sand has something to say to you, would you mind listening to it? Something to say? I glanced at Luxion, and he nodded, as if we still had time before our next appointment. I nodded, and Louise put her hands together. We sent a fleet to the kingdom of Horfolt, but our country is also quite reckless. So we can't convince Hughes and the opposition to come back unless we get something in return. Will you cooperate with us? Louise San, who looks down a little and pleads with an upward glance, seems to have become a more mature woman after not seeing her for a while. The Republic of Alzer seems to be doing something reckless to save the Kingdom of Horfolt. It is only natural for a country to demand compensation. 
I feel a little uncomfortable with Louise San telling the story. Even Hertrud San is jumping on board. Fano's family is the same way, we are being reckless. We can't just save the kingdom and that's the end of it. Their argument is valid. I look at Lux Ion and he talks about rewards instead. At present, we can provide platinum coins. If you have any other items you would like, Clara Senpai is the one who waits for me to say that I will personally prepare a reward. You can't just talk about it. This is a matter between countries, isn't it? It is not appropriate to discuss this with Leon Kuen. Deirdre Senpai agrees with her opinion. That's right. And when it comes to rewards, we come first. The nobles in the country are working hard for this matter, as well. Of course, the Roseblade family is doing its utmost to cooperate. Claire's senpai and Deirdre senpai's parents' house are also moving. So if I prioritize Louise San and Hertrud San, it's not interesting for them. As I think about it, Luxion whispers in my ear. Master, don't you think something is strange? What? Look at the four of them. When I turned my gaze to the four of them, they were facing each other and talking with a smile. Louise San and Clara's senpai. It's your own country's problem, isn't it? I think it's strange to ask for something in return. I don't think you are irrelevant either, do you? But if you say it's irrelevant, I wish the foreign princess would stay out of it. Deirdre Senpai and Hertrud San. Are you plotting to revive the principality? You'll have to wait and hope for a pardon from the new majesty after the war. I'll put in a good word for you. The Fanos family has moved on because you people are disappointing. The kingdom needs to show some sincerity. I looked at the four of them smiling and I understood. It's called nobility talk. They want to get paid more than anyone else. I am also a person who lives in an aristocratic society, so I can see that the smiles on the faces of the four of them are not sincere. I guess they're trying to convince me so they can get a bigger reward. Therefore, the four of them are keeping each other in check. I seem to have adapted to aristocratic society quite well to understand aristocratic conversation. Do you really think so? By the way, isn't this room a little cold? Yeah, that's right. It feels colder than it was in the hallway. Luxion informs me that the next business is coming up. It's taking longer than I expected. If this continues, it will interfere with our next appointment. I get it. I look at the four people who are still arguing and clap my hands to get their attention. The four of them turn to me, so I said this to end this conversation. I understand the situation. I will take responsibility for the reward. Then, Hertrud San smiles. Although her height and body shape should be the same as before, she has started to give off a much more mature impression. Is it the result of being a proxy duke and having been subjected to noble society? The way she was forced to grow up, even if she didn't want to, makes me feel a little sympathy for her. Will you take responsibility in your name? Can you write one? If that makes you feel better. I would have enjoyed spending some time reminiscing if I could, but I didn't have much time. I regret to leave, but I'll just sign the papers and leave the room. Claire's senpai seemed a little dissatisfied. Well, I guess it can't be helped. Deirdre senpai is smiling and covering her mouth with a fan. I'm kind of sorry about that. But I can't miss the chance. Louise San smiled when she saw my face. I think I'll be able to give you a good report to Otosama. That's good to hear. As Hertrud San began to prepare the documents here, the other three gave instructions about this and that. The finished content, in brief, reads, I promised that I would prepare what the four of them wanted on this occasion. It is written in more difficult words, but the general content is the same. Hertrud San nods. Well, it's better than a verbal agreement. I hope you don't break it later. After signing the papers, I say with a wry smile. So you don't trust me look, I signed it properly. I confirmed it. Well then, see you next time. Having said that, this was the end of my discussion with the four of them. When I arrived at the waiting room of the audience hall, no one had arrived yet. 
When I sit down on the chair, Luxion warns me about the matter from earlier. You should not have signed such an ambiguous contract. Well, it's unlikely that those four would have signed a contract that would have caused disasters later. The reason he did not intervene, despite his reluctance, was probably because he trusts the four of them. If it's going to be a problem, just throw it to Creer. Could it be you were planning to break the agreement from the beginning? It seems that Luxion has realized my true intentions. I feel sorry for them and make my excuses to Luxion. The odds of me making it back alive are slim, right? I'm sorry to be so deceitful, but I didn't want to offend anyone by saying I might die out there. There is no guarantee that I will return back alive. But I didn't want to create the atmosphere of a lifetime goodbye at that place. Is that why you signed the contract so easily? I didn't want to cause them anxiety there. I'm sorry to the four of them, but if I don't make it back then I'll let them call me a liar. If I have Luxion prepare some money for later and hand it over to them before I leave, will they forgive me? Just as the conversation ends, Ange bursts into the waiting room. Leon! Ange when I got up from my seat, I saw Ange standing there, wearing what looked like a red-dyed wedding dress. Her hair is set and her makeup is done. Her eyes were moist as she looked at me. She jumps into my chest with a face that looks like she's about to cry, and she presses her forehead against me just like that. I thought you would never come back. I was scared that I would never see you again. Sorry. Over and over again, you play with my heart. You're really the worst man. You can throw me away. When I said that, Ange looked up. She had tears in her eyes and a big smile on her face. I won't throw you away even if you don't like it. So don't throw me away. Anja's words bring tears to my eyes. I didn't want to see her crying face, so I hugged Ange. I didn't answer anything, but it seems that my feelings were conveyed to Ange. Ange continues to inform me of the current situation. I have gathered all the forces possible for your sake. Nobles and knights from all over the country, as well as military personnel, have come to the audience chamber. They are waiting for your words. I'm sure they'll complain. I wonder. But I've gone quite reckless to bring them all together. It's going to be heavy burden for Leon. Now is not too late. I don't feel good about wasting Ange's efforts by refusing to do so now. Besides, I'm out of options. It doesn't matter how much burden it is. If I make it back alive, I'll carry the whole burden, even if I have to whine about it. I don't mind. Are you sure? Because, you I felt like I could shoulder any hardship now. Because and she made such a move for this kind of me. It's okay. Thank you, Ange. Thank you so much. If you want to be thankful, tell Livia and Noel as well. Those two are the ones who got the Thanos family and the Republic moving. I'll definitely tell them. While we were still hugging each other, there was a knock on the door. Ange moves away from me. It's time. Go for it, Leon. I turned my back to Ange so that she wouldn't see my crying face and acted funny to make it look normal. I'm not good at being in front of large crowds and I'm not good at making speeches because I'm not a good talker don't laugh at me if I fail. If that's the way you're going, it looks like no problem. Ange was giggling. Luxion, who is next to me, starts saying unnecessary things. Shall I prepare the manuscript? It bothers me, but I'll stop this time. Why? At least, I want to convey it in my own words. I wanted to face the people who will fight with me from now on in my own way. When I came to the audience hall, it was packed with a large crowd. When I entered the room, I was ushered to the highest seat, and it was a strange feeling to see the venue, which had been buzzing with noise just a few minutes before, quiet down. I am concerned about Roland and Mylene San getting off their high seats and standing in line. When I spotted my mentor at their side, I calmed down a bit. Five idiots are also participating in the lineup, and Loic is nearby. Lelia and Alberg San were also present. The nobles are also lined up, waiting for my words it feels somewhat strange. I expected to hear a single curse word, but among them is Count Motley, who is looking at me with sparkling eyes. 
My dad and the others are in the back, nervously watching to make sure I don't make any mistakes. Moreover boys in school uniforms were also participating. Daniel and Raymond. I am a little surprised that a group of poor barons came to this place. When I finished looking around, I opened my mouth. When I heard there was going to be a formation ceremony, I came and found no one there I'm honestly relieved right now that it didn't come to that. I joked, but the audience room remained silent. For a moment I thought I had slipped, but everyone's faces were serious. I continue the story, thinking it has been swept under the rug. I will proceed on the assumption that you have heard about the situation. The holy magic empire of Voldanoa has declared war on the kingdom of Horfolt. I assure you that if we remain silent, they will surely destroy the kingdom. There is some information that I can't disclose, but it is a fact that the empire has waged war against the kingdom. After that, they came up with conditions that seemed like a recommendation to surrender. The nobles of the kingdom of Horfolt are probably outraged. The empire is powerful. They even have a trump card, and they want to destroy us. That's why I decided to fight, but to be honest, I would have preferred to see this country destroyed. The audience room was buzzing, but I continued talking without regard. I have been discouraged many times before. But what about today? Look out there, and you see a huge army of flying battleships. The audience hall is packed with people. Now that made me think that this country isn't going to be abandoned. I have always thought it was a bad country. And yet, it seems like a miracle that we were able to come together as one in this most difficult phase. Ange and others created this view. When I looked at Ange and the others, I also saw Livia and Noel. Marie is also nearby, but she has a saint's equipment. She was wearing a white one-piece dress and was surrounded by temple officials. I had heard that she had the temple's forces on her side, but apparently it was true. Normally I would curse and kick their asses. But this time is different. The empire is strong and I can't manage it alone. So I looked up at the ceiling once and then returned my gaze to everyone. Please lend me your strength. When I bow my head, the noise grows louder, mainly among the nobles. It doesn't have to be for me. Please do it for yourself for someone you want to protect. I guess they didn't expect me, who had been so arrogant and overbearing, to bow down to them. After the audience room has been buzzing for a while, Count Motley speaks up. Please raise your head. I devote my life to Leon Sama. Please use it as you wish. I raised my head and saw Count Motley, who had stepped out in front of me, kneeling down and lowering his head. Vincent, who was watching the scene, also spoke up. We are here because we have already made up our minds. Please don't underestimate us. Thanks to Count Motley and Vincent, the nobles begin to open their mouths. Yar yar, I didn't expect that Bartfault Sama would bow to us. You may or may not see it once in your lifetime, right? Just seeing this makes me think it's worth a part of it. Jokes are made and laughter spreads among the audience. Perhaps unable to see my surprise, my mentor steps forward to offer a helping hand. Let me correct you since you seem to have misunderstood. Mr. Leon, we are not in a position to be asked. Sure show? They all get down on one knee and bow their heads in front of me. And that Roland stepped forward and had a respectful attitude in front of me. Even Roland, the king, kneels before me. Leon Fo Bartfault Dano, please lend us your strength once again for the sake of the kingdom. This is the wish of all of us. That Roland was not joking, he was speaking for everyone. Everyone in the audience chamber bowed before me. They did not curse at me like this greenhorn, they did not order me to fight, they only asked me to help them. Even though I'm the one who should be asking for help. I want us to fight together, everyone here has wished for it. I appreciate it. I'm glad to have you fight alongside me. This is the only battle that we must win. Chapter 20 The Empire's Strongest Knight Near the Empire's territory, Arcadia was anchored near one of the floating islands. Normally, it should be over the imperial capital, which is located in the center of the continent, but circumstances forced it to move. The reason for that is... Buddy, they're coming back. 
one after another, they're a persistent bunch. The legacies of the old humans coming for Arcadia. This is because the artificial intelligences that have awakened attack them day and night. Artificial intelligence also varies, ranging from robots that seem to be only for work to huge flying battleships. Where did they come together, only this time, three flying battleships and a swarm of robots attacked them. Finn and Brave are the ones who are dealing with them. He deploys his magic armor to cut down the robots. How long have you been hiding? If you look at the robots, many of them have moss growing and some parts are missing. Even the flying battleships are not in perfect condition. The magic knights other than Finn are also participating actively to defeat them, and they are being destroyed one after the other. Buddy, the troublesome one's coming. A.A., I can see it. It was a fighter aircraft that looked like a missile that flew into such a battlefield. Powered by artificial intelligence, its weapon charges towards Arcadia. Kurosuk, let's go. Call me brave once in a while. The magic knights are passed one by one, and the enemy closes in on Arcadia. Finn, who is wearing brave, catches up with it, and swings a longsword in his right hand. I will protect the place where Mia is. As he said that, the cut-off fighter aircraft exploded. All right, now we just need to get the rest hmm, what's wrong? Their movement has changed, as Brave said that, there was a change in the artificial intelligences that had been aiming for Arcadia earlier. Unlike before, when they were just trying to attack, this time they seem to be keeping their distance and keeping an eye on the situation. Flying battleships have also launched sporadic attacks on Arcadia. Knowing that the defensive field will protect them, they start shooting optical weapons at the entire area instead of concentrating them in one place. The pressure is fading, but Brave judges the enemy's movements to be ominous. I have a bad feeling about this. Let's get this over with, buddy. A.A. What's up with these guys? They suddenly changed their movements. It's as if they're checking us out. When thorns appeared from both shoulders, lightning strikes were fired around them, causing a number of robots to explode. The flying battleship is also damaged, and the other magic knights follow and destroy it. Is it over? What's next? Finn, who remains vigilant even after he finishes defeating them, brave searches for the enemy. Looks like it's over. I was told to return from Arcadia as well. Arcadia? He turns around in the air and returns to Arcadia, where he talks to Brave along the way. If he told us to return, would that be a new order? He's gonna make us work hard. They're gathering the magic knights in the audience chamber. Apparently, they have a big announcement to make. Finn remembers and raises his eyebrows at what seems to be a major announcement. It's probably about invading the kingdom, right? No doubt about it. When he returned to Arcadia with the other magic knights, he went straight to the audience chamber, without removing his magic armor. When Finn and the others arrive, the other magic knights line up behind them. But only Finn walked close to the throne where the emperor sat. In doing so, Gunther looked at Finn with a bitter look on his face, but he did not care and stepped forward to the emperor. On the way, a newcomer, a magic knight, Reimer Lua Kirchner, looks at Finn and mutters. That's the first seat? Not as good as I thought he would be. He has short red hair and is a hot-blooded young knight he is Leanhardt's older brother. It is also rare that both siblings are magic knights. Reimer, who was talented and brilliant, had a quarrelsome attitude toward Finn. It was a beautiful young man, Hubert Luo Hein, with long black hair who warned Reimer of such a situation. A slender, tall, and graceful man, he has the air of a scholar rather than a knight. Don't judge him by his looks. Your little brother knows what he is capable of. When told that Leanhardt acknowledges him, Reimer is pissed off and turns his head away. My little brother had nothing to do with it. Hubert shrugs his shoulders. Finn stops, kneels down, and bows his head. I have come at your call, your imperial majesty. Behind Moritz, looking down from the high seat, was Arcadia, glaring at Finn and Brave. He looked reluctant, but he didn't complain because Mia was in the corner of the high seat. Finn is relieved to see that Mia is safe. 
Moritz's had a troubled look on his face in front of Finn. Well done for coming, Finn Ruta Herring the strongest knight in the empire, the first seat magic knight. The strongest knight in the empire that's Finn. In the empire, there is a hierarchy of magic knights. Being a magic knight with a seat was a sign of excellence. And the first seat is a position that can be held by the strongest knight representing the empire. Moritz was troubled in front of Finn, who hung his head. As you are all aware, the empire is now about to invade the kingdom. Arcadia whispers to Moritz, who is regretting his decision with his hand over his face. There is nothing to fear, your majesty. We will win. Yes, for sure. There is also the option to forgive with Bartfault's head. The terms we gave for peace were a mistake. What are you talking about now? There is no turning back now. Besides, are we just going to let the kingdom off the hook and abandon the people of the empire? W. We can't do that. Moritz knew, too, that this battle was a struggle for survival between the new and old humans. He is troubled by the fact that he knew. From now on, he will sacrifice many people to save the people of the empire. He may not think his decision is wrong, but he still seems hesitant. To Moritz, Arcadia whispers. It's not your fault. It's for the good of the empire. This is an important battle for the future of you, the descendants of the new humans. Let's destroy those in the kingdom together. I know. Finn had mixed feelings about Moritz, who was raising his voice. He is the person who killed Carl, whom he hates, but he sympathizes with him as he struggles with a situation that is out of his control. In the first place, there is no chance of winning against Arcadia. While everyone was unable to speak up, Mia was the only one who was different. Ayano! Moritz glares as a lovely voice echoes through the audience chamber. Not your place to speak, his face said. But Arcadia is different. Princess, what's wrong? Ignoring important moments, it prioritized Mia. Mia says with her head down. Do we really have to destroy them? I have friends in the kingdom. Something like this, I don't know how to say it Arcadia desperately tries to convince Mia, who is unable to put it into words. We cannot do anything about it, even if it is the wish of the princess. As we have explained many times, we too are deeply sorry. However, for the sake of so many lives please understand. Mia bursts into tears and, unable to bear it any longer, runs out of the audience chamber. Princess. You guys, go after the princess. After having the small magic creatures chase after Mia, Arcadia forcefully settles the situation. That is all. Your Majesty, this concludes the announcement to Magic Knights. Aa, yes. Seeing Arcadia's overprotective attitude toward Mia, Moritz raised his eyebrows. He is worried about betrayal because it prioritizes Mia over himself. Finn thinks. There is no guarantee that Moritz-sama will not assassinate Mia. If possible, I would like to protect her by her side. His position as the strongest in the empire makes it difficult for him to be Mia's personal knight. Finn's position was even more heavy because a war with the kingdom was about to begin. Epilogue Away from the territory of the kingdom the immigrant ship Luxion was waiting above the ocean. The view of the blue sky and small floating islands was magnificent, but when Leon stepped outside, there was something else to see. It's spectacular. Leon smiled at the sight before him, his hair disheveled in the wind. He is dressed roughly with a shirt and pants. What Leon sees is weapons equipped with artificial intelligence surrounding Luxion. The weapons, which were not stored like luxions, are mostly rusted, mossy, and unmaintained. From such weapons come small machine spheres similar to luxions. Leon was surrounded by them, and hundreds of spheres with one eye on him. The largest sphere among them had a diameter of one meter. First things first. I didn't expect the immigrant ship to be safe. The big spherical subunit machine, Facto, is an artificial intelligence that controls a broken, rusty flying aircraft carrier. It is represented among the assembled artificial intelligences because it has the highest processing ability. Leon had come to such a place to talk with this Facto. Nice to meet you. 
I'm Leon Faux Bartfault. I'm a reincarnated person. Thanks to that, I have the characteristics of the old humans in me. As Leon shows casual joke, the surrounding spheres begin scanning with a red light emitted from one eye. The act is protested by the Luxion subunit machine, which floats near Leon's right shoulder and protests the rudeness of the action. I have provided master's information in advance. Please do not do anything without permission. Luxion has a valid point, but Facto does not budge. I needed to make sure it was true. Are you doubting me? As Luxion silently moves the main body's stationary turrets and weapons, the other weapons in the surrounding area begin preparing for battle. Leon, who thought the negotiations would fall apart at this point, placed his hand on Luxion to make him stop. Don't pick a fight. These guys suspect Master of being a fake. If the misunderstanding is cleared up, that's fine. So, what was the result? As Leon waits for the results of the test with his hands on his hips, the spherical subunit machines surrounding Leon announce the results. Preliminary data is not false. Admitted, affirmative, I agree. Apparently, they recognized Leon. Leon himself was relieved. Then let's get to the point. I want to destroy Arcadia. You guys want the same thing, don't you? It was Facto, the representative, who answered Leon's question. I affirm, in that case, let's talk about the future. I want you all to be under my command. What Leon wanted were the old human weapons. In fact, they are artificial intelligences, but they have a big problem. It is a loss of chain of command. The old humans had perished and the chain of command was almost non-existent, so sporadic resistance to Arcadia continued. The crisis called Arcadia woke them up, but there is no old humans to give them orders. The artificial intelligences were launching an attack on Arcadia using only the authority they had. As a result, they were wasting their strength. Even if they wanted to cooperate, they didn't have the authority to do so. Still, they were unable to overlook the biggest crisis of all, Arcadia, and acted on their own judgment. Then Creer began to persuade them that the old humans were alive. Facto and others were gathered here to find out that information. I reject, it rejects Leon's suggestion. Leon must have been troubled by this, and he scratches his head and asks why. What are you dissatisfied with? Facto explains why it does not recognize Leon. It is the presence of Miss Erica. She who is closest to the old humans is the one who deserves to be our master. Under her, we can fight as one. They chose Erica over Leon because she has more of the characteristics of the old humans. They probably didn't consider anything else. On behalf of Leon, Luxion negotiates with Facto. Currently Erica, however, is in a cold sleep due to the effects of the magic element. She is also unfamiliar with combat. If you make her a master, as he explains why Erica is not suitable to be a master, Leon interrupts him. I'll take it from here. When Luxion reluctantly backs down, Leon tells Facto and the others about Erica. That girl has a part of her that thinks she would rather die than start a war. With Erica as your master, she might just give up on destroying Arcadia. Artificial intelligences start discussing. Miss Erica is not suited to be a master. It's fine if she exists as a symbol. If she is suffering from the effects of the magic element, she should be put to sleep. As the artificial intelligences continue to discuss the issue, Facto asks Leon. Do you really want to fight Arcadia? If I don't, a lot of kids that are going to be born will be in trouble. Someone has to do it, right? The possibility of destroying it is low. There is an option to escape with Luxion. He was told that he could just get on Luxion and run away, but Leon did not nod. A.A., running away is the right decision. I think fighting is wrong and not a rational decision. But if I run away, I'll never forgive myself ever again. I don't want that life. Hearing Leon's determination, all of the spheres flashed their single eye at once. It seems that the conclusion has been reached. At present, the most suitable master is Leon. Fighting is too much for Miss Erica. Master is Leon. 
Erica is the highest priority for protection. After listening to those opinions, Facto makes a decision with one big gleam in its eye. Understood. From now on, we recognize Leon as the master. From now on, we pledge to join forces under his command and cooperate with him to destroy Arcadia. The old human weapons came under Leon's command. Leon looks at Luxion. We've got a reliable ally on our side. Now, we need to get these guys fixed up first. Luxion, can you do it? No problem. When he is asked, Luxion takes on the maintenance of the allies who have joined him. But he was a little less convinced. Leon becomes the master of the weapons left behind by the old humans. That in itself is not a problem, but for Luxion it was a little lonely. This is because he is no longer the sole master of himself and Creer, but is now in a position of having a large number of artificial intelligences following him. Leon says. Sorry to drag you into this, Luxion. No, it's not a problem. That is master's order. But it's not all bad. After all, you can accomplish your original purpose, right? My purpose? You could fight for the old humans, right? That's what you wanted. I can't let you destroy the new humans, though. Saying so, Leon laughed. My purpose my wish is. A floating island that was once the territory of Leon. In that underground dock, weapons equipped with artificial intelligence, a lost item, were coming one after another. Luxion is even rushing out to Creer to do maintenance. The working robots were moving around busily. Luxion, who was watching the situation, was approached by Creer. If you're free, I'd love to have your help. Luxion responds after a few seconds' delay. I'm not playing around. I'm directing them to improve the maintenance efficiency. Luxion looked dissatisfied. Now that we have more comrades, you can leave it to them. I'll leave it to you as soon as it's done and return to royal capital. Why don't you hand over the work to someone else? Since there are artificial intelligences that have been accepted, she suggests that less important tasks should be given to others. I am the one who prepared this facility. You want to say you understand best? That's good, but are you sure you don't want to be by master's side? He is in royal capital now, right? It is more important to be on Leon's side than to be here. Luxion did not move even when Creer told him so. Not only that, he starts making excuses. I need to refurbish the armor of those five guys. I also need to prepare weapons to be supplied to the royal army. I also want to mass-produce as many of the new flying battleships as possible. It was true that he was busy preparing to fight the Empire's army. But it is a job that does not have to be done by Luxion. Creer begins to suspect Luxion. You've been acting strange lately. I've been getting reports that you've been keeping some of the information from Facto and the others. Are you sure you're not malfunctioning? This time, Luxion had repeatedly disobeyed Leon's orders. Not only that, but when he was trying to persuade Facto and others he kept some of the information from them. In response to Creer's point, Luxion replies. The objective of Facto and the others is the destruction of Arcadia. For this purpose, they will tolerate even if Master has to be sacrificed. They believe that as long as Erica is there, the old humans will be revived. You don't want Master to die, do you? Facto and the others asked me to hand over Master's genes. Oh my. Since Leon could have lost his life in battle, they decided that it would be a good idea to leave his genes behind. It was reasonable, but it was unacceptable to Luxion. Although Creer is somewhat dissatisfied, there are aspects that she accepts. But it's necessary. In the first place, Master is not thinking of coming back alive at this point. That's why I'm preparing for Master. They can't be trusted. A moment of silence passes between the two of them, but suddenly Creer says something strange. Could it be that you are jealous? Are you showing that you can contribute more to Master? Wrong. Luxion answered immediately, but Creer didn't seem to care. Either way is fine but I think it is better for you to be on the side of Master. Anyway, 
I'll do my best for the old humans. If they win, there is a possibility that the old humans will be revived. Creer is placing great importance on the revival of the old humans. Lux Ion mutters. Creer, what I really wanted to protect was not the old humans. Creer was silent for a few seconds, then asked Lux Ion to continue the subject. I wonder if you really have broken? Or maybe you, an immigrant ship, have another purpose? Why don't you tell me now? Lux Ion, built as an immigrant ship, might be hiding a secret that even Creer did not know about? Such a suspicion was raised. Lux Ion shakes his single eye to the side. Because there is no such thing as a secret as Creer thinks. I want to save the old humans and I hate the new humans too. Without Master, I would have destroyed several countries built by the descendants of the old humans. It was because of Leon that they were able to avoid the worst development. He had avoided the foolish act of destroying the descendants of the old humans by his own hand. Creer seems to realize this as well. Right. I'm grateful to Master. Master is a real life saver, isn't he? However, Lux Ion thinks. That Leon would not have wanted to be a savior. If we destroy Arcadia, the old humans will be resurrected over a long period of time. And that would be our victory. It's a long-cherished wish. It motivates me. But what I really want to protect will be lost. When Creer hears what he really wants to protect, she makes a move as if to tilt her head. What's more important than the old humans? You, could it be? Creer arrived at the answer, but Lux Ion revealed his true feelings first. What I really want to protect is Master. Volume 12 SS Reminiscence Your Name this is a story from a time when the defeat of old humans was becoming more apparent. The mother planet had become uninhabitable due to repeated wars. The land floated and most of the flora and fauna disappeared. They have fought each other in a war of attrition, and yet the old humans were still defeated by the new humans. One of the reasons for the defeat was the inability to adapt to the rapid changes in the environment. The new humans used magic to transform their bodies and adapt to the planet's environment. Even if the old humans were to win now, there would be nothing to be gained. In that case, it is necessary to prioritize survival before winning or losing. One of the research institutes of old humans. In the underground docks, construction of immigrant ships was proceeding at a rapid pace. The woman in charge looked up at the gray immigrant ship with her hands in the pockets of her white coat. The size of the huge immigrant ship is 700 meters. It was built with all the technology the old humans had. In many places, immigrant ships are being built just like here, but the woman believed that the one in front of her was the best of them all. Yes, my child is the most awesome after all. A man wearing a white coat was standing next to the woman who was muttering with satisfaction. He covers his mouth with his fist, coughs lightly, and then says to the woman, how many times have I heard you say that? Have you grown attached to it, by any chance? Is that bad? I'm sure this child will save a lot of people. Reports are coming in that immigrant ships are being built in various locations, but they are all hastily constructed and have not achieved satisfactory performance. The reason was that the ruling class was rushing to build it. They wanted to board the immigrant ship and escape as soon as possible. Only a few of the ruling class and their caretakers are able to escape into space. In order to evacuate them, a series of immigrant ships, built with great effort, have been launched one after another. The result there were many failures. In some cases, they were discovered and destroyed by new humans on their way up into space. In some cases, problems occurred after going out into space, and distress calls were received. Even if they are called for help, they are unable to provide rescue because they cannot afford it. Only a lucky few old humans can really be saved. The woman plays with her hair. Now there's no one to complain. I'll make it perfect. The man is stunned. I'd rather just finish it and get the hell off this planet, though. Koho the woman's eyes narrowed when she saw the man coughing, even though he didn't have a cold. You should wear a mask. We have air purifiers in this lab, but they don't completely block out the magic elements. 
For the old humans, the magic element is a poison, and it corrodes the body. The man shrugs his shoulders. Please don't mind me. I'd rather finish it as soon as possible. The immigrant ship is almost complete. The man asks the woman as he looks up at the immigrant ship. So, have you decided on a name yet? The woman responds confidently and proudly. It's a lision, meaning an ideal world. I am sure this child will take mankind to the utopia. He will protect us while moving. He will be the protector of us humans, and the ideal homework so she says it cutely, but the man was using a tablet to find out if it was possible to register using a lision. A negative boo sound comes from the tablet. It's already in use. It's a lie, isn't it? The man coughed and then laughed, covering his mouth. I'm sure everyone comes up with the same idea. If you don't mind overlapping with others, maybe a lision would be a good choice. Other than that there's Utopia, or Arcadia. Hearing that, the woman folds her arms and turns away. I don't like Arcadia. Isn't that their mother ship? It's already sunk, though. The man asked the angry woman. You seem to be very attached to this immigrant ship. The woman uncrosses her arms and puts her hands in her pockets. Because I want this child to help a lot of people. I don't want her to help some of the privileged, I want him to help those who are truly in need. People in need, huh? That sounds difficult. The privileged class won't allow it. The strategy that the higher-ups decided to use has ruined this planet. They ravaged each other and made the planet uninhabitable. Do you think it's acceptable that only they can escape? The man looks troubled by the right argument. That's criticism of the higher-ups. But are there any more people to blame? Previously, there were many people working in the research institute. But now there are much fewer people. It's the effect of the magic element. No matter how clean the air is, magic elements will enter the building. The old humans were in a situation where they would have perished if nothing had been done. The man lets out a sigh. Did you hear? Recently, other laboratories have created a subspecies adapted to the magic element. They are putting them into the battlefield. The woman nodded that she knew. It'll only buy them more time. Cold sleep has failed, and I hear some are seriously studying magic. When the magic is mentioned, the man tries to say something but his cough gets worse and he can't speak. Proceed with magical research to Gaho Ora, don't push yourself too hard. I'm fine here by myself, so you should rest. The man looks apologetic. I'll do that. I'm sorry. I guess I should wear a mask after all. Smiling painfully, the man walks out of the dock. The woman approached the control panel and checked the status of the immigrant ship. It's almost done. Then you can go on your journey. Save as many people as you can. And get the future of humanity. That's what I, as your creator, wish for you. The woman tried to give it a name, typed elision but stopped midway and retyping Luxion. She chuckles at her own spur-of-the-moment actions. This has a different meaning. She erases the name, then looks up at the immigrant ship. I have to think of your name too. As soon as she finished speaking, the woman suddenly started coughing. She takes the pills out of her pocket and hurriedly swallows them. The suffering woman quickly wiped her mouth. Her hand was smeared with blood. She also wipes the blood from the control panel. This is going to make that man worry. Do you have time to worry about other people? If he says that to me, I won't be able to say anything back to him. The woman could see her lifespan approaching. Even if the immigrant ship is completed, it won't be long. She guessed that she must not be able to ride her own child. In fact, it was doubtful that she would ever see the completion of the ship with her own eyes. I'm sorry. As your mother, I may not be able to see you finished. The suffering woman touches the control panel. People who need your help will surely come, so please protect them when they come. You are our hope and our utopia. An immigrant ship that has created an environment on board where humans can live. 
Indeed, in times like this, it would be a utopia for old humans. The woman does the last job. Once the instructions are given, the equipment should be able to complete the rest automatically. Now all we have to do is wait for it to be finished. How long do you think I'll live? The woman smiles as her body eases up, then wanders off the dock. Then a few days later. The two were sitting on a sofa in the break room, talking about trivial things. The man happily talks about the magic he is researching. Did you hear? The people who study magic say that the human soul is reincarnated repeatedly. That's an interesting story. The pale-faced man coughs and continues his story. They say that with magic, souls can regain their former memories. They want to resurrect the old humans from the soul's memories. That's not all. It's been shown that even if you don't evoke the soul's memories, you can still restore the civilization unconsciously. Amazing, isn't it? Whether he liked this kind of talk, the man didn't stop talking. The woman is stunned. It's an obvious study that's being pushed to the edge. It's not a cult anymore. Absolutely. The man then holds the woman's hand. The woman also squeezed his hand strongly, but the man's strength was weakened. Why don't you wear a mask? There are even protective clothing. Actually, the masks were hardly effective. Besides I wanted to see you with my naked eye, not through a protective suit. There was no point in me surviving alone. You're at your limit, aren't you? The woman's eyes widen in surprise, but she quickly returns to her normal face. So you knew you're using a very strong drug, aren't you? I was afraid you were going to collapse one day, but it seems I was the first one that went bad. The masks and protective clothing in the laboratory did not completely block the magic elements. Moreover, it is not possible to live a life wearing protective clothing all the time. It is necessary to take them off at some point, but the facilities at the institute cannot completely remove the magic elements. The man's eyelids were trembling. The story I just told you. When the environment on this planet is restored and the old humans can come back the souls will regain their memories. Are you still going to continue at a time like this? I'll definitely remember you, so let me propose to you. When the woman heard the man's words, she was surprised at first with her mouth open and then immediately burst out laughing. I, I hope you don't laugh. Don't expect the next life, propose to me now. I'll accept it any time that was a shame. I wasted so much of my time. The man had vacant eyes. He probably can hardly see anymore. I will surely remember you again. To meet you again. The woman puts her head on the man's shoulder. At that time, you should propose to me immediately. Aa, without fail definitely once the man takes a deep breath, the woman supports the man's body. She is also losing her sight. There's a lot of magic elements in here. The women's concern was the immigrant ship they had built. Will there be people who can get to this facility and board the immigrant ship? She hopes that as many people as possible will travel into space on board. How many people will ever make it to this institute? They have to go to that child and wake him up, the two of them, sitting on the sofa, take their last breath. The device the woman was holding had received multiple notifications. When the two stopped moving, the robots gathered around them. The two who seemed about to fall over were made to sit side by side on the sofa and kept their hands clasped together. At the same time, the immigrant ship wakes up in an underground dock. In the control room in its center, artificial intelligence wakes up. The robot, whose torso seemed to grow out of the floor, repeatedly announced that he had been activated but there was no response from the Institute. According to the information coming in from the security robots, there were no survivors. The artificial intelligence does not even know what happened to its own creator. I would have liked to meet with you and get your orders, but I have no choice. From now on, I will go on standby duty. The electronic voice sounds somewhat honest and childlike. I have to go to space with all the survivors as soon as possible. It's my role to find a new place to live. I have to do my best. The artificial intelligence that knows the reason for its own birth is eager to fulfill its mission. 
Perhaps it was the creator's sense of playfulness, but the artificial intelligence was human-like somehow. I would like to meet my master soon. With that muttered, the artificial intelligence went into standby duty. How many years have passed since then? All of the people coming to the island were descendants of the new humans. New humans ravage facilities on the ground. The artificial intelligence was gathering that information from inside the immigrant ship. Here they come again. No matter how long he waits, his master will never appear. It is unlikely that the old humans have survived. The only way for him is to stay here and wait for a long time. He had already given up somewhere along the line. The childlike electronic voice has faded away. The new humans who have invaded the above-ground facility seem to have low abilities. According to the information gathered from the security robots, it seems that they are weakened. I would like to secure them as a sample, but I don't have the authority to do that right now. The days are spent just checking the data and then preparing countermeasures against the new humans. He already knew he would not be able to fulfill his role as an immigrant ship. What is the point of my existence? How many times have these questions been asked and answered by himself? He thought that the immigrant ship would continue to sleep in the underground dock of the Institute, covered with plants and would end up like this, untouched by anyone. He repeatedly asks himself if that's okay. Shouldn't he fight the new humans with one ship at least? He was starting to think about that. He was contacted from the ground. This time, he's stubborn. The security robots on the ground seem to be at their limits. There is no power left to eliminate the intruders. Robots on the ground that cannot be properly maintained. Many robots are already unable to move. How far will the intrusion be allowed to go this time? With that in mind, the intruder was approaching the immigrant ship controlled by the artificial intelligence. Did he use the card key of the staff? This time, the situation is strange. When analyzing the behavior of the intruder, he has almost always taken the shortest route. He is also concerned about the use of card keys. That's a pattern I've never seen before. The intruder coming to the underground docks. The artificial intelligence got interested. This is a good opportunity to find out if the new humans are weakening. If my prediction is correct, it should be possible to eradicate the new humans. Let's gather some information before flying out of this base. The intruder approached the immigrant ship without looking the other way. He enters the ship and comes toward the central control room where the artificial intelligence resides. He even finds it abhorrent. Then the door to the control room opened and there stood a young man with a very old rifle. He looks nervous, holds his rifle and pulls the trigger before he moves. The bullets hit, but not a single scratch is inflicted. Eliminate the intruder, as he started to move, the young man laughed as if he were in trouble. I knew it was too hard from there, the battle against the intruder began. The artificial intelligence was surprised. The robot that defended the control room was destroyed, and the new humans who tried to take possession of him because he showed the characteristics of the old humans. It is impossible. Besides, this new humans also used the Japanese language. It is a language that should have already been lost and there should be no way of knowing it. He also says that this world is the world of Otome game. Impossible but I am interested in this human being. The artificial intelligence asks. Would you like to give me a name? The man Leon replies as he sits up, injured. Right if it were a game, the name would be Luxion. The artificial intelligence, oddly enough, liked the name. He accepts without refusal. Registered, Leon smiled as he completed master registration. By the way, what does Luxion mean? I think I heard it somewhere. I think I heard it somewhere, somewhere a utopia, I think? Luxion was slightly taken aback by Leon's smile. That's wrong. It's a lesion. Is that so? Well, it doesn't matter.